The Exorcist by William Peter Blatty The blaze of sun wrung pops of sweat from the old man's brow, yet he cupped his hands around the glass of hot, sweet tea as if to warm them. He could not shake the premonition. It clung to his back like chill, wet leaves. The dig was over, nothing exceptional. An Assyrian ivory toilet box and man, the bones of man. The fragrance of licorice plant and tamarisk tugged his gaze to poppied hills and the ragged, rock-strewn bolt of road that flung itself headlong into dread. Northwest was Mosul. East, Erbil. South was Baghdad and Kirkuk, and the fiery furnace of Nebuchadnezzar. He shifted his legs underneath the table in front of the lonely roadside Chaikana, and stared at the grass stains on his boots and khaki pants. He sipped at his tea. The dig was over. What was beginning? He dusted the thought like a clay-fresh find, but he could not tag it. The withered proprietor shuffled toward him, kicking up dust in Russian-made shoes. The dark of his shadow slipped over the table. Come on, chai, chawaga! The man in khaki shook his head, staring down at the laceless, crusted shoes caked thick with debris of the pain of living. The curd stood, waiting like an ancient debt. The old man in khaki looked up into eyes that were damply bleached, glaucoma. Once he could not have loved this man. He slipped out his wallet and probed for a coin among its tattered, crumpled tenants, a few dinars, an Iraqi driver's license, a faded plastic calendar card that was twelve years out of date. It bore an inscription on the reverse, What we give to the poor is what we take with us when we die. The card had been printed by the Jesuit missions. He paid for his tea and left a tip on a splintered table the color of sadness. He walked to his jeep. The gentle rippling click of key sliding into ignition was crisp in the silence. For a moment he waited, feeling at the stillness. Clustered on the summit of a towering mound, the fractured rooftops of Erbil hovered far in the distance, poised in the clouds like a rubbled, mud-stained benediction. The leaves clutched tighter at the flesh of his back. Something was waiting. The man in khaki started the engine, turned in a U, and headed toward Mosul. The Kurds stood watching, puzzled by a heart-dropping sense of loss as the jeep gathered speed. What was it that was gone? What was it that he had felt in the stranger's presence? Something like safety, he remembered, a sense of protection and deep well-being. Now it dwindled in the distance with the fast-moving jeep. He felt strangely alone. The Mosul curator of antiquities was penning a final entry into the ledger on his desk. For a moment he paused, looking up at his friend, as he dipped his pen-point into an inkpot. The man in khaki seemed lost in thought. He was standing by a table, hands in his pockets, staring down at some dry, tagged whisper of the past. The curator blotted the page and offered tea. The man in khaki shook his head, his eyes still fixed upon the table. The Arab watched him, vaguely troubled. What was in the air? There was something in the air. He stood up and moved closer, then felt a vague prickling at the base of his neck as his friend at last moved, reaching down for an amulet and cradling it pensively in his hand. It was a green stone head of the demon Pazuzu personification of southwest wind. Its dominion was sickness and disease. The amulet's owner had worn it as a shield. Evil against evil, breathed the curator. His friend did not move. He did not comment. Is something wrong? No answer. Father. The man in khaki still appeared not to hear, absorbed in the amulet, the last of his finds. After a moment he set it down, and soon 
they were murmuring farewells. At the door, the curator took the old man's hand with an extra firmness as he told him, My heart has a wish that you would not go. His friend answered softly in terms of tea, of time, of something to be done. No, no, father, I meant home. The man in Khaki's eyes were distant. Home, he repeated. The word had the sound somehow of an ending. The states, the Arab curator added, instantly wondering why he had. The man in khaki looked into the dark of the other's concern. He had never found it difficult to love this man. Goodbye, he whispered, then quickly turned and stepped into the gathering gloom of the streets. The man in khaki walked compelled. Shrugging loose at the city, he breached the outskirts, crossing the Tigris. Nearing the ruins, he slowed his pace, for with every step the inchoate presentiment took firmer, more horrible form. Yet he had to know. He would have to prepare. And then he was there. He stood on the mound where once gleamed fifteen gated Nineveh, feared nest of Assyrian hordes. Now the city lay sprawled in the bloody dust of its predestination, and yet he was here. The air was still thick with him, that other who ravaged his dreams. The man in khaki prowled the ruins, the temple of Nabu, the temple of Ishtar. He sifted vibrations. At the palace of Ashurbanipal, he paused, then shifted a wary, sidelong glance to a limestone statue hulking in situ. Ragged wings, taloned feet, bulbous, jutting, stubby penis, and a mouth stretched taut in feral grin. The demon Pazuzu. Abruptly he sagged. He knew. It was coming. He stared at the dust, quickening shadows. He heard dim yappings of savage dog packs prowling the fringes of the city. The orb of the sun was beginning the fall below the rim of the world. He rolled his shirt sleeves down and buttoned them as a shivering breeze sprang up. Its source was southwest. He hastened toward Mosul and his train. His heart encased in the icy conviction that soon he would face an ancient enemy. Like the brief doomed flare of exploding suns that registers dimly on blind men's eyes, the beginning of the horror passed almost unnoticed. In the shriek of what followed, in fact, was forgotten and perhaps not connected to the horror at all. It was difficult to judge. The house was a rental, brooding, tight. A brick colonial gripped by ivy in the Georgetown section of Washington, D.C. Early on the morning of the 1st of April, the house was quiet. Chris McNeil was propped in bed, going over her lines for the next day's filming. Reagan, her daughter, was sleeping down the hall and asleep downstairs in a room off the pantry were the middle-aged housekeepers Willie and Carl. At approximately 12.25 a.m., Chris heard rapping sounds. They were odd, muffled, profound, rhythmically clustered, alien code tapped out by a dead man. She listened for a moment, then dismissed it. But as the rappings persisted, she slapped down the script on the bed and got up to investigate. It seemed to be coming from Reagan's bedroom. The rapping grew suddenly louder, much faster, and as she pushed on the door and stepped into the room, they abruptly ceased. Her pretty eleven-year-old was asleep. Chris moved softly to her bedside and leaned over for a whisper. Rags? You awake? Regular breathing, heavy, deep. Abruptly, she flicked a quick glance to the ceiling. There, faint scratchings. Rats in the attic, for Pete's sake. Rats! She sighed. That's it. Big tails. Thump, thump. She felt oddly relieved, and then noticed the cold, the room. 
It was icy. She padded to the window, checked it. Closed. She touched the radiator. Hot. Puzzled, she moved to the bedside and touched her hand to Reagan's cheek. It was smooth as thought and lightly perspiring. She looked at her daughter, leaned over the bed and kissed her cheek. I sure do love you, she whispered, and then returned to her bed and her script. The film was a musical comedy remake of Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. A subplot had been added dealing with campus insurrections. Chris was starring. She played a psychology teacher who sided with the rebels, and she hated it. The rebel cause to her was dumb. It didn't make sense. They'd completed the interiors in Hollywood. All that remained were a few exterior scenes on the campus of Georgetown University starting tomorrow. It was Easter vacation, and the students were away. She was getting drowsy. She yawned, then glanced fondly at the side of her script. The pages looked gnawed. She remembered the rats. The little bastards sure got rhythm. She made a mental note to have Carl set traps for them in the morning. Chris slept and dreamed about death in the staggering particular. Death as if death was still never yet heard of, while something was ringing. She gasping, dissolving, slipping off into void, thinking over, I am not going to be. I will die. I won't be an Forever and ever, oh, Papa, don't let them, oh, don't let them do it. Don't let me be nothing forever and melting, unraveling, ringing, the ringing, the phone. She leaped up with her heart pounding, hand to the phone, and answered the assistant director. In makeup at six, honey. Right. How are you feeling? If I go to the bathroom and it doesn't burn, then I figure I'm ahead. He chuckled. <laughs> I'll see you. Right, and thanks. She hung up and for moments sat motionless, thinking of the dream. A dream. More like thought in the half-life of waking, that terrible clarity, gleam of the skull, non-being, irreversible. She couldn't imagine it. God, it, it can't be. She considered, and at last bowed her head. But it is. She put on a robe and padded quickly down to the kitchen. Good morning, Mrs. McNeil. Grey, drooping Willie, squeezing oranges, a trace of accent, Swiss, like Carl's. The actress poured coffee, then moved to the breakfast nook and smiled as she looked at her plate. A blush-red rose, Reagan, that angel. Many a morning when Chris was working, Reagan would come down to the kitchen and place a flower, then grope her way, crusty-eyed, back to her sleep. Her expression turned briefly sad. She'd recalled... Another flower, a son, Jamie. He had died long ago at the age of three when Chris was very young. She had sworn she would not give herself ever again as she had to Jamie, as she had to his father, Howard McNeil. She lit a cigarette. Willie brought juice, and Chris remembered the rats. Where's Carl? she asked. I'm here, madam. Thickly muscled, he breathed by the table, glittering eyes, hawk nose, bald head. Hey, Carl, we've got rats in the attic. Better get us some traps. But the attic is clean. Well, okay, we've got tidy rats. I heard them last night, Chris said patiently. Maybe plumbing, Carl probed. Maybe boards. Maybe rats. Will you buy the damn traps and quit arguing? Yes, madam. Bustling away. He was gone. Chris and Willie traded glances. Strange. Strange man. Like Willie, hard-working, very loyal, discreet, and yet something about him made her vaguely uneasy. The couple had been with her for almost six years, and yet Carl was a mask, and behind the mask she could hear his mechanism ticking like a conscience. Chris nibbled at bacon, then returned to her room where she dressed in her costume sweater and skirt. She glanced in a mirror and stuck out her tongue at herself, then sagged. Ah, oh, Christ, what a life. She picked up her wig box, slouched downstairs, and walked out to the tree-lined street. For a moment she paused outside the house and regarded it wistfully. Damn it, why don't I stay? Buy the house. Start to live. She walked toward her work. 
toward ghastly charade. She entered the main front gates of the campus and her depression diminished. By 8 a.m. in the day's first shot, she was almost herself. She started an argument over the script. Hey, Burke, take a look at this damn thing, will you? Oh, you do have a script, I see. How nice. Director Burke Dennings, taut and elfin, gleaming with mischief, surgically shaved a narrow strip from a page of her script with quivering fingers. A sly, frail man in his fifties, he spoke with a charmingly broad British accent, so clipped and precise that it lofted even crudest obscenities to elegance. Now then, tell me, my baby, what is it? What's wrong? It just doesn't make sense, said Chris. Well, it's perfectly plain, lied Dennings. Why the heck should they tear down the building, Burke? What for? Are you sending me up? No, I'm asking. What for? Because it's there, love. In the script? No, on the grounds. Well, it doesn't make sense, Burke. She just wouldn't do that. She would. No, she wouldn't. Shall we summon the writer? I believe he's in Paris. Hiding? Fucking. He'd clipped it off with impeccable diction. Chris fell weak to his shoulders, laughing. Oh, Burke, you're impossible, damn it. Yes, he said. Now then, shall we get on with it? A few spectators dotted the lawn, mostly Jesuit faculty. Chris darted a furtive, embarrassed glance to a nearby Jesuit, checking to see if he'd heard the obscenity. Dark, rugged face, like a boxer's, chipped, in his forties. Something sad about the eyes, something pained, and yet warm and reassuring as they fastened on hers. He'd heard. He was smiling. He glanced at his watch and moved away. She complained about the tag of the scene. It adds nothing, said Chris. It's dumb. Yes, it is, love, it is, agreed Burke sincerely. However, the cutter insists that we do it. So there we are, you see. No, I don't. It's dumb. Well, of course it is. It's vomit. It's simply cunting, puking mad. Now then, why don't we shoot it and trust me to snip it from the final cut? It should make a rather tasty munch. Chris laughed and agreed. Chris looked towards Dennings as he flung an obscenity at a hapless grip and then visibly glowed. He seemed to revel in his eccentricity. Yet at a certain point in his drinking, Chris knew he would suddenly explode into temper. And if it happened at three or four in the morning, he was likely to telephone people in power and viciously abuse them over trifling provocations. Chris didn't believe that Dennings was either an alcoholic or a hopeless problem drinker but rather that he drank because it was expected of him. He was living up to his legend. Ah, oh, well, she thought, I guess it's a kind of immortality. She turned, looking over her shoulder for the Jesuit who had smiled. He was walking in the distance, despondent, head lowered, a lone black cloud in search of the rain. She'd never liked priests, so assured, so secure, and yet this one? Already, Chris? Dennings. Here, yeah, ready. All right. Absolute quiet. Roll the film, ordered Burke. Speed. Now, action. Chris ran up the steps while extras cheered, and Dennings watched her, wondering what was on her mind. She'd given up the arguments far too quickly. They worked with intermittent sun. By four, the overcast of rolling clouds was thick in the sky, and the assistant director dismissed the company for the day. Chris walked homeward. She was tired. At the corner of 36th and O, she glanced diagonally across the street to a Catholic church, holy something or other, staffed by Jesuits. She crossed. As she walked down O and passed the grade school auditorium, a priest rushed by from behind her, hands in the pockets of a nylon windbreaker, young, very tense, in need of a shave. Up ahead, he took a right turning into an easement that opened to a courtyard behind the church. Chris paused, watching him, curious. He seemed to be heading for a white frame cottage. An old screen door creaked open and still another priest emerged. He looked glum, very nervous. He nodded curtly toward the young man, and with lowered eyes he moved quickly toward a door that led into the church. Once again... The cottage door was pushed open from within. Another priest. It looked. Hey, it is. The one who was smiling when Burke said, Fuck. Only now he looked grave as he silently greeted the new arrival. 
He led him inside, and the screen door closed with a slow, faint squeak. Chris stared at her shoes. She was puzzled. She wondered if Jesuits went to confession. Faint rumble of thunder. She looked up at the sky. Would it rain? Flashes of lightning crackled in the distance. She hoped it would pour. In a minute, she was home. Hi, Chris. How did it go? Pretty blonde in her twenties, sitting at the table, Sharon Spence. For the last three years, she'd been tutor to Reagan and social secretary to Chris. Ah, oh, the usual crock. Anything exciting? Do you want to have dinner next week at the White House? Chris chuckled. Where's Rags, by the way? Downstairs in the playroom. What doing? Sculpting. She's making a bird, I think. It's for you. Were you kidding me about that dinner? Chris asked. No, of course not, answered Sharon. It's Thursday. Big party? No, I gather it's just five or six people. No kidding. She was pleased, but not really surprised. They courted her company. Cab drivers, poets, professors, kings. What was it they liked about her? Life? Chris sat at the table. How'd the lesson go? Sharon lit a cigarette, frowning. Had a bad time with maths again. Oh, gee, that's, that's funny. I know, it's her favorite subject, said Sharon. Hi, man. She was bounding through the door, slim arms outstretched, red ponytails, soft, shining face full of freckles. Hiya, stink pot! Chris caught her in a bear hug, then kissed the girl's cheek with smacking ardor. She could not repress the full flood of her love. Mmm, 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 more kisses. Then she held Reagan out and probed her face with eager eyes. What'd you do today? Anything exciting? Oh, stuff. So what kind of stuff? Oh, let me see. She had her knees against her mother's, swaying gently back and forth. Well, of course, I studied. Uh-huh. And I painted. What'd you paint? Oh, well, flowers, you know, daisies, only pink. And then, oh, yeah, this horse. She grew suddenly excited, eyes widening. This man had a horse, you know, down by the river. We were walking, see, Mum, and then along came this horse. He was beautiful. Oh, Mum, you should have seen him. And a man let me sit on him. Really? I mean, practically a minute. Where's the bird you made? Reagan turned around to Sharon and grinned. You told. Then it was surprise, she snickered to her mother. You mean, with the long, funny nose like you wanted? Oh, Rags, that's sweet. Can I see it? No, I still have to paint it. When's dinner, Mon? Hungry? I'm starving. Can't we go to hot shop? Reagan pleaded. Could we? Chris smiled fondly. Run upstairs and get dressed and we'll go. Oh, I love you. Reagan ran from the room. Honey, wear the new dress, Chris called out after her. Chris picked up a script with a covering letter clipped neatly to the front of it. Jarris, her agent. Thought I told them no scripts for a while. You should read it, said Sharon. Oh, yeah? Yes, I read it this morning. Pretty good? It's great. And I get to play a nun who discovers she's a lesbian, right? No, you get to play nothing. Shit, <laughs> movies are better than ever. What the hell are you talking about, Sharon? They want you to direct. Sharon exhaled coyly with the smoke from her cigarette. My God, Shah, you're kidding. Chris pounced on the letter with eager eyes, snapping up the words in hungry chunks. New script, a triptych. Studio wants Sir Stephen Moore. Accepting role provided I direct his segment. Chris flung up her arms, letting loose a hoarse, shrill cry of joy. And then with both her hands, she cuddled the letter to her chest. Oh, Steve, you angel, you remembered. Filming in Africa, drunk, in camp chairs, watching the blood hush end of day, warm remembrance, warm smile. Dear Steve. Mom, I can't find the dress, Reagan called from the landing. In the closet, Chris answered. I looked. I'll be up in a second, Chris called. Got a date, Char? Yes. Chris motioned at the mail. You go on, then. We can catch all this stuff in the morning. Sharon got up. Uh, no, no, wait, Chris amended, remembering something. There's a letter that's got to go out tonight. Sharon eyed her watch. Gee, it's... Uh, Time for me to meditate, Chris, she said. Chris looked at her narrowly with muted exasperation. 
In the last six months, she had watched her secretary suddenly turn seeker after serenity. It had started in Los Angeles with self-hypnosis, which then yielded to Buddhistic chanting. During the last few weeks, the house had reeked of incense and lifeless droning of nam myo ho renge kyo usually when Chris was studying her lines. Now it was transcendental meditation. Chris turned away and said goodnight. She went upstairs to Reagan's bedroom, moving immediately to the closet. Reagan was standing in the middle of the room, staring up at the ceiling. What's doing? Chris asked her, hunting for the dress. It was a pale blue cotton. She remembered hanging it in the closet. Funny noises, said Reagan. I know, we've got friends. Reagan looked at her. Hmm? Squirrels, honey, squirrels in the attic. Her daughter was squeamish and terrified of rats. Even mice upset her. The hunt for the dress proved fruitless. See, Mom, it's not there. Yes, I see. Maybe Willie picked it up with the cleaning. It's gone. Yeah, well, put on the navy. It's pretty. They went to the hot shop. Chris ate a salad. While Reagan had soup, four rolls, fried chicken, a chocolate shake, and a helping and a half of blueberry pie with coffee ice cream. Where does she put it, Chris wondered fondly, in her wrists? The child was slender as a fleeting hope. I enjoyed my dinner, Mom. Chris turned to her, and as often happened, felt again that ache on seeing Howard's image in Reagan's face. They were back before seven. Willie and Carl had already returned. Reagan made a dash for the basement playroom, eager to finish the sculpture for her mother. Chris headed for the kitchen to pick up the script. She found Willie brewing coffee, coarse, open pot. She looked irritable and sullen. Hi, Willie, how did it go? Have a real nice time? They had gone to a movie, Willie explained. She had wanted to see the Beatles, but Carl had insisted on an art house film about Mozart. Terrible, she simmered. It's a dumb hit. Oh, Willie, have you seen that dress that I got for rags last week, the blue cotton? Yes, I see it in her closet this morning. Where did you put it? It is there. You didn't maybe pick it up by mistake with the cleaning. It is there. With the cleaning? In the closet. No, it isn't. I looked. About to speak, Willie tightened her lips and scowled at the coffee. Carl had walked in. Good evening, madam. Did you set those traps? asked Chris. I set them, of course, but the attic is clean. Did you have any trouble getting the traps, Carl? No, no trouble. At six in the morning? All night market. Jesus, she thought. Chris took a long bath, and when she went to the closet in her bedroom for her robe, she discovered Reagan's missing dress. It lay crumpled in a heap on the floor of the closet. Chris picked it up. What's it doing in here? The tags were still on it. For a moment, Chris thought back, and then remembered that the day that she'd purchased the dress, she'd also bought two or three items for herself. Must have put them all together. Chris carried the dress into Reagan's bedroom, put it on a hanger, and slipped it on the rack. She glanced at Reagan's wardrobe. Nice, nice clothes. Yeah, rags, look here. Not there, but the daddy who never writes. As she turned from the closet, she stubbed her toe against the base of the bureau. Oh, Jesus, that smarts. As she lifted her foot and massaged her toe, she noticed that the bureau was out of position by about three feet. No wonder I bumped it. Willie must have vacuumed. She went down to the study with a script from her agent. Faith, hope, and charity. Three distinct segments, each with a different cast and director. Hers would be hope. She liked the idea and she liked the title, possibly dull, she thought, but refined. They'll probably change it to something like Rock Around the Virtues. The doorbell chimed. Burke Dennings, a lonely man he dropped by often. She heard him rasp an obscenity at Carl, whom he seemed to detest, and continually baited. Yes, hello. Where's the drink? he demanded, moving to the bar, hands in the pocket of his wrinkled raincoat. He sat on a bar stool, irritable, shifty-eyed, vaguely disappointed. On the prowl again, Chris asked, and moved behind the bar. Don't be so silly, snapped Dennings. 
It so happens that I've spent the entire evening at a bloody tea, a faculty tea. Chris leaned on the bar. You were just at a tea? Oh, yes. Go ahead. Smirk. You got smashed at a tea, she said dryly, with some Jesuits? No, the Jesuits were sober. They don't drink? Are you out of your cunting mind? They swelled. Never seen such capacities in all my life. Where the hell is my drink? Will you tell me what you were doing at a faculty tea? Bloody public relations. Something you should be doing. Chris handed him a gin on the rocks. God, the way we've been mucking their grounds, the director muttered, pious, the glass to his lips. Oh, yes, go ahead, laugh. That's all you're good for, laughing and showing a bit of bum. I'm just smiling. Well, someone had to make a good show. And how many times did you say fuck, Burke? Darling, that's crude, he rebuked her gently. Now tell me, how are you? She answered with a despondent shrug. Oh, shit, I think I'll have a drink, she said. Yes, it's good for the stomach. Now then, what? She was slowly pouring vodka. Ever think about dying? What it means? Faintly edgy, he answered. No, I don't. I, I don't think about it at all. What the hell do you bring it up for? She plopped ice into her glass. I thought about it this morning, like a dream, waking up. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it just sort of hit me what it means. I mean, the end, like I'd never even heard of it before. She shook her head. Oh, Jesus, did that spook me. I felt like I was falling off the goddamn planet at a hundred million miles an hour. Oh, rubbish. Death's a comfort, Denning sniffed. Not for me, it isn't. I mean, think about it, Burke. Not existing forever. It's, oh, for heaven's sakes, show your bum at the faculty tea next week, and perhaps those priests can give you comfort. Now, I didn't know they drank. Well, you're stupid. His eyes had grown mean. Was he reaching the point of no return? She had the feeling she had touched a nerve. Shall they go to confession? She asked him. How would I know? He suddenly bellowed. Well, weren't you studying to be, Where's the bloody drink? Want some coffee? Don't be fatuous. I want another drink. He shoved his glass across the bar, and she poured more gin. I guess maybe I should ask a couple of them over, Chris murmured. Ask who? Well, whoever. She shrugged. The big wheels, you know, priests. They'll never leave. They're fucking plunderers, he rasped and gulped his gin. Yeah, he's starting to blow, thought Chris, and quickly changed the subject. She explained about the script and her chance to direct. Oh. Good, Dennings muttered. It scares me. Oh, twaddle. My baby, the difficult thing about directing is making it seem as if the damn thing were difficult. I hadn't a clue my first time out, but here I am, you see. It's child's play. What's important is handling the cast, and you'd be marvellous, just marvellous at that. You could not only tell them how to move and read a line, my baby, you could show them. She still looked doubtful. Well, about this... Technical stuff, she worried. Drunk or sober, Dennings was the best director in the business. She wanted his advice. For almost an hour, she probed to the barricades of Minutiae. Darling, all you really need is a brilliant cutter, her director cackled, rounding it off. I mean, someone who really knows his doors. Beg pardon, madam. You wish something? Carl stood attentively at the door to the study. Oh, hello, Thorndyke. Dennings giggled. Oh, 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 is it Heinrich? I can't keep it straight. It is Carl. Oh, yes, of course it is. Damn, I'd forgotten. Tell me, Carl, was it public relations you told me you did for the Gestapo, or was it community relations? I believe there's a difference. Carl spoke politely. Neither one, sir. I am Swiss. Oh, yes, of course. The director guffawed. And you never went bowling with Goebbels, I suppose? Carl, impervious, turned to Chris. And never went flying with Rudolf Hess? Madame wishes. Oh, I don't know, Burke. Do you want coffee? Fuck it. 
The director stood up abruptly and strode belligerently from the room and the house. Chris shook her head and then turned to Carl. Unplug the phones, she ordered expressionlessly. Where's Rags? Down in playroom. I call her? Here, yeah, it's bedtime. Oh, no, wait a second, Carl. I'd better go see the bird. Just get me the Sanka, please. Yes, madam. And for the umpty-eighth time, I apologize for Burke. I pay no attention. I know. That's what bugs him. Chris walked to the entry hall of the house, pulled open the door to the basement staircase, and started downstairs. The playroom was panelled and brightly decorated. Easels, paintings, phonograph, tables for games, and a table for sculpting. Hey, that's great! exclaimed Chris as her daughter handed her the figure. It was not quite dry and looked something like a worry bird, painted orange, except for the beak which was laterally striped in green and white. A tuft of feathers was glued to the head. Do you like it? asked Regan. Oh, honey, I do, I really do. Got a name for it? Uh, I don't know, Regan shrugged. Let me see, let me see. Chris tapped fingertips to teeth. What do you think about dumb bird? Reagan was snickering, hand to her mouth to conceal the braces, nodding. Chris was setting down the bird when she noticed the Ouija board, close, on the table. She'd forgotten she had it. She'd used it a time or two with Sharon and once with Dennings, who had skillfully steered the plastic planchette so that all of the messages were obscene and then afterward blame it on the fucking spirits. You... Playing with the Ouija board? Yep. You know how? Oh, well, sure. Here, I'll show you. Well, I think you need two people, honey. No, you don't, Mum. I do it all the time. Chris was pulling up a chair. Well, let's both play, okay? Hesitation. Well, okay. She had her fingertips positioned on the white planchette, and as Chris reached out to position hers... The planchette made a swift, sudden move to the position on the board marked No. Chris smiled at her slyly. Mother, I'd rather do it myself. Is that it? You don't want me to play? Oh, no, I do. Captain Howdy said no. Captain who? Captain Howdy. Honey, who's Captain Howdy? Oh, you know, I make questions and he does the answers. Oh? Yeah, he's nice. Chris felt a dim and sudden concern. The child had loved her father deeply, yet never had reacted visibly to her parents' divorce, and Chris didn't like it. Maybe she cried in her room, she didn't know. But Chris was fearful she was repressing, and that her emotions might one day erupt in some harmful form. A fantasy playmate. It didn't sound healthy. Why... Howdy, for Howard, her father, pretty close. So how come you couldn't even come up with a name for a dum-dum bird and then you hit me with something like Captain Howdy? Why do you call him Captain Howdy? Because that's his name, of course, Reagan snickered. Says who? Well, him. And what else does he say to you? Stuff. What stuff? Reagan shrugged. Just stuff. For instance, I'll show you. I'll ask him some questions. You do that. Her fingertips on the planchette, Reagan stared at the board with eyes drawn tight in concentration. Captain Howdy, don't you think my mum is pretty? A second, five, ten, twenty. Captain Howdy. More seconds. Chris was surprised. She'd expected her daughter to slide the planchette to the section marked yes. Captain Howdy, that's really not very polite, chided Regan. Honey, maybe he's sleeping. Do you think? I think you should be sleeping. Already? Come on, babe, up to bed. Chris stood up. He's a poop, muttered Regan, and then followed her mother up the stairs. Chris tucked her into bed and then sat on the bedside. Honey? Sundays, no work. You want to do something? What? Oh, well, I don't know, Chris replied. Something. You want to go see the sights? Hey, the cherry blossoms, maybe. 
That's right, they're out early. You want to go see them? Oh, yeah, Mom. And tomorrow night, a movie. How's that? Oh, I love you. Reagan gave her a hug, and Chris hugged her back with an extra fervor, whispering, Oh, Rags, honey, I love you. You can bring Mr. Dennings if you like. Honey, why would I want to bring Mr. Dennings? Well, you like him. Well, sure, I like him, honey. Don't you? She made no answer. Baby, what's going on? Chris prodded her daughter. You're going to marry him, Mummy, aren't you? It wasn't a question, but a sullen statement. Chris exploded into a laugh. Oh, my baby, of course not. What on earth are you talking about, Mr. Dennings? Where did you get that idea? But you like him. I like pizzas, but I wouldn't ever marry one. Honey, he's a friend, just a crazy old friend. You don't like him like Daddy. I love your Daddy, honey. I'll always love your Daddy. Mr. Dennings comes by here a lot because he's lonely, that's all. He's a friend. Well, I heard... You heard what? Heard from who? Whirling slivers of doubt in the eyes, hesitation, and then a shrug of dismissal. I don't know. I just thought. Well, it's silly, so forget it. Okay. Now go to sleep. Can I read? I'm not sleeping. Sure, read your new book until you get tired. Good night, hon. Good night. Chris blew her a kiss from the door and then closed it. Back to the study, the script. Halfway through, she saw Reagan coming towards her. Hi, honey, what's wrong? There's these real funny noises. Honey, sleep in my bedroom and I'll see what it is. Chris led her to the bedroom and tucked her in. Can I watch TV for a while till I sleep? Sure, okay. Chris tuned in a channel on the bedroom portable and turned out the light and went down the hall. She climbed the narrow carpeted stairs that led to the attic. She opened the door and felt for the light switch, found it, flicked it, stooping as she entered. She glanced around. Cartons of clippings and correspondence on the pine wood floor, nothing else, except the traps, six of them, baited. The room was spotless. Even the air smelled clean and cool. The attic was unheated, no pipes, no radiator, no little holes in the roof. There is nothing. Chris jumped from her skin. Oh! Good Jesus, she gasps, turning quickly with her hand to a fluttering heart. Jesus Christ, Carl, don't do that. He was standing on the steps. Very sorry, but you see, it is clean. Without waiting for an answer, he nodded and left. The filming went smoothly that day. Later in the morning, Sharon came by the set, and during breaks between scenes in her portable dressing room, she and Chris handled items of business. A letter to her agent, she would think about the script. OK to the White House. A wire to Howard reminding him to telephone on Reagan's birthday. A call to her business manager asking if she could afford to take off for a year. Plans for a dinner party April 23rd. Early in the evening, Chris took Reagan out to a movie, and the following day they drove around to points of interest in Chris's Jaguar XKE, the Lincoln Memorial, the capital and the tomb of the unknown soldier. Reagan turned solemn, and later at the grave of John F. Kennedy seemed to grow distant and a little sad. She stared at the eternal flame for a time, and then mutely reached for Chris's hand. Mom... Why do people have to die? The question pierced her mother's soul. Oh, Rags, you too. You too. Oh, no. And yet what could she tell her? Lies? She couldn't. Honey, people get tired, she answered. Why does God let them? Chris was puzzled, disturbed. An atheist, she had never taught Reagan religion. She thought it dishonest. Who's been telling you about God? she asked. Sharon. Oh. She would have to speak to her. Mum, why does God let us get tired? Looking down at those sensitive eyes and that pain, Chris surrendered. Couldn't tell her what she believed. Well, after a while, God gets lonesome for us, Rags. He wants us back.
Reagan stayed quiet during the drive home, and her mood persisted all the rest of the day and through Monday. On Tuesday, Reagan's birthday, it seemed to break. Chris took her along to the filming, and when the shooting day was over, the cast and crew sang Happy Birthday and brought out a cake. Always a kind and gentle man when sober, Dennings had the lights rewarmed and filmed her as she cut it. He called it a screen test, and afterwards promised to make her a star. But after dinner and the opening of presents, the mood seemed to fade. No word from Howard. Chris made excuses. Reagan nodded, subdued, and shook her head to her mother's suggestion that they go to the hot shop for a shake. Without a word, she went downstairs to the basement playroom, where she remained until time for bed. The following morning, when Chris opened her eyes, she found Reagan in bed with her, half awake. Well, what are, the, what are you doing here? Chris chuckled. My bed was shaking. You nut! Chris kissed her and pulled up her covers. Go to sleep. It's still early. What looked like morning was the beginning of endless night. He stood at the edge of the lonely subway platform, listening for the rumble of a train that would still the ache that was always with him, like his pulse heard only in silence. He shifted his bag to the other hand and stared down the tunnel, points of light. They stretched into the dark like guides to hopelessness. A cough, he glanced to the left. The grey stubble derelict, numb, on the ground, in a pool of his urine, was sitting up with yellowed eyes. He stared. The priest looked away. He would come. He would whine. Could you help an old altar boy, father, would you? The vomit-flaked hand pressing down on the shoulder, the fumbling for the medal, the reeking of the breath of a thousand confessions with the wine and the garlic and the stale mortal sins belching out altogether and smothering, smothering. The priest heard the derelict rising. Hiya, father. He winced, sagged, couldn't turn. He couldn't bear to search for Christ again in stench and hollow eyes, for the Christ of pus and bleeding excrement, the Christ who could not be. In absent gesture he felt at his sleeve as if for an unseen band of mourning. He dimly remembered another Christ. Hey, Father! The hum of an incoming train, then sounds of stumbling. He looked to the tramp. He was staggering, fainting. With a blind, sudden rush, the priest was to him, caught him, dragged him to the bench against the wall. I'm a Catholic, the derelict mumbled. I'm Catholic. The priest eased him down, stretched him out, saw his train. He quickly pulled a dollar from out of his wallet and stuffed it into a urine-damp trouser pocket. Then he picked up his bag and boarded the train. At the end of the line, he walked to Fordham University. The dollar had been meant for his cab. When he reached the residence hall for visitors, he signed his name on the register. Damien Carras. Then examined it. Something was wrong. Wearily, he remembered, and added, S.J. He took a room in Weigel Hall. The following day, he attended a meeting of the American Psychiatric Association. As principal speaker, he delivered a paper entitled Psychological Aspects of Spiritual Development. At the end of the day, he enjoyed a few drinks and a bite to eat with some other psychiatrists. They paid. He left them early. He would have to see his mother. He walked to the crumbling brownstone apartment building on Manhattan's East 21st Street. Pausing by the steps that led up to the door, he eyed the children on the stoop, unkempt, ill-clothed, no place to go. He remembered evictions, Humiliation, walking home with a seventh-grade sweetheart and encountering his mother as she hopefully rummaged through a garbage can on the corner. He climbed the steps and opened the door as if it were a tender wound, an odour like cooking, like a rotted sweetness. He gripped the banister and climbed, overcome by a sudden draining weariness that he knew was caused by guilt. He should never have left her not alone. Her greeting was joyful, a shout, a kiss. She rushed to make coffee, dark, stubby, gnarled legs. 
He sat in the kitchen and listened to her talk, the dingy walls and soiled floor seeping into his bones. The apartment was a hovel. Social security. Each month, a few dollars from a brother. He avoided those eyes that were wells of sorrow. He should never have left her. He spent time repairing the tuna on a crackling plastic radio. Her world, the news, Mayor Lindsay. He went to the bathroom. Yellowing newspaper spread on the tile, stains of rust in the tub and the sink. On the floor, an old corset, seeds of vocation. From these he had fled into love. Now the love had grown cold. In the night he heard it whistling through the chambers of his heart like a lost crying wind. At a quarter to eleven he kissed her goodbye, promised to return just as soon as he could. He left with the radio tuned to the news. Once back in his room in Weigel Hall, he gave some thought to writing a letter to the Jesuit head of the Maryland province. He'd covered the ground with him once before. Request for transfer to the New York province in order to be closer to his mother. Request for a teaching post and relief from his duties. In requesting the latter, he'd cited as a reason unfitness for the work. On the point of Damien Carris's mother, the provincial had expressed his sympathy, but the question of the priest's unfitness he thought contradictory on its fact. But Carras, some of their problems come down to vocation, to the meaning of their lives. Hell, it isn't always sex that's involved. It's their faith. And I just can't cut it, Tom. It's, it's too much. I need out. I'm having problems of my own. I mean, doubts. What thinking man doesn't, Damien? A harried man with many appointments, the provincial had not pressed him for the reasons for his doubt, for which Carras was grateful. He knew that his answers would have sounded insane. The need to rend food with the teeth and then defecate. My mother's nine first Fridays. Stinking socks, thalidomide babies. An item in the paper about a young altar boy waiting at a bus stop. Set on by stranger, sprayed with kerosene, ignited. No, too emotional, vague, existential. More rooted in logic was the silence of good. In the world, there was evil. And much of the evil resulted from doubt, from an honest confusion among men of goodwill. Would a reasonable God refuse to end it, not reveal himself, not speak? Lord, give us a sign. At various times, the priest would long to have lived with Christ, to have seen, to have touched, to have probed his eyes. Ah, my God! Let me see you. Let me know. Come in dreams. The yearning consumed him. He sat at the desk now with pen about paper. The provincial had promised to consider the requests, but thus far nothing had been done. Carus wrote the letter and went to bed. He sluggishly awakened at 5 a.m. and went to the chapel in Weigel Hall, secured a host, then returned to his room and said mass. Et clamor meus ad te veniat, he prayed with murmured anguish, let my cry come unto thee. He lifted the host in consecration with an aching remembrance of the joy it once gave him, felt once again as he did each morning the pang of an unexpected glimpse from afar and unnoticed of a long-lost love. He broke the host above the chalice. Peace, I leave you. My peace I give you. He tucked the host inside his mouth and swallowed the papery taste of despair. When the mass was over, he polished the chalice and carefully placed it in his bag. He rushed for the 710 train back to Washington, carrying pain in a black valise. Early on the morning of the 11th of April, Chris made a telephone call to her doctor in Los Angeles and asked him for a referral to a local psychiatrist for Reagan. She had noticed a sudden and dramatic change in her daughter's behavior and disposition. Insomnia, quarrelsome, fits of temper, kicked things, threw things, screamed, wouldn't eat. In addition, her energy seemed abnormal. She was constantly moving, touching, turning, tapping, running and jumping about doing poorly with schoolwork. 
fantasy playmate. Eccentric, attention-getting tactics. Such as what? the physician inquired. She started with the rappings. She'd heard them again on two occasions. In both instances, Reagan was present in the room, and the rappings would cease at the moment Chris entered. Secondly, she told him, Reagan would lose things in the room, a dress, her toothbrush, books, her shoes. She complained about somebody moving her furniture. Finally, on the morning following the dinner at the White House, Chris saw Carl in Reagan's bedroom, pulling a bureau back into place from a spot that was halfway across the room. Shortly thereafter, Chris had found Reagan in the kitchen, complaining that someone had moved all her furniture during the night when she was sleeping. Chris mentioned the matter of the shaking bed, which had happened twice more. Well, that could be physical, the internist ventured. No, Mark! I didn't say the bed is shaking. I said that she says that it's shaking. Do you know that it isn't shaking? No. Well, it might be clonic spasms, he murmured. Any temperature? No. Listen, what do you think, she asked. Should I take her to a shrink or what? Chris, how is she doing with her maths? Just rotten. I mean, suddenly rotten, he grunted. Why do you ask, she repeated. Well, it's part of the syndrome. Of what? Nothing serious. I'd rather not guess about it over the phone. Got a pencil? He wanted to give her the name of a Washington internist. Mark, can't you come out here and check her yourself? Jamie. A lingering infection. Chris's doctor at that time had prescribed a new, broad-spectrum antibiotic. Refilling a prescription at a local drugstore, the pharmacist was wary. I don't want to alarm you, ma'am, but this... Well, it's quite new on the market, and they've found that in Georgia it's been causing... Jamie. Jamie. Dead. And ever since, Chris had never trusted doctors. Only Mark. And that had taken years. Mark, can't you? Chris pleaded. No, I can't, but don't worry. This man is brilliant, the best. She wrote down the name. Have him look her over and then tell him to call me, the internist advised, and forget the psychiatrist for now. Are you sure? Chris, check the body. That's first. Then we'll see. The doctor was in Arlington, Samuel Klein. While Reagan sat crossly in an examining room, Klein seated her mother in his office and took a brief case history. He then excused himself and gave Reagan a complete examination that included taking samples of her urine and her blood. After he finished, he sat for a while and talked to Reagan, observing her demeanor, and then returned to Chris and started writing a prescription. She appears to have a disorder of the nerves, at least we think it is. We don't know yet exactly how it works, but it's often seen in early adolescence. She shows all the symptoms, the hyperactivity, the temper, her performance in maths. Here, yeah, the maths. Why the maths? It affects concentration. He ripped the prescription from the pad. Now this is for Ritalin. What is it, a tranquilizer? A stimulant. Stimulant? She's higher than a kite right now. Her condition isn't quite what it seems, explained Klein. It's a form of overcompensation, an overreaction to depression. Depression? Well, you mentioned her father, Klein. He asked her if she'd ever known Reagan wear or use obscenities. Never, Chris answered. Well, you see, that's quite similar to things like her lying. Uncharacteristic from what you tell me, but in certain disorders of the nerves it can, Chris interrupted. Where did you ever get the notion she uses obscenities? He eyed her rather curiously. Well, she let loose quite a string while I was examining her, Mrs. McNeil. You're kidding. Like what? You mean shit or fuck? He relaxed. Yes, she used those words, he said. And what else did she say, specifically? Well, specifically, Mrs. McNeil, she advised me to keep my goddamn fingers away from her cunt. 
Chris gasped with shock. She used those words. Well, it isn't unusual, Mrs. McNeil, and I really wouldn't worry about it at all. It's a part of the syndrome. I doubt that she even understood what she was saying. He soothed. Yeah, I, I guess, murmured Chris. Maybe not. Try the Ritalin, he advised her, and we'll see what develops. And I'd like to take a look at her again in two weeks. Wednesday the 27th, would that be convenient, he asked. Yeah, sure, she murmured. She crumpled the prescription in a pocket of her coat. I'm quite a big fan of yours, Klein said, smiling. She glanced at the doctor. You don't think a psychiatrist, hmm? Let's wait and see, he smiled encouragingly. In the meantime, try not to worry. She left him. As they drove back home, Reagan asked her what the doctor had said. Um, that you're nervous. Chrissy decided not to talk about her language, but she did speak to Sharon about it later, asking if she'd ever heard Reagan use that kind of obscenity. Why, no, replied Sharon. By the way, have you been talking to her much about religion, Shah? Sharon flushed. Well, a little. I mean, it's hard to avoid. You see, she asks so many questions. Chris was extremely diligent in seeing that Reagan took her dosage of Ritalin. By the night of the party, however, she had failed to observe any noticeable improvement. There were subtle signs, in fact, of gradual deterioration increased forgetfulness, untidiness, and one complaint of nausea. As for attention-getting tactics that appeared to be a new one, reports of a foul, unpleasant smell in Reagan's bedroom. At Reagan's insistence, Chris took a whiff one day and smelled nothing. You don't? You mean you smell it right now? Chris had asked her. Well, sure. She'd wrinkled her nose. Well, like something burny. Chris smelled nothing, but she was preoccupied with a number of other concerns. One was arrangements for the dinner party. Another had to do with a script. The third of Chris's concerns was the failure of two financial ventures. These were the problems that her gloomy business manager flew into town to discuss. He frowned when she brought up the subject of buying a Ferrari. You mean a new one, he said and cautioned that he thought a new car was improvident. Ben, I made 800 thou last year, and you're saying I can't get a freaking car? Don't you think that's ridiculous? Where did it go? He reminded her that most of her money was in shelters. Then he listed the various drains on her gross. Federal income tax, projected federal income tax, her state tax, tax on her real estate holdings, 10% commission to her agent, five to him, five to her publicist, one and a quarter taken out as donation to the Motion Picture Welfare Fund, an outlay for wardrobe in tune with the fashion, salaries to Willie and Carl and Sharon and the caretaker of the Los Angeles home, various travel costs, and finally, her monthly expenses. Will you do another picture this year, he asked her. She shrugged. I don't know, do I have to? Yes, I think you'd better. She eyed him moodily. What about a Honda? He made no reply. Chris tried to keep herself busy with preparations for the next night's party. She'd invited an interesting mixture. In addition to Burke and the youngest director of the second unit, she expected a senator and wife, an Apollo astronaut and wife, two Jesuits from Georgetown, her next-door neighbors, and Mary Jo Perrin and Ellen Cleary. Mary Jo was a plump and gray-headed Washington seeress whom Chris liked immensely. Ellen Cleary was a middle-aged State Department secretary who'd worked in the U.S. Embassy in Moscow when Chris toured Russia. Hey, Shah, she asked, which priests are coming? I'm not sure yet. I invited the president and the dean of the college, but I think that the president's sending an alternate. Sharon rummaged through scraps of notes. Yes, here it is, his assistant, Father Joseph Dyer. Where's Rags? Downstairs. You know, maybe you should start to keep your typewriter there, don't you think? I mean, that way you can watch her when you're typing, okay?
I don't like her being alone so much. Good idea. Okay, later. Go home, meditate, play with horses. Chris tried to watch television, couldn't concentrate, felt uneasy. There was a strangeness in the house, like settling stillness, weighted dust. By midnight, all in the house were asleep. That night. She greeted her guests in a lime green hostess costume with long belled sleeves and pants. The first to arrive was Mary Jo Perrin, who came with Robert, her teenage son. The last was pink-faced Father Dyer. He was young and diminutive, with fey eyes behind steel-rimmed spectacles. The drinks did their work. By a quarter to ten, they were scattered about the living room, eating their dinners in vibrant knots of conversation. Chris scanned the room for Mary Jo Perrin. There, on a sofa, was Father Wagner, the Jesuit dean. Chris drifted to the sofa and folded to the floor in front of the coffee table as the series chuckled with mirth. Mary Jo has been telling me there used to be a Jesuit who was also a medium. I just said it was hard to believe. But of course, said Mary Jo, why he even used to levitate. Oh, I do it every morning, said the Jesuit quietly. You mean he held seances? Chris asked Mary Perrin. Well, yes, she answered. He was very, very famous in the 19th century. In fact, he was probably the only spiritualist of his time who wasn't ever clearly convicted of fraud. You know, I had an experience once, began Chris. The dean interrupted. Are you making this a matter of confession? Chris smiled and said, no, I'm not a Catholic. <laughs> well, neither are the Jesuits, Mrs. Perrin chuckled. Dominican slander, retorted the dean. Then to Chris he said, I'm sorry, my dear, you were saying? Well, just that I thought I saw somebody levitate once in Bhutan. She recounted the story. Do you think that's possible? She ended. Who knows, he shrugged. Who knows what gravity is or matter when it comes to that? Chris said, Do you know that little cottage that's back of the church over there? Holy Trinity, he asked. Yes, right. Well, what goes on in there? That's where they say Black Mass, said Mrs. Perrin. What's that? She's kidding, said the dean. Yes, yes, I know, said Chris, but I'm dumb. What's a Black Mass? Oh, basically it's a travesty on the Catholic Mass, explained the dean. It's connected to witchcraft, devil worship. Really? You mean there really is such a thing? I really couldn't say, but I'll tell you who might. Joe Dyer. The dean looked around. Over there, he said, nodding towards the other priest. Hey, Joe. Just a second, answered Dyer, and resumed his attack on the curry. That's the only leprechaun in the priesthood, said the dean with an edge of fondness. He sipped at his wine. They had a couple of cases of desecration in Holy Trinity last week and Joe said something about one of them reminding him of some things they used to do at Black Mass, so I expect he knows something about the subject. Uh, what happened to the church? asked Mary Jo Perrin. Oh, it's really too disgusting, said the dean. Well, come on, we're all through with our dinners. He described the desecrations. In the first of the incidents, the elderly sacristan of the church had discovered a mound of human excrement on the altar cloth directly before the tabernacle. The dean then employed indirection and one or two euphemisms to explain how a massive phallus sculpted in clay had been found glued firmly to a statue of Christ on the left side altar. Sick enough, he concluded. Chris noticed that Mary Jo seemed genuinely disturbed as she said, Oh, that's enough now. I'm sorry that I asked. Let's change the subject, please. No, I'm fascinated, said Chris. Yes, of course. I'm a fascinating human. It was Father Dyer. He was hovering over her with his plate. Listen, give me just a minute, and then I'll be back. I think I've got something going over there with the astronaut. Like what? asked the dean. Father Dyer raised his eyebrows and deadpan some eyes. Would you believe, he asked, first missionary on the moon? They burst into laughter. 
You're just the right size, said Mrs. Perrin. They could stow you in the nose cone. With deadpan gaze, Dyer glanced towards the astronaut. Excuse me, he said, and walked away. I like him, said Mrs. Perrin. Me too, Chris agreed. Then she turned to the dean. You haven't told what goes on in that cottage. Big secret. Who's that priest I keep seeing there? You know, sort of dark. Father Carus, said the dean with a trace of regret. What's he do? He's a counsellor. Had a pretty rough knock last night, poor guy. His mother passed away. Chris felt a melting sensation of grief that she couldn't explain. Oh, I'm sorry, she said. He seems to be taking it pretty hard, resumed the Jesuit. She was living by herself, and I guess she was dead for a couple of days before they found her. Who found her? Chris asked solemnly. The superintendent of her apartment building. I guess they wouldn't have found her even now, except... Well, the next-door neighbors complained about her radio going all the time. Chris liked to serve the liqueurs to her guests herself. She moved about the room, taking orders and fetching for each of her guests, and by the time she had made the rounds, the various clusters had shifted to new combinations, except for Dyer and the astronaut, who seemed to be getting thicker. No, I'm really not a priest, Chris heard Dyer say solemnly. I'm actually a terribly avant-garde rabbi. Chris was standing with Ellen Cleary when she heard a familiar voice shrieking obscenities at someone. She went quickly to the kitchen where Dennings was railing viciously at Carl while Sharon made futile attempts to hush him. Burke! exclaimed Chris. Knock it off! Carl! she snapped. Will you get out of here? Get out! Can't you see how he is? Nazi pig! Dennings screamed at his back, and then he turned genially to Chris. What's dessert? I'm hungry. Chris turned to Sharon. Feed him. I've got to get Reagan up to bed. And Burke, for Christ's sake, will you behave yourself? There are priests out there. Chris left the kitchen and went down to check Reagan in the basement playroom. She found her playing with the Ouija board. She seemed sullen, abstracted, remote. Hopeful of diverting her, she brought her to the living room and began to introduce her to her guests. Reagan was strangely well behaved, except for a moment with Mrs. Perrin, when she would neither speak nor accept her hand. But the seeress made a joke of it. No, as I'm a fake, <laughs> she winked at Chris. But then, with a curious air of scrutiny, she reached forward and gripped Reagan's hand with a gentle pressure, as if checking her pulse. Reagan quickly shook her off and glared malevolently. She must be tired, Mrs. Perrin said. Yet she continued to watch Reagan with an anxiety unexplained. She's been feeling kind of sick, Chris murmured in apology. Haven't you, honey? Reagan did not answer. She kept her eyes on the floor. She took Reagan up to bed and tucked her in. She leaned over and kissed her, and then walked to the door and flicked the light switch. Night, my baby. Chris was almost out the door when Reagan called out to her very softly, Mother! What's wrong with me? So haunted, the tone so despairing, so disproportionate to her condition. For a moment the mother felt shaken and confused, but quickly she righted herself. Well, it's just like I said, hon, it's nerves. All you need is those pills for a couple of weeks, and I know you'll be feeling just fine. Now then, try to go to sleep, hon, okay? Chris abruptly noticed goose pimples rising on her forearm. She rubbed it. Good Christ, it gets cold in this room. Where's the draft coming in from? She moved to the window and checked along the edges, found nothing. Turned to Reagan. You warm enough, baby? No answer. Eyes closed, deep breathing. Chris tiptoed from the room. As she walked down the stairs, she saw with pleasure that the young father Dyer was playing the piano near the living room picture window and was leading a group that had gathered round in cheerful song. Dyer broke off his playing of chords and looked up to greet her. Yes, young lady, and what can we do for you today? Chris chuckled. I thought I'd get the scoop on what goes on at Black Mass. Father Wagner said you were the expert. 
The group at the piano fell silent with interest. No, not really, said Dyer, lightly touching some chords. Why do you mention Black Mass? Oh, well, some of us were talking before about those things that they found at Holy Trinity, and... Oh, you mean the desecrations? Dyer interrupted. Father Wagner says you told him it was like at Black Mass, prompted Chris, and I wondered what went on at those things. Oh, I really don't know all that much, he protested. In fact, most of what I know is what I've heard from another Jesuit. Father Carus is the expert on all this stuff. The dark priest at Holy Trinity? You know him? asked Dyer. No, I just heard him mentioned, that's all. Well, I think he did a paper on it once. You know, just from the psychiatric side. Are you telling me he's a psychiatrist? Well, sure. I assumed you knew. Listen, somebody tell me something, the astronaut demanded impatiently. What does go on at Black Mass? Let's just say perversions, Dyer shrugged. Obscenities, blasphemies. It's an evil parody of the Mass, where instead of God they worshipped Satan and sometimes offered human sacrifice. But how can you know that? Chris asked. Even if there was such a thing as Black Mass, who's to say what went on there? Well, I guess they got most of it, answered Dyer, from the people who were caught and then confessed. Oh, come on, said the dean. Those confessions were worthless, Joe. They were tortured. No, only the snotty ones, Dyer said blandly. Then his eyes shifted to a point in the room behind Chris. I think we have a visitor, Mrs. McNeil. Chris turned and gasped on seeing Reagan in her nightgown urinating gushingly onto the rug. Staring fixedly at the astronaut, she intoned in a lifeless voice, You're going to die up there. Oh, my God! cried Chris in pain, rushing to her daughter. Oh, God, you're my baby. Come with me. She led her away with a tremulous apology to the ashen astronaut. Oh, I am so sorry. She's been sick. She must be walking in her sleep. She didn't know what she was saying. Then she walked Reagan upstairs to her bathroom, bathed her, and changed her nightgown. Honey, why did you say that? Chris asked her repeatedly, but Reagan appeared not to understand. Her eyes were vacant and clouded. Chris tucked her into bed, and almost immediately Reagan appeared to fall asleep. For a time, Chris waited, listening to her breathing, then left the room. She returned to the living room, where the guests who still remained expressed their sympathy as she gave them a brief account of Reagan's illness. When she mentioned the wrappings and the other attention-getting phenomena, Mrs. Perrin stared at her intently. Does she walk in her sleep quite a bit? asked Dyer. No, tonight's the first time, or at least the first time I know of. So I guess it's this hyperactivity thing, d d don't you think? Oh, I really wouldn't know, said the priest. I've heard sleepwalking's common at puberty, except that... Here he shrugged and broke off. Throughout the remainder of the discussion, Mrs. Perrin sat quietly, watching the dance of flames in the living room fireplace. Well, I do have that mass, said the dean at last, rising to leave. It triggered a general departure, the last to leave were Mary Jo Perrin and her son. Chris asked her opinion on Reagan's continued use of the Ouija board and her Captain Howdy fixation. Do you think there's any harm in it, she asked. Chris was surprised when Mrs. Perrin frowned and looked down at the doorstep. I would take it away from her, she said quietly. Many people associate me with spiritualism, but that's wrong. I think I have a gift, she continued quietly, but it isn't occult. The occult is something different. I've stayed away from that. I think dabbling with that can be dangerous, and that includes fooling around with a Ouija board. Something in her manner now was deeply disturbing. Chris felt a creeping foreboding that she tried to dispel. Oh, come on, Mary Jo. Don't you know how those Ouija boards work? It isn't anything at all but a person's subconscious, that's all. Yes, perhaps, she answered quietly. But in story after story that I've heard, 
Ouija boards always seem to point to the opening of a door of some sort. Oh, not to the spirit world, perhaps. You don't believe in that. Perhaps, then, a door in what you call the subconscious. I don't know. All I know is that things seem to happen. And, my dear, there are lunatic asylums all over the world filled with people who dabbled in the occult. Are you kidding? There was a family in Bavaria, Chris, in 1921, a family of 11. Just a short time following an attempt at a seance, they went out of their minds, all 11. They went on a burning spree in their house, and when they'd finished with the furniture, they started on the three-month-old baby of one of the younger daughters, and that is when the neighbours broke in and stopped them. The entire family, she ended, was put in an asylum. Oh, boy, breathed Chris, as she thought of Captain Howdy. He had now assumed a menacing coloration. Mental illness? Was that it? Something. I knew I should take her to see a psychiatrist. Oh, for heaven's sake, said Mrs. Perrin, you just listen to your doctor. I'm great at the future, Mrs. Perrin smiled, but in the present, I'm absolutely helpless. Lovely home, she remarked as she glanced up at the upper facade of the house. Gives a feeling of warmth. God Almighty, I'm relieved. For a second there I thought you were going to tell me it's haunted. Why would I tell you a thing like that? It's a very fine house, Mrs. Perrin reassured her. I've been here before, you know, many times. Have you really? Yes, an admiral had it, a friend of mine. I get a letter from him now and then. They've shipped him to sea again, poor dear. I don't know if it's really him that I miss, or this house. She smiled. But then maybe you'll invite me back. Mary Jo, I'd love to have you back. I mean it. Please, will you call me next week? Yes, I would like to hear how your daughter's coming on. Got the number? Yes, at home in my book. What was off, wondered Chris. There was something in her tone that was slightly off-centre. Well, good night, said Mrs. Perrin, and thanks again for a marvellous evening. And before Chris could answer her, she was walking rapidly down the street. She went to the living room and stood over Willie, who was kneeling by the urine stain. She was brushing up the nap of the rug. White vinegar I put on, muttered Willie. Twice. Coming out? Maybe now, answered Willie. I do not know. We will see. Chris started up the stairs with weary steps. Great curry there, Willie. Everybody loved it. Yes, thank you, madam. Chris looked in on Reagan and found her still asleep. She remembered an incident when her daughter was only three, the night that Howard had decided she was much too old to continue to sleep with her baby bottle, on which she had grown dependent. He'd taken it away from her that night, and Reagan had screamed until four in the morning, then acted hysterical for days. And now Chris feared a similar reaction. Better wait until I took it all out with a shrink. Moreover, the Ritalin, she reflected, hadn't had a chance to take effect. At the last, she decided to wait and see. Chris retired to her room, settled wearily into bed, and almost instantly fell asleep then awakened to fearful, hysterical screaming at the rim of her consciousness. Chris raced down the hall to Reagan's bedroom, whimpering, crying, sounds like bed springs. Oh, my baby, what's wrong? Chris exclaimed as she reached out and flicked on the lights. Good Christ almighty! Reagan lay taut on her back, face stained with tears and contorted with terror as she gripped at the sides of her narrow bed. Mother, why is it shaking? she cried. Make it stop, Mother, please make it stop. The mattress of the bed was quivering violently back and forth. They brought her to an ending in a crowded cemetery where the gravestones cried for breath. The mass had been lonely as her life. Her brothers from Brooklyn, the grocer on the corner who'd extended her credit, watching them lower her into the dark of a world without windows, Damien Carras sobbed with a grief he had long misplaced. Ah, Demi, Demi, an uncle with an arm around his shoulder. Never mind, she's in heaven now, Demi. She happy. 
Oh, God, let it be. Oh, God. They waited in the car while he lingered by the grave. He could not bear the thought of her being alone. Driving to Pennsylvania Station, he listened to his uncles speak of their illnesses in broken immigrant accents. Passing the hotel, Karas burst into sobs and then choked back the memories, wiping at the wetness of stinging regrets. He wondered why love had waited for this distance, waited for the moment when he need not touch, when the limits of contact and human surrender had dwindled to the size of a printed mass card tucked in his wallet, in memoriam. He knew this grief was old. He arrived at Georgetown in time for dinner, but had no appetite. He paced inside his cottage. Jesuit friends came by with condolences, stayed briefly, promised prayers. Shortly after ten, Joe Dyer appeared with a bottle of scotch. He displayed it proudly. Chivas Regal. Where did you get the money for it? Out of the poor box? Don't be an asshole. Where did you get it, then? I stole it. Karras smiled and shook his head as he fetched a glass and a pewter coffee mug. He rinsed them out in his tiny bathroom sink and said, I believe you. Greater faith I have never seen. Karras felt a stab of familiar pain. He shook it off and returned to Dyer, who was sitting on his cot, breaking open the seal. He sat beside him. Would you like to absolve me now or later? Just pour, said Karras, and we'll absolve each other. Dyer poured deep into glass and cup. College presidents shouldn't drink, he murmured. It sets a bad example. I figure I'd relieve him of a terrible temptation. Karras swallowed scotch, but not the story. He knew the president's ways too well. Dyer had come, he knew, as a friend, but also as the president's personal emissary. So when Dyer made a passing comment about Karras possibly needing a rest, the Jesuit psychiatrist took it as hopeful omen of the future and felt a momentary flood of relief. Dio was good for him, made him laugh, talked about the party and Chris McNeil. He drank very little, but continually replenished Karras's glass, and when he thought he was numb enough for sleep, he got up from the cot and made Karras stretch out while he sat at the desk and continued to talk until Karras's eyes were closed and his comments were mumbled grunts. Dyer stood up and undid the laces of Karras's shoes and slipped them off. Gonna steal my shoes now? Karras muttered thickly. No, I tell fortunes by reading the creases. Now shut up and go to sleep. You Jesuit cat burglar. Dyer laughed lightly and covered him with a coat that he took from a closet. Listen, someone's got to worry about the bills around this place. All you other guys do is rattle beads and pray for the hippies down on M Street. Karras made no answer. His breathing was regular and deep. Dyer moved quietly to the door and flicked out the light. Stealing is a sin, muttered Karras in the darkness. Mea culpa, Dyer said softly. He left the cottage. In the middle of the night, Karras awakened in tears. He had dreamed of his mother. He waited for his sobbing to subside and then fumbled for the scotch. He sat on the cot and drank in darkness. Wet came the tears. They would not cease. This was like childhood, this grief. He didn't remember falling asleep. He awakened in torpor, with memory of loss draining blood from his stomach. He reeled to the bathroom, showered, shaved, dressed in a cassock. It was 5.35. He unlocked the door to Holy Trinity, put on his vestments, and offered up Mass at the left side altar. Memento etiam, he prayed with despair. Remember thy servant, Mary Caras. Agnus Dei, he murmured as he bowed and struck his breast. Lamb of God, who takest away the sins of the world, grant her rest. An anguished moan escaped from Karas as he bowed his head above the host. He struck his breast as if it were time and murmured, Domine non sum dignus, I am not worthy. Say but the word and my soul shall be healed. 
Against all reason, against all knowledge, he prayed there was someone to hear his prayer. He did not think so. After the Mass, he returned to the cottage and tried to sleep without success. Later in the morning, a youngish priest that he'd never seen came by unexpectedly, in the eyes, the restless burden, in the voice, the tugging plea. For a moment, Karas hated him. Come in, he said gently, and inwardly raged at this portion of his being that rendered him helpless, that he could not control, that lay coiled within him like a length of rope, always ready to fling itself unbidden at the cry of someone else's need. The young priest fumbled, faltered, seemed shy. Karas led him patiently, offered cigarettes, instant coffee, then forced a look of interest as the moody young visitor gradually unfolded a familiar problem, the terrible loneliness of priests. Of all the anxieties that Karas encountered among the community, this one had lately become the most prevalent. Cut off from their families as well as from women, many of the Jesuits were also fearful of expressing affection for fellow priests, of forming deep and loving friendships. Like I'd like to put my arm around another guy's shoulder, but right away I'm scared he's going to think I'm queer. I mean, you hear all these theories about so many latents attracted to the priesthood, so I just don't do it. I won't even go to somebody's room just to listen to records or talk or smoke. It's not that I'm afraid of him. I'm just worried about him getting worried about me. Karras felt the weight easing slowly from the other and onto him. He let it come, let the young priest talk. At last the visitor looked at his watch. It was time for lunch in the campus refectory. In the afternoon he had still another visitor, the elderly pastor of Holy Trinity, who took a chair by the desk and offered condolences on the passing of Karras's mother. Said a couple of masses for her, Damien, and one for you, he wheezed with the barest trace of a brogue. That was thoughtful of you, Father. Thank you very much. How old was she? Seventy. A good old age. Karas fixed his gaze on an altar card that the pastor had carried in with him, one of three employed in the Mass. It was covered in plastic and inscribed with a portion of the prayers that were said by the priest. The psychiatrist wondered what he was doing with it. Well, Damien, we've had another one of those things here today, in the church, you know. Another desecration. A statue of the Virgin at the back of the church had been painted like a harlot, the pastor told him. Then he handed the altar card to Karas. The pastor explained that someone had slipped in a typewritten sheet between the original card and its cover. The text was in basically fluent Latin and described in vivid erotic detail an imagined homosexual encounter involving the Blessed Virgin Mary and Mary Magdalene. That's enough now. You don't have to read it all, said the pastor, snapping back the card as if fearing that it might be an occasion of sin. Now that's excellent Latin. I mean, it's got style, a church Latin style. Well, the sergeant says he could be a priest, you know, a very sick priest, do you think? And the psychiatrist considered for a while and nodded. Yes, yes, he could. Acting out a rebellion, perhaps, in a state of complete somnambulism. I don't know. It could be. Maybe so. Can you think of any candidates, Damien? I don't get you. Well, now, sooner or later, they come and see you, wouldn't you say? I mean, the sick ones, if there are any, from the campus. Do you know any like that? I mean, with that kind of illness, you know? No, I don't. No, I didn't think you'd tell me. Well, I wouldn't know anyway, Father. If it is a somnambulist, he's probably got a complete posterior amnesia about what he's done, so that even he wouldn't have a clue. What if you were to tell him? The pastor asked cagily. I really don't know, repeated the psychiatrist. No. No, I really didn't think that you'd tell me. He rose and moved for the door. You know what you're like, you people? Like priests, he complained. As Karas laughed gently, the pastor returned and dropped the altar card on his desk. I suppose you should study this thing, he mumbled. Something might come to you. The pastor moved for the door. 
Did they check it for fingerprints? asked Karas. The pastor stopped. Oh, I doubt it. After all, it's not a criminal we're after now, is it? More likely it's only a demented parishioner. What do you think of that, Damien? Do you think that it could be someone in the parish? You know, I think so. It wasn't a priest at all. It was someone among the parishioners, don't you think? I really wouldn't know, he said again. No, I didn't think you'd tell me. Later that day, Father Karras was relieved of his duties as counsellor and assigned to the Georgetown University Medical School as lecturer in psychiatry. His orders were to rest. Reagan lay on her back on Klein's examining table, arms and legs bowed outward. Taking her foot in both his hands, the doctor flexed it toward her ankle. For moments he held it there in tension and suddenly released it. He repeated the procedure several times. He seemed dissatisfied. When Reagan abruptly sat up and spat in his face, he instructed a nurse to remain in the room and returned to his office to talk to Chris. Well, what is it? Chris asked in an anxious tone. Well, the test was negative, he told her. Has she ever had a fall? Like on the head? asked Chris. Well, yes. No, not that I know of. Childhood diseases, just the usual. Measles and mumps and chickenpox. Sleepwalking history, not until now. What do you mean? She was walking in her sleep at the party. Well, yes, she still doesn't know what she did that night. And there's other stuff, too, that she doesn't remember. Lately? Sunday, Reagan still sleeping. An overseas telephone call from Howard. How's Rags? Thanks a lot for the call on her birthday. I was stuck on a yacht. Now, for Christ's sakes, lay off me. I called her the minute I was back in the hotel. Oh, sure. She didn't tell you? You talked to her? Yes. That's why I thought I'd better call you. What the hell's going on with her? What are you getting at? She just called me a cocksucker and hung up the phone. Recounting the incident to Dr. Klein, Chris explained that when Reagan had finally awakened, she had no memory of whatever of either the telephone call or of what had happened on the night of the dinner. Then perhaps she wasn't lying about the moving of the furniture, Klein hypothesized. Well, she moved it herself, no doubt, but perhaps while in one of those states where she didn't really know what she was doing. It's known as automatism, like a trance state. The patient doesn't know or remember what he's doing. But something just occurred to me, Doc, you know that? There's a great big heavy bureau in her room made out of teak wood. It must weigh half a ton. I mean, how could she have moved that? Extraordinary strength is pretty common in pathology. Oh, really? How come? The doctor shrugged. No one knows. Now, besides what you've told me, he continued, have you noticed any other bizarre behavior? Well, she's gotten real sloppy. Bizarre, he repeated. For her... That's bizarre. Oh, now, wait. There's this. You remember that Ouija board she's been playing with? Captain Howdy? The fantasy playmate. The internist nodded. Well, now she can hear him. The doctor leaned forward, folding his arms atop the desk. Yesterday morning, said Chris, I could hear her talking to Howdy in her bedroom. I mean, she'd talk and then seemed to wait as if she were playing with the Ouija board. When I peeked inside the room, though, there wasn't any Ouija board there, just rags. And she was nodding her head, Doc, just like she was agreeing with what he was saying. Did you see him? I don't think so. She sort of had her head to the side, the way she does when she listens to records. The doctor nodded thoughtfully. Yes, yes, I see. Any other phenomena like that? Does she see things, smell things? Smell, Chris remembered. She keeps smelling something bad in her bedroom. Something burning? Ah, that's right, Chris exclaimed. How do you know that? It's sometimes the symptom of a type of disturbance in the chemico-electrical activity of the brain. It's rare, but it does cause bizarre hallucinations, and usually just before a convulsion. I suppose that's why it's taken for schizophrenia so often, but it isn't schizophrenia. Now, the test for clonus is not conclusive, Mrs. McNeil, so I think I'd like to give her an EEG. It will show us the pattern of her brain waves. 
That's usually a pretty good indication of abnormal function. You want to test her right now? asked Chris. Yes, but she's going to need sedation. If she moves or jerks, it will void the result. So may I give, say, 25 milligrams of librium? Jesus, do what you have to, she told him, shaken. She accompanied him to the examining room, and when Reagan saw him readying the hypodermic, she screamed and filled the air with a torrent of obscenities. She held Reagan still while Dr. Klein gave the injection. I'll be back, the doctor said, and left to attend to another patient. When he returned a short time later, the librium still had not taken effect. Klein seemed surprised. That was quite a strong dose, he remarked. He injected another 25 milligrams, left, came back, found Reagan tractable and docile. What are you doing? Chris asked him, as Klein applied the saline-tipped electrodes to Reagan's scalp. We put four on each side, he explained. That enables us to take a brain wave reading from the left and right side of the brain and then compare them. He had turned the machine on. He studied the pattern of the brain wave carefully, but discovered no dyrrhythmia, no spikes, no flattened domes. And when he switched to comparison readings, the results were also negative. So what's the story? Chris inquired. The doctor sat pensively on the edge of his desk. It might be hysteria, but the pattern before and after her convulsion was much too striking. Chris furrowed her brow. You know, you keep on saying that, Doc. Convulsion. You know it as epilepsy, Mrs. McNeil. Oh, my God. Chris sank to a chair. Now, let's hold it, soothed Klein. I can see that, like most of the general public, your impression of epilepsy is exaggerated. Most of us are born with a pretty high threshold of resistance to convulsions, some with a low one. So the difference between you and an epileptic is a matter of degree, that's all. Just degree. It is not a disease. Then what is it? A freaking hallucination? A disorder, a controllable disorder. Very possibly it's psychosomatic. Any number of changes in the function of the brain can trigger a convulsion in the epileptic. Worry, fatigue, emotional stress, a particular note on a musical instrument. I guess, Chris sighed, dejected. But I don't understand how her whole personality could be changed. In temporal lobe, that's extremely common and can last for days or even weeks. It isn't rare to find destructive and even criminal behavior. There's such a big change, in fact, that two or three hundred years ago, people with temporal lobe disorders were often considered to be possessed by a devil. They were what? Taken over by the mind of a demon. You know, something like a superstitious version of split personality. Chris closed her eyes and lowered her forehead onto a fist. Listen, tell me something good, she murmured. Well, now, don't be alarmed. If it is a lesion, then all we have to do is remove the scar. Oh, swell. Or it could be just pressure on the brain. Look, I'd like to have some x-rays taken of her skull. There's a radiologist here in the building. Shall I call him? God, yes, go ahead. Let's do it. Klein called and set it up. He hung up the phone and began writing a prescription. Room 21 on the second floor. Then I'll probably call you tomorrow or Thursday. I'd like a neurologist in on this. In the meantime, I'm taking her off the Ritalin. Let's try her on Librium. While. I'd try to stay close to her, Mrs. McNeil. In her walking trance states, if that's what it is, it's always possible for her to hurt herself. Is your bedroom close to hers? Yeah, it is. She propped her face on her hand and leaned thoughtfully forward. You know, I thought of something else just now. And what was that? Well, like after a fit, you were saying she'd right away fall dead asleep. Like on Saturday night. I mean, didn't you say that? Well, yes. Klein nodded. That's right. Well, then, how come those other times she said that her bed was shaking, she was always wide awake? You didn't tell me that. Well, if so, she looked just fine. Klein frowned and gently chewed on his lip for a moment. Well, let's look at those x-rays, he finally told her. 
Chris shepherded Reagan to the radiologist, stayed at her side while the x-rays were taken, took her home. I'm feeling sleepy, Reagan said. Then turning, she climbed up the stairs to her bedroom. Must be the Librium, Chris reflected as she watched her. Then at last she sighed and went into the kitchen. She poured some coffee and sat down at the breakfast nook table with Sharon. How did it go? Chris fluttered the prescription slip onto the table. Better call and get that filled, she said. If I'm busy or out, keep a real good eye on her, would you, sir? She got up from the table and went up to Reagan's bedroom, found her under the covers and apparently asleep. Chris moved to the window and tightened the latch. She stared below. The window, facing out from the side of the house, directly overlooked the precipitous public staircase that plunged to M Street far below. Boy, I'd better call a locksmith right away. Chris returned to the kitchen and added the chore to the list from which Sharon sat working, gave Willie the dinner menu and returned a call from her agent. What about the script, he wanted to know. Yeah, it's great, Ed. Let's do it, she told him. When's it go? Well, your segment's in July, so you'll have to start preparing right away. You're involved in a lot of the pre-production. You've got to work with the set designer, the costume designer, the makeup artist, the producer, and you'll have to pick a cameraman and a cutter and block out your shots. Come on, Chris, you know the drill. Oh, shit, you've got a problem? Yeah, I do. I've got a problem. What's the problem? Well, Reagan's pretty sick. I need to be at home with her. She needs my attention. Look, I can't just explain it, Ed. It's too complicated. So why don't we just hold off for a while? Look, you've bugged me, but you want to direct, and now you're going to blow it. Now, that's my opinion. They don't want you anyway. That's not news. They're just doing this for more. And if they go back to him now and say she isn't too sure she wants to do it, he'll have an out. Now, come on, Chris. Talk sense. Look, you do what you want. I don't care. There's no money in this thing unless it hits. Now then. What should I tell them? She shook her head. Ed, they'll just have to wait, she said wearily. Your decision. Okay, Ed. Goodbye. She hung up the phone in a state of depression and lit up a cigarette. She reached out for a book by Sharon's elbow. So, what are you reading? Oh, that. That's for you. I forgot Mrs. Perrin dropped it by. She was here? Yes, this morning. Said she's sorry she missed you, and she's going out of town, but she'll call you as soon as she's back. Chris nodded and glanced at the title of the book. A Study of Devil Worship and Related Occult Phenomena. She opened it and found a penned note from Mary Jo Perrin. Dear Chris, I happened by the Georgetown University Library and picked this up for you. It has some chapters about black mass. You should read it all, however. I think you'll find the other sections particularly interesting. See you soon, Mary Jo. Sweet lady, said Chris. Yes, she is, agreed Sharon. Chris rifled through the pages of the book. What's the scoop on black mass, pretty hairy? I don't know, answered Sharon. I haven't read it. No good for serenity. Sharon stretched and yawned. Oh, all that stuff turns me off. What happened to your Jesus complex? Oh, come on. Chris slid the book across the table to Sharon. Here, read it and tell me what happens. And get nightmares? What do you think you get paid for? Throwing up. I can do that myself, Chris muttered as she picked up the evening paper. All you have to do is to stick your business manager's advice down your throat and your vomiting blood for a week. Sharon had dinner at the house with Chris and then left for a date. She forgot. Chris saw it on the table and thought about reading it, but finally she felt too weary. She left it on the table and walked upstairs. She looked in on Reagan, who still seemed to be asleep under the covers, and apparently sleeping through. She checked the window again. The following morning, the book about devil worship had vanished from the table. No one noticed. The consulting neurologist pinned up the x-rays again. The date was Thursday, 28th of April. He removed his glasses. There's just nothing there, Sam. Nothing I can see. Klein frowned at the floor with a shake of the head. Doesn't figure. I'd like you to see her. Telephone buzzer. Excuse me. He picked up the telephone. 
Her voice was distraught and on the brim of hysteria. Oh, God, Doc, it's Reagan. Can you come right away? Well, what's wrong? I don't know, Doc. I just can't describe it. Oh, for God's sake, come over. Come now. Right away. He hung up the phone and started taking off his jacket. That's her. You want to come? I've got an hour. Let's go. They were there within minutes, and at the door where Sharon greeted them, they heard moans and screams of terror from Reagan's bedroom. I'm Sharon Spencer, she said. Come on, she's upstairs. She led them to Reagan's bedroom. Come on in and take a look at what she's doing, Chris quavered. Klein stared at Reagan. Shrieking hysterically, she was flailing her arms as her body seemed to fling itself up horizontally into the air above her bed and then slammed down savagely onto the mattress. It was happening rapidly and repeatedly. Oh, Mother, make him stop, she was screeching. Stop him, he's trying to kill me. Stop him, stop him, Mother. Oh, my baby, Chris whimpered. Doc, what is it? What's happening? He shook his head, his gaze fixed on Reagan as the odd phenomenon continued. She would lift about a foot each time and then fall with a wrenching of her breath as if unseen hands had picked her up and thrown her down. The up and down movements ceased abruptly and the girl twisted feverishly from side to side with her eyes rolled upward into their sockets so that only the whites were exposed. Oh, he's burning me, burning me, Reagan was moaning. Oh, I'm burning, I'm burning. Her legs began rapidly crossing and uncrossing. The doctors moved closer, one on either side of the bed. Still twisting and jerking, Reagan arched her head back, disclosing a swollen, bulging throat. She began to mutter something incomprehensible in an oddly guttural tone. No one way, no one way. Klein reached down to check her pulse. Now, let's see what the trouble is, dear, he said gently and abruptly was reeling, stunned and staggering, across the room from the force of a vicious backward swing of Reagan's arm as the girl sat up, her face contorted with a hideous rage. The show is mine! She bellowed in a coarse and powerful voice. She is mine! Keep away from her! She is mine! A yelping laugh gushed up from her throat, and then she fell on her back as if someone had pushed her. She pulled up her nightgown, exposing her genitals. Fuck me! Fuck me! She screamed at the doctors, and with both her hands began masturbating frantically. Moments later, Chris ran from the room with a stifled sob when Reagan put her fingers to her mouth and licked them. As Klein approached the bedside, Reagan seemed to hug herself, her hands caressing her arms. Oh, yeah. Yes, my pal, she crooned in that strangely coarsened voice. Her eyes were closed as if in ecstasy. My child, my flower, my pal. Then again she was twisting from side to side, moaning meaningless syllables over and over, and abruptly sat up with eyes staring wide with helpless terror. She mewed like a cat, then barked, then neighed, and then bending at the waist, started whirling her torso around in rapid, strenuous circles. She gasped for breath. Oh, stop him, she wept. Please stop him, it hurts. Make him stop, make him stop. I, I, I can't breathe. Klein had seen enough. He fetched his medical bag to the window and quickly began to prepare an injection. I'm giving her Librium, Klein said, but you're going to have to hold her. The neurologist nodded. He seemed preoccupied. He inclined his head to the side as if listening to the muttering from the bed. What's she saying? Klein whispered. I don't know. Just gibberish, nonsense syllables. Yet his own explanation seemed to leave him unsatisfied. She says it as if it means something, though. It's got cadence. As they came, she went rigid, as if in the stiffening grip of tetany, and the doctors looked at each other significantly, then looked again to Reagan as she started to arch her body upward into an possible position, bending it backward like a bow until the brow of her head had touched her feet. She was screaming in pain. Then Reagan fell limp in a faint and wet the bed. Klein leaned over and rolled up her eyelid, checked her pulse. I think she convulsed, don't you? Yes, I think so. Well, let's take some insurance, said Klein. Deftly, he administered the injection. Well, what do you think? Klein asked the consultant as he pressed a circle of sterile tape against the puncture. 
temporal lobe. Sure, maybe schizophrenia is a possibility, Sam, but the onset's much too sudden. She hasn't any history of it, right? No, she hasn't. Hysteria, maybe, offered the consultant. Oh, I've thought of that. Sure, but she'd have to be a freak to get her body twisted up like she did voluntarily, wouldn't you say? He shook his head. No, I think it's pathological, Sam. Her strength, the paranoia, the hallucinations. Schizophrenia, okay, those symptoms it covers, but temporal lobe would also cover the convulsions. There's one thing that bothers me, though. What's that? Well, I'm really not sure, but I thought I heard sounds of dissociation. My pearl, my child, my flower, the sow. I had the feeling she was talking about herself. Was that your impression, too? Klein stroked his lip as he mulled the question. Could be. Yes. Yes, it could. They left the room and entered the hallway. Chris wiped her nose with a bald, moist handkerchief. Her eyes were red from crying. She's sleeping, Klein told her. And she's heavily sedated. She'll probably sleep right through until tomorrow. That's good, Chris said weakly. Doc, I'm sorry about being such a baby. You're doing just fine, he assured her. It's a frightening ordeal. Oh, by the way, this is Dr. David. He's a neurologist. Okay, so what's next? Chris sighed. A lumbar tap, answered David. What we missed in the X-rays and the EEG could turn up there. I'd like to do it right now, right here, while she's sleeping. I'll give her a local, of course, but it's movement I'm trying to eliminate. How could she jump off the bed like that? Chris asked. Well, said Klein, pathological states can induce abnormal strength and accelerated motor performance. What about the spinal? Klein asked Chris. May we? Go ahead, she murmured. Do whatever you have to. Just make her well. Klein called his office and instructed an assistant to deliver the necessary equipment and medication to the house. When he'd finished the call, he turned to Chris and asked what had happened since last he saw Reagan. Well, Tuesday, Chris pondered. There was nothing at all. Last night, again, nothing. Then this morning it started. Boy, did it start. She shook her head. She'd been sitting in the kitchen, Chris told the doctors, when Reagan ran, screaming, down the stairs and to her mother, cowering defensively behind her chair as she clutched Chris's arms and explained in a terrified voice that Captain Howdy was chasing her, had been pinching her, punching her, shoving her, mouthing obscenities, threatening to kill her. There he is! She had shrieked at last, pointing to the kitchen door. Then she'd fallen to the floor, her body jerking in spasms as she gasped and wept that Howdy was kicking her. Then suddenly, Chris recounted, Reagan had stood in the middle of the kitchen with arms extended and had begun to spin rapidly like a top, continuing the movements for several minutes until she had fallen to the floor in exhaustion. And then, all of a sudden, Chris finished distressfully, I saw there was this hate in her eyes, this hate, and she told me... She was choking up. She called me... Oh, oh, Jesus. She burst into sobs and wept convulsively. David stood up and, after some reassuring statements, said goodbye. After the arrival of the equipment, Klein anesthetized Reagan's spinal area with Novocaine and, as Chris and Sharon watched, extracted the spinal fluid. Pressure's normal, he murmured. He went to the window to see if the fluid was clear or hazy. It was clear. Klein told the women, In case she awakens in the middle of the night and creates a disturbance, you might want a nurse here to give her sedation. I'd rather do it myself, Chris said. Could you teach me how to do it? she asked him. He nodded. Yes, I guess I could. He wrote a prescription for soluble thorazine and disposable syringes. He gave it to Chris. Have this filled right away. Chris handed it to Sharon. Honey, do that for me, would you? I'd like to go with the doctor while he makes those tests. Do you mind? They left the house at precisely 6.18 p.m. In his laboratory, Klein ran a number of tests. First, he analyzed protein content. Normal. Then a count of blood cells, and again drew a blank. He turned and looked to Chris. 
Do you keep any drugs in your house, he asked her. Amphetamines, LSD. Gee, no. Look, I, I tell you. No, no, there's, there's nothing like that. He nodded and stared at his shoes and then looked up and said, Well, I guess that it's time we consulted a psychiatrist, Mrs. McNeil. She was back in the house at exactly 7.21 p.m. Sharon wasn't there. Chris went upstairs to Reagan's bedroom, still heavily asleep, not a ruffle in her covers. Chris noticed that the window was open wide, an odour of urine. Sharon must have opened it to air out the room, she thought. She closed it. Where did she go? At 8.01, while Chris was in the study talking to her agent on the phone, Sharon walked through the door with several packages and then flopped in a chair and waited. Where have you been? asked Chris. Oh, didn't he tell you? Oh, didn't who tell me? Burke, isn't he here? Where is he? He was here? Oh, that nut, Sharon shied you with a head shake. I couldn't get the druggist to deliver, so when Burke came around, I thought, fine, he can stay here with Reagan while I go get the Thorazine, she shrugged. I should have known. Yeah, you should have. And so what did you buy? Well, since I thought I had the time, I went and bought a rubber draw sheet for her bed. She displayed it. At 9.28, the doorbell rang. Willie answered. It was Carl. As he passed through the kitchen or route to his room, he nodded a good evening and remarked he'd forgotten to take his key. I can't believe it, Chris said to Sharon. That's the first time he's ever admitted a mistake. They passed the evening watching television in the study. At 11.46, Chris answered the phone. The young director of the second unit. He sounded grave. Have you heard the news yet, Chris? No, what? Burke's dead. He'd been drunk. He had stumbled. He had fallen down the steep flight of stairs beside the house, fallen far to the bottom, where a passing pedestrian on M Street watched as he tumbled into the night without end. A broken neck. This bloody, crumpled scene. His last. Burke's dead! Chris sobbed. Oh, my God! gasped Sharon. Then later they talked for hours. They reminisced about Dennings. At a little past five in the morning, Chris was standing behind the bar, waiting for Sharon to return from the kitchen with a tray of ice. She heard her coming. Chris looked up and froze. Gliding spider-like, rapidly close behind Sharon, her body arched backward in a bow, with her head almost touching her feet, was Reagan her tongue flicking quickly in and out of her mouth, while she hissed sibilantly like a serpent. Sharon turned, and then screamed as she felt Reagan's tongue snaking out at her ankle. Chris whitened. Call that doctor! Get him out of bed! Get him now! Wherever Sharon moved, Reagan would follow. Friday, the 29th of April, Dr. Klein and a noted neuropsychiatrist were examining Reagan. Doctors observed her for half an hour, flinging, whirling, tearing at the hair. She occasionally grimaced and pressed her hands against her ears as if blotting out sudden deafening noise. She bellowed obscenity, screamed in pain. Then at last she flung herself face downward onto the bed and tucked her legs up under her stomach. She moaned incoherently. The psychiatrist motioned Klein away from the bed. Let's get her tranquilized, he whispered, and prepared an injection of 50 milligrams of Thorazine. However, Reagan quickly turned over and began to shriek in malevolent fury, bit him, fought him, held him off. When Carl was called in to assist, they managed to keep her sufficiently rigid for Klein to administer the injection. The dosage proved inadequate. Another 50 milligrams was injected. They waited. Reagan grew tractable. Then dreaming, and stared at the doctors in sudden bewilderment. Where's Mom? I want my Mom. <laughs> she wept. Chris ran to the bed and hugged her, kissed her, comforted and soothed. Oh, Rex, you're back. It's really you. 
poor mum, Raven sniffled. Make him stop hurting me, please, okay? Chris glanced to the doctors with a pleading question in her eyes. She's heavily sedated, the psychiatrist said gently. He turned to Reagan, reaching in his pocket for a shining bauble attached to a silvery length of chain. Have you ever seen movies where someone gets hypnotized? Reagan nodded. Well, I'm a hypnotist. Now, I think if I hypnotize you, Reagan, it will help you to get well. The psychiatrist glanced abruptly to the sound of pottery breaking behind him. A delicate vase had fallen to the floor from the top of a bureau. Never mind, Doc. Willie will get it, Chris told him. The psychiatrist gripped the chain in his fingertips and began to swing the bauble back and forth with an easy movement. Now watch this, Reagan. Keep watching, and soon you'll feel your eyelids growing heavier and heavier. Within a very short time, she seemed to be in a trance. Are you comfortable, Reagan? Yes, her voice was soft and whispery. How old are you, Reagan? Twelve. Is there someone inside you? Sometimes. When? Different times. It's a person? Yes. Who is it? I don't know. Captain Howdy? I don't know. A man? I don't know. But he's there? Yes, sometimes. Now? I don't know. If I ask him to tell me, will you let him answer? No! Why not? I'm afraid. Of what? I don't know. If he talks to me, Reagan, I think he will leave you. Do you want him to leave you? Yes. I am speaking to the person inside Reagan now, the psychiatrist said firmly. If you are there, you too are hypnotized and must answer all my questions. Come forward and answer now. Are you there? Silence. Then something curious happened. Reagan's breath turned suddenly foul. It was thick, like a current. The psychiatrist smelled it from two feet away. Chris stifled a gasp. Her daughter's features were contorting into a malevolent mask, lips pulling tautly into opposite directions, tumefied tongue lolling wolfish from her mouth. Oh, my God, breathed Chris. Are you the person in Reagan? the psychiatrist asked. She nodded. Who are you? No one. I. She answered gutturally. That's your name? She nodded. Where do you come from? Dog. You say that you come from a dog? Dog. Wolf. Mockium. Reagan replied. The psychiatrist thought for a moment, then attempted another approach. When I ask you questions now, you will answer by moving your head. A nod for yes and a shake for no. Do you understand? Reagan nodded. Did your answers have any meaning, he asked her. No. Are you someone whom Reagan has known? No. Are you someone she has invented? No. You're real? Yes. Part of Reagan? No. Were you ever a part of Reagan? No. Do you like her? No. Dislike her? Yes. Do you hate her? Yes. Over something she's done? Yes. Do you blame her for her parents' divorce? No. Has it something to do with her parents? No. With a friend? No. But you hate her? Yes. Are you punishing Reagan? Yes. You wish to harm her? Yes. To kill her? Yes. If she died, wouldn't you die too? No. In the smothering stillness, Reagan's breathing rasped as from a rotted, putrid bellows, here yet far, distantly sinister. Is there something she can do that would make you leave her? Yes. Will you tell me? No. The psychiatrist gasped in startled pain as he realized with horrified incredulity that Reagan was squeezing his scrotum with a hand that had gripped him like an iron talon. Eyes wide staring, he struggled to free himself. He couldn't. Sam! Sam, help me! He croaked. Agony. Bedlam. Reagan with her head back, cackling demonically, then howling like a wolf. Chris slapped at the light switch, turned, 
and saw Reagan and the doctors writhing on the bed in a tangle of shifting arms and legs, in a melee of grimaces, gasps and curses, and the howling and the yelping and hideous laughter with Reagan oinking, Reagan neighing, and the bedstead shaking, violently quivering from side to side, as Chris watched helplessly while her daughter's eyes rolled upward into their sockets, and she wrenched up a keening shriek of terror, torn, raw and bloody from the base of her spine. Reagan crumpled and fell unconscious. Something unspeakable left the room. The doctors untangled themselves, stood up. After a time, Klein took Reagan's pulse. Satisfied, he slowly pulled up her blanket and nodded to the others. They left the room and went down to the study. What the hell's going on? Chris asked in a mournful, haggard whisper. Did you recognize the language she was speaking? He asked her. Chris shook her head. Have you any religion? No. Your daughter? No. And now the psychiatrist asked her a lengthy series of questions relating to Reagan's psychological history. He seemed disturbed. What is it? Chris asked him. The psychiatrist sighed, fingering his brow. <sighs> to begin with, he told her, it's highly improbable that she's faking. A psychic effect like that is unlikely unless she believed in this person. I tend to reject schizophrenia, which leaves us the general field of hysteria. Hysteria, he continued, is a form of neurosis in which emotional disturbances are converted into bodily disorders. Now, in certain of its forms, there's dissociation. In psychasthenia, for example, the individual loses consciousness of his actions, but he sees himself act and attributes his actions to someone else. His idea of the second personality is vague, however, and Reagan's seems specific. So we come to what Freud used to call the conversion form of hysteria. It grows from unconscious feelings of guilt and the need to be punished. What would she have to feel guilty about? Well, a cliché answer, the psychiatrist responded, might be the divorce. Children often feel they are the ones rejected, and assumed the full responsibility for the departure of one of their parents. Chris gave her head a shake. I'm confused, she murmured. I mean, where does this new personality come in? Well, he replied, assuming that it is conversion hysteria stemming from guilt, then the second personality is simply the agent who handles the punishing. That's what you think she's got? As I said, I don't know replied the psychiatrist. It's extremely unusual for a child of Reagan's age to be able to pull together and organize the components of a new personality. And certain other things are puzzling. Her performance with the Ouija board, for example, would indicate extreme suggestibility, and yet, apparently, I never really hypnotized her. He shrugged. Well, perhaps she resisted. But the really striking thing is the new personality's apparent precocity. It isn't a 12-year-old at all. It's much, much older. And then there's the language she was speaking, a form of somnambulism where the subject suddenly manifests knowledge or skills he's never learned, and where the intention of the second personality is the destruction of the first. So what's the bottom line? Chris asked. At the moment, he told her, a blank. She needs an intensive examination by a team of experts, two or three weeks of really concentrated study in a clinical atmosphere, say the Barringer Clinic in Dayton. The Barringer Clinic agreed to take Reagan the following day. The doctors left. Chris swallowed pain with remembrance of Dennings and began to pack. She was standing in her bedroom selecting a camouflaging wig to wear in Dayton when Carl appeared. There was someone to see her, he told her. Who? Detective. And he wants to see me? He nodded. Then he handed her a business card. She looked it over blankly. William F. Kinderman, it announced. Lieutenant of Detectives, Homicide Division. She looked up from the card with suspicion. He was sagging in the entry hall, the brim of his limp and crumpled hat clutched tight with short, fat fingers freshly manicured, plump, in his middle fifties. Chris approached. The detective extended his hand. I'd know that face in any lineup, Miss McNeil. Am I in one? Chris asked him, 
No, 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 it's strictly routine, he assured her. What is it, Burke Dennings? Was he killed? Chris asked. Is that why you're here? He was killed, is that it? No, no, it's routine, he repeated. Did he fall? Was he pushed? He shrugged and whispered, Who knows? Was he robbed? No, not robbed, Miss McNeil, never robbed. But then, who needs a motive in times like these? These drugs, he bemoaned. These drugs, this, this LSD. Believe me, I'm a father. And when I see what's going on, it breaks my heart. You've got children? Yes, one. You know that film you made called Angel, he said. I saw that film six times. Reagan's sculpture of the bird was now the centerpiece of the table. Quaint, he smiled. Nice, he looked up. The artist? My daughter, Chris told him. Very nice. Look, only one question and then I'll be going. Since poor Mr. Dennings had completed his filming in this area, we wondered if he might have been visiting someone on the night of the accident. Oh, he was here that night, Chris told him. Oh, his eyebrows sickled upward. Near the time of the accident? When did it happen? she asked him. 7.05, he told her. Yes, I think so. Well, that settles it then, he nodded. He was drunk. He was leaving. He fell down the steps. That settles it, definitely. Listen, just for the sake of the record, can you tell me approximately what time he left the house? I don't know, she replied. I didn't see him. I don't understand. Well, he came and left while I was out. He nodded. But then, how do you know he was here? Sharon Spencer, she's my secretary. She was here when Burke dropped by. He came to see her, he asked. No, me. My daughter was sick, and Sharon left him here while she went to pick up some prescriptions. By the time I got home, though, Burke was gone. 7.15 or so, 7.30. And what time had you left? Maybe 6.15-ish. What time had Miss Spencer left? I don't know. And between the time Miss Spencer left and the time you returned, who was here in the house with Mr. Dennings besides your daughter? No one. No one. He left her alone. She nodded. No servants? No. Willie and Carl were... Who were they? The nuzzling interview, she realized, was suddenly steely interrogation. Well, Carl's right there, she motioned with her head, and Willie's his wife. They're my housekeepers. They'd taken the afternoon off, and when I got home, they weren't back yet. So then only your daughter would know when Dennings left the house. He was fingering the sculpture. No, she wouldn't. She was heavily sedated. Ah, oh, dear me, a shame, a shame. His droopy eyelids seeped concern. It's serious? Yes, I'm afraid it is. That's her room, he was thumbing towards the ceiling. With that great big window looking out on those steps, Chris nodded. Keep the window closed and she'll get better. Now, the housekeepers. You said they got home at what time? I didn't say. Carl, what time did you get in last night? Chris called to him. The Swiss turned round, his face inscrutable. Exactly 9.30, madam. You saw a good film? the detective asked Carl. Paul Schofield in Lear, Carl informed the detective. Ah, I saw that. That's excellent, marvelous. Yes, at the crest, Carl continued. The six o'clock showing, and then immediately after I take the bus from in front of the theater and I get off at Wisconsin Avenue and M Street, 9.20 perhaps, and then I walk to the house. Look, you didn't have to tell me, the detective told him. But anyway, it was very considerate. He turned back to Chris. Finished. We're finished. Oh, uh, no. Wait. Mrs. Angstrom. They went and came together. He was gesturing towards Carl. 
No, she went to see a Beatles film, Chris answered. She got in a few minutes after I did. He shrugged. Chris rose along with him. They reached the front door of the house. Well, I would say that it's been a pleasure, but under the circumstances, he bowed his head and shook it, I'm sorry. Really, I'm terribly sorry. Kinderman opened the door and stepped outside. Well, good luck with your daughter. Thanks, she smiled wanly. Good luck with the world. He waddled away toward a waiting squad car parked near the corner in front of a fire hydrant. Chris closed the door. When he'd entered the passenger side of the squad car, Kinderman turned and looked back at the house. He thought he saw movement at Reagan's window, a quick, lithe figure flashing to the side and out of view. He wasn't sure, but he noted that the shutters were open. The detective turned and opened the glove compartment, extracting a small brown envelope and penknife. Unclasping the smallest blade of the knife, he held his thumb inside the envelope and surgically scraped paint from Reagan's sculpture from under his thumbnail. When he had finished and was sealing the envelope, he nodded to the detective sergeant behind the wheel. They pulled away. Later that evening, Lieutenant Kinderman examined the pathologist's report on Dennings. Tearing of the spinal cord with fractured skull and neck, plus numerous contusions, lacerations and abrasions, stretching of the neck skin, shearing of platysma, sternomastoid, splenius, trapezius, and various smaller muscles of the neck, with fracture of the spine and of the vertebrae, and shearing of both the anterior and posterior spinous ligaments. He shut his eyes, recalling his conversation with the district pathologist at 11.55 on the night of Denny's death. It could have happened in a fall? No, it's very unlikely. Could another human being have done it? Yes, but he'd have to be an exceptionally powerful man. Kinderman had checked Carl Engstrom's story regarding his whereabouts at the time of Denning's death. The show times matched, as did the schedule that night of a DC transit bus. Yet on Kinderman's desk was a record of a felony charge against Engstrom on the 27th of August 1963, alleging he had stolen a quantity of narcotics over a period of months from the home of a doctor in Beverly Hills, where he and Willie were then employed. Born 20th April 1921 in Zurich, Switzerland. Married to Willie, nay Brown, 7th September 1941. Daughter Elvira, born New York City, 11th January 1943, current address unknown. The doctor, abruptly and without any explanation, dropped the charges. The Engstroms were hired by Chris McNeil only two months later, which meant that the doctor had given them a favourable reference. Engstrom had certainly pilfered the drugs, and yet a medical examination at the time of the charge had failed to yield the slightest sign that the man was an addict or even a user. Sighing, he glanced at the police psychologist's report on the recent desecrations at Holy Trinity, statue, phallus, human excrement, Damien Carras. He reached for a scholarly work on witchcraft, turning to a page he had marked with a paper clip. Black Mass. A form of devil worship, the ritual in the main consisting of 1. Exhortation, the sermon, to performance of evil among community. 2. Coition with the demon, reputedly painful, the demon's penis invariably described as icy cold. And 3. A variety of desecrations that were largely sexual in nature. For example... Communion hosts of unusual size were prepared, compounded of flour, feces, menstrual blood, and pus, which were then slit and used as artificial vaginas with which the priests would ferociously copulate while raving that they were ravishing the Virgin Mother of God or that they were sodomizing Christ. In another instance of such practice, a statue of Christ was inserted deep in a girl's vagina while into her anus was inserted the host, which the priest then crushed as he shouted blasphemies and sodomized the girl. Life-sized images of Christ and the Virgin Mary also played a frequent role in the ritual. The image of the Virgin, for example, usually painted to give her her dissolute, sluttish appearance, was equipped with breasts which the cultists sucked, and also a vagina into which the penis might be inserted. 
The statues of Christ were equipped with a phallus for fellatio by both the men and the women, and also for insertion into the vagina of the women and the anus of the men. Occasionally, rather than an image, a human figure was bound to a cross and made to function in place of the statue, and upon the discharge of his semen it was collected in a blasphemously consecrated chalice and used in the making of the communion host, which was destined to be consecrated on an altar covered with excrement. Kinderman flipped the pages to an underlined paragraph dealing with ritualistic murder. He read it slowly, and when he had finished, he left his office and drove to the morgue. The young attendant at the desk was munching at a sandwich. Dennings, the detective whispered. The attendant nodded and moved down the hall. Kinderman followed him. They halted at locker 32. The attendant slid it out. Kinderman pulled back the sheet to expose what he'd seen, and yet, could not accept. Burke Denning's head was turned completely around, facing backward. Cupped in the warm green hollow of the campus, Damien Carras alone around an oval track in shorts and a T-shirt. He noticed someone sitting on a bench. He seemed to be watching. Father Carras, Lieutenant Kinderman called. The priest turned around. Have... Have we met? asked the Jesuit. No, father. William Kinderman. He flashed his identification. Homicide. Hey, you know something, father? It's true, you do look like a boxer. Excuse me, that scar there by your eye, like Brando it looks like in Waterfront. Just exactly. Marlon Brando. A little dreamy all the time, always sad. Well, that's you. You're Brando. People tell you that, Father? No, they don't. Ever box? Oh, a little. You're from here, in the district? New York. Golden gloves, am I right? You just made captain, Karras smiled. Now, what can I do for you? I'll tell you straight what it's all about. The desecrations, Karras said. Yes, the things in the church, he confirmed. Correct. Only maybe something else besides, something serious. Murder? Yes, kick me again, I enjoy it. Well, homicide, deficient, the Jesuit shrugged. Never mind, Marlon Brando, never mind. People tell you for a priest you're a little bit smart ass. Mea culpa, Harris murmured. I don't get it, though. What's the connection? You know that director, father, Burke Dennings. You're familiar with how he died? Well, the papers, Karras shrugged. Only part of it, just a part. Listen, what do you know on the subject of witchcraft? Oh, I once did a paper on it, Karras smiled. The psychiatric end. Wonderful, great. That's a bonus, a plus. Listen, father, the desecrations. They remind you of anything to do with witchcraft? Maybe some rituals used in black mass. A plus. And now, Dennings, you read how he died? In a fall. Well, I'll tell you, and please confidential. Of course. Burke Dennings, good father, was found at the bottom of that long flight of steps at exactly five minutes after seven with his head turned completely around and backward. So what comes to mind in the context of witchcraft? The Jesuit sat down looking pensive. Well, he said, supposedly demons broke the necks of witches that way. It was a trademark of demonic assassins. Kinderman nodded. Exactly. In this case, you can see some connection maybe with that and the things in the church. Maybe somebody crazy, Father. Maybe somebody with a spite against the church. Some uh, unconscious rebellion, perhaps. Sick priest, murmured Karras. That's it. Listen, you're the psychiatrist, Father. You tell me. Well, of course, the desecrations are clearly pathological, Karras said. And if Dennings was murdered, well, I guess that the killer's pathological too. And perhaps had some knowledge of witchcraft? Could be. 
the detective grunted. So who fits the bill? Also lives in the neighborhood and also has access in the night to the church. Sick priest, Karras said. Listen, Father, this is hard for you, I understand, but for priests on campus here, you're the psychiatrist, Father, so no, I've had a change of assignment. Still, you'd know who was sick at the time and who wasn't, correct? No, not necessarily. You see, I'm not a psychoanalyst. All I do is counsel. Anyway, I really know no one who fits the description. Ah, yeah, doctor's ethics. If you knew, you wouldn't tell. No, I probably wouldn't. Incidentally, this ethic is lately considered illegal. That a threat? Don't talk paranoid. I mentioned it in passing. I could always tell the judge it was a matter of confession, said the Jesuit priest, grinning. The detective glanced up at him. Want to go into business, father? He said. Father? What father? He asked rhetorically. You're a Jew. I could tell when I met you. Karras laughed. C come on, I'll walk you to your car. The detective looked up at him. Then we're finished? Ah, well, I never thought it was a priest in the first place. They started walking. To keep up with the times these days, you have to be a little bit crazy. Karras nodded. Strange things, the detective brooded. Strange. Listen, father, am I crazy? Or could there be maybe a witch coven here in the district right now, right today? I really wouldn't know, answered Karras. But in parts of Europe, they say, Black Mass. You mean just like the old days, Father, with the sex and statues and who knows whatever, not meaning to disgust you, they did all those things? It's for real? The Jesuit chuckled. I think it's for real. But anyone doing those things is disturbed in a very special way. There's a clinical name for that kind of disturbance. It's called Satanism. It means people who can't have any sexual pleasure unless it's connected to a blasphemous action. Again, forgive me, but the things with the statues of Jesus and Mary... They're true, Karras said. When they came to the squad car, Kinderman paused. So what am I looking for, Father? A madman, said Damien Karras softly. Perhaps someone on drugs. The detective thought it over. Want a ride? he asked. Oh, thanks, but it's just a short walk. Never mind that. Enjoy. You can tell all your friends you went riding in the police car. Jesuit grinned and slipped in the back. You like movies, Father Karras? Very much. I get passes for the very best shows. Mrs. K, she gets tired, though, never likes to go. Well, it's too bad. It's too bad. Yeah, I hate to go alone. You know, I love to talk film, to discuss, to critique. Would you like to see a film with me sometime, Father? It's free. I get passes, he added quickly. The priest looked at him, grinning. As Elwood P. Dowd used to say in Harvey, Lieutenant, when? Oh, I'll call you, I'll call you, the detective beamed eagerly. They'd come to the residence hall and parked. Karras put a hand on the door. I'm sorry that I wasn't much help. Oh, you were a help, Kinderman waved limply. In fact, for a Jew who's trying to pass, you're a very nice man. Karras turned, closed the door, and leaned into the window with a faint, warm smile. Do people ever tell you you look like Paul Newman? Always. And believe me, inside this body, Mr. Newman is struggling to get out. Too crowded. Inside, he said, is also Clark Gable. Karras waved with a grin and started away. Father, wait! Karras turned. Listen, Father, I forgot. Slipped my mind. You know that card with the dirty writing on it? The one that was found in the church? You mean the altar card? I've got it in my room. I was checking the Latin. You want it? Yes, maybe it shows something. Maybe. The Jesuit went to his ground floor room and found the card. Gave it to Kinderman, who said, You studied this? Yes, I did. Your conclusion? Karras shrugged. 
doesn't look like the work of a prankster. Whoever did that thing is pretty deeply disturbed, and the Latin. It's not just flawless, Lieutenant. It's got a definite style that's very individual. It's as if whoever did it is used to thinking in Latin. Do priests? Well, yes, at a point in their training they do. Carus suddenly looked earnest. Look, Lieutenant, can I tell you who I really think did it? The detective leaned closer. No. Who? Dominicans. Go pick on them. Carus smiled, waved goodbye, and walked away. Kinderman turned and told the driver, All right, back to headquarters. Hurry, break laws. They pulled away. Carus showered and ambled to dinner in the priest's refectory. Hi, Damien, said Dyer. The young priest was wearing a faded Snoopy sweatshirt. Carus blessed himself, sat, and greeted his friend. What's dinner? Can't you smell it? Oh, shit, is it dog day, knackwurst, and sauerkraut? It's the quantity that counts, replied Dyer serenely. Half an hour later, Dyer was table-hopping, spiking the refectory with laughter. Carus checked his watch. The campus clock boomed out. It was 7 p.m. At 7.23, Lieutenant Kinderman pondered a spectrographic analysis showing that the paint from Reagan's sculpture matched a scraping of paint from the desecrated statue of the Virgin Mary. And at 8.47, in a slum in the northeast section of the city, an impassive Karl Engstrom emerged from a rat-infested tenement house, walked three blocks south of a bus stop, waited alone for a minute, expressionless, then crumpled sobbing against a lamppost. Lieutenant Kinderman at the time was at the movies. On Wednesday, May the 11th, they put Reagan to bed, installed the lock on the shutters, and stripped all the mirrors from her bedroom and bathroom. Dr. Klein came by, and Chris attended with Sharon as he drilled them in proper procedures for administering Sustagen feedings to Reagan during her periods of coma. He guided the nasogastric tubing into Reagan's stomach. Chris forced herself to watch and yet not see her daughter's face. After Dr. Klein had left the house, Chris called Mrs. Perrin. She was out. A set of restraining straps was delivered to the house, and Chris stood watching while Carl affixed them to Reagan's bed and then to her wrists. She is going to be well, he asked. A hint of some emotion had tinged his words, but Chris could not answer. She picked up an object that had been tucked under Reagan's pillow. Who put this crucifix here? she demanded. Chris found Sharon in the kitchen. Willie sliced carrots at the sink. Was it you who put the crucifix under her pillow, Shah? Chris asked. Chris, I don't even know what you're talking about. Fine, Sharon, fine. I, I believe you, but... Me? I don't put it, growled Willie defensively. Somebody put it there, damn it, Chris erupted and wheeled on Carl as he entered the kitchen. Did you put that crucifix under her pillow? No, madam, he answered. No. No cross. That fucking cross didn't just walk up there, damn you! One of you is lying! She was shrieking with rage. Now you tell me you put it there! Who? Abruptly she began to sob into trembling hand. Oh, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what I'm doing. She wept. Oh, my God. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Willie and Carl watched silently as Sharon came up beside her. Hey, okay. It's okay. Chris wiped at her face with the back of her sleeve. Yeah, I guess whoever did it was only trying to help. Chris smoked a cigarette. Then, on an impulse, she went to the study. Maybe. Maybe. What else had they said at the clinic? The origin of the syndrome is almost always auto-suggestive. Your daughter must have known about possession, believed in possession, and known about some of its symptoms, so that now her unconscious is producing the syndrome. If that can be established, you might take a stab at a form of cure that's auto-suggestive. I think of it as 
shock treatment in these cases, though most other therapists wouldn't agree, I suppose. Oh, well, as I said, it's a very outside chance, and since you're opposed to your daughter being hospitalised, I'll... Name it for God's sake! What is it? Have you ever heard of exorcism, Mrs. McNeil? Are you telling me to take her to a witch doctor? Well, yes, I suppose that I am saying just that. Perhaps to a priest. That's a rather bizarre piece of advice, I know, even dangerous. In fact, unless we can definitely ascertain whether Reagan knew anything at all about possession, and particularly exorcism, before this all came on. Do you think she might have read it? No, I don't. Seen a movie about it sometime? Something on television? No. Read the Gospels, perhaps, the New Testament. Why? There are quite a few accounts of possession in them, of exorcisms by Christ. Chris had been scanning the titles in the study. Her index fingernail clicked to the volume on witchcraft that Mary Jo Perrin had sent her. Chris plucked it out from the shelf and turned to the table of contents. There. The title of a chapter pulsed like a heartthrob, States of Possession. She walked slowly to the kitchen. Sharon was typing. Chris held up the book. Did you read this, Shah? Read what? she answered. This book on witchcraft? No. Did you put it in the study? No, never touched it. Where's Willie? At the market. Chris nodded, considering, then went back upstairs to Reagan's bedroom. She showed Carl the book. Did you put this in the study, Carl, on the bookshelf? No, madam. Maybe Willie, Chris murmured. Where the doctors at Barringer Clinic write, was this it? Had Reagan plucked her disorder through auto-suggestion from the pages of this book? Chris opened to the chapter on possession and began to search, to read. Immediately derivative of the prevalent belief in demons, a state in which many individuals believed that their physical and mental function had been invaded and were being controlled by either a demon or the spirit of someone dead. In the demoniacal form of possession, the demon may speak in languages unknown to the first personality, or there, Reagan's gibberish, an attempt at a language, she read on quickly, or manifest various parapsychic phenomena. The movement of object without application of material force. The wrappings, the flinging up and down on the bed. In cases of possession by the dead, there are manifestations such as Österreich's account of a monk who abruptly, while possessed, became a brilliant dancer, although he had never had occasion to dance so much as a step. So impressive at times are these manifestations that Jung, the psychiatrist, after studying a case at first hand, could offer only partial explanation for what he was certain could not have been fraud. Chris did not hear the doorbell chime, did not hear Sharon stop typing to rise and go answer it. Chris? There's a homicide detective wants to see you. He came in with Sharon, wheezing and listing. So sorry. You're busy. I'm a bother. How's the world? Very bad, very bad. How's your daughter? No change. I'm terribly sorry. He was hulking by the table now. Your daughter, it's a worry. God knows when my Ruthie was down with... Please sit down. Chris cut in. Oh, yes, thank you, he exhaled, gratefully settling his bulk in a chair across the table from Sharon, who had now returned to her typing of letters. Ah, you're reading. Witchcraft, he murmured, reading the title at the top of the pages. What's doing? He looked suddenly grave. Well, Mr. Dennings, Mrs. McNeil, Darn it, snapped Sharon with irritation as she ripped out a letter from the platen of the typewriter. She balled it up and tossed it at a newspaper basket near Kinderman. You're the secretary, Kinderman asked. Perhaps you can help. 
On the night of Mr. Denning's demise, you went out to a drugstore and left him alone in the house, correct? Well, no. Reagan was here. Well, let's see. I remember the pharmacist said the delivery boy had gone home. I remember I said something about it's only being 6.30. Then Burke came along, just 10, maybe 20 minutes after that. So a median, concluded the detective, would have put him here at 6.45. And so what's all this about, asked Chris. Well, it raises a question, Mrs. McNeil, to arrive in the house at, say, quarter to seven and leave only twenty minutes later. Oh, well, that was Burke, said Chris, just like him. Was it also like Mr. Dannings to frequent the bars on M Street? No. No, I thought not. And was it also not his custom to travel by taxi? He wouldn't call a cab from the house when he left. Yes, he would. Then one wonders how he came to be walking a platform at the top of the steps, and one wonders why taxicab companies do not show a record of calls from this house on that night, added Kinderman, except for the one that picked up your Miss Spencer here at precisely 647. You knew all along, gasped Sharon Kinderman. Yes, for forgive me, the detective told her. However, the matter has now grown serious. Are you saying he was murdered? Chris tensed. The position of Denning's head and certain shearing of the muscles of the neck would... Oh, God, Chris winced. Yes, it's painful. I'm sorry. But you see, this condition never could happen unless Mr. Dennings had fallen some distance before he hit the steps. For example, some twenty or thirty feet before he went rolling down to the bottom. He turned now to a frowning Sharon. When you left, he was where, Mr. Dennings? With the child? No, down here in the study. He was fixing a drink. Might your daughter remember, he turned to Chris, if perhaps Mr. Dennings was in her room that night? No, I told you before, she was heavily sedated, and she was also sedated, he interrupted, when last we spoke. Oh, well, yes, as a matter of fact, she was, Chris recalled. So what? I thought I saw her at the window that day. You're mistaken, he shrugged. It could be, it could be, I'm not sure. Listen, why are you asking all this, Chris demanded. Well... A clear possibility, as I was saying, is maybe the deceased was so drunk that he stumbled and fell from the window in your daughter's bedroom. Chris shook her head. No way. No chance. The window was always closed, and Burke was always drunk. But he never got sloppy. Burke used to direct when he was smashed. Now how could he stumble and fall out of a window? The detective nodded at the book on witchcraft. You've read in that book about ritual murder. Mr. Dennings was discovered with his neck wrenched around in the type of ritual murder by so-called demons, Mrs. McNeil. Chris went white. Some lunatic killed Mr. Dennings, the detective continued. It could technically still be an accident, but I believe he was killed by a powerful man, point one, and the fracturing of his skull, point two, plus the various things I have mentioned would make it very probable the deceased was killed and then afterward pushed from your daughter's window. But no one was here except your daughter, so how could this be? It could be one way. If someone came calling between the time Miss Spencer left and the time you returned, who might have come? The servants, they have visitors? Never. Not at all. Any deliveries? Not that I know of. Baffling said Kinderman with a head shake. Well, I'm sorry. I've bothered you for nothing. Forgive me. Here, I'll walk you to the door, Chris told him. Incidentally, he said as they moved from the kitchen, just a chance in a million, I know, but your daughter. You could possibly ask her if she saw Mr. Dennings in her room that night. When she's well enough, yes, I'll ask. Kinderman faltered, embarrassed. Look, I really hate to ask you. For my daughter... You could maybe give an autograph. Of course. What's her name? Chris asked. 
There followed a weighty hesitation. In Kinderman's eyes she saw some massive, terrible struggle. I lied, he said finally. It's for me. He fixed his gaze on the card and blushed. Chris wrote, William F. Kinderman, I love you, and signed her name. You're a very nice lady, he told her sheepishly. You're a very nice man. He hesitated. It's pointless, I know. It's a bother. It's dumb. But could I... Um, the question of deliveries. I really should... If you insist, Chris smiled thinly. He's with Reagan. I'll send him right down. I'm obliged. Standing tall and erect, Carl looked at Kinderman with eyes that were clear and cool. Yes? he asked. You have the right to remain silent, Kinderman greeted him. If you give up the right to remain silent, he intoned rapidly, anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. You have the right to speak with an attorney and to have the attorney present during questioning. If you so desire and cannot afford one, an attorney will be appointed for you without charge prior to questioning. Do you understand each of these rights I've explained to you? Carl's gaze never wavered as he answered, Yes. Do you wish to give up the right to remain silent? Yes. Do you wish to give up the right to speak to an attorney and have him present during questioning? Yes. Did you previously state that on April 28th, the night of the death of Mr. Dennings, you attended a film that was showing at the crest? Yes. You stated previously you attended the six o'clock showing. Yes, yes, six o'clock show, I remember. And you saw the film from the beginning? I did. And you left at the film's conclusion? I did. And leaving the theater, you boarded the D.C. transit bus in front of the theater, debarking at M Street and Wisconsin Avenue at approximately 9.20 p.m.? Yes, and walked home? I walked home. And we're back in this residence at approximately 9.30 p.m.? Yes, I look at my watch. And you saw the whole film to the very end? Yes. Your answers are being electronically recorded, Mr. Angstrom. I want you to be absolutely positive. I am positive. You're aware of the altercation between an usher and a drunken patron that happened in the last five minutes of the film? Yes. Can you tell me the cause of it? The man, he was drunk and was making disturbance. And what do they do with him, finally? Out. They throw him out. There was no disturbance. Are you also aware that during the course of the six o'clock showing, a technical breakdown lasting approximately fifteen minutes caused an interruption in the showing of the film? I am not. There was, as reflected in the log of the projectionist, showing that the film ended not at 8.40 that night, but at approximately 8.55, which would mean that the earliest bus from the theater would put you at M Street in Wisconsin, not at 9.20, but 9.45, and that the earliest you could be at the house was approximately 5 before 10. Would you care now to comment on this puzzling discrepancy? Not for a moment had Carl lost his poise, and he held it now as he answered, No. Where were you at the time Dennings died? At movies, he insisted. The detective eyed him steadily, silent and unmoving, then abruptly pushed away toward the squad car with hands in his pockets. He walked unhurriedly, viewing his surroundings to the left and the right like an interested visitor to the city. Then he entered the car without glancing back. When she heard the front door being closed, Chris was brooding at the bar in the study, pouring out a vodka over ice. She moved slowly back toward the kitchen. Something was horribly wrong. She dropped her glance to the book on witchcraft. She took a deep breath and tried to focus on the book. She found her place grew impatient, started hastily flipping through pages, skimming, searching for description of Reagan's symptoms. Demonic possession, syndrome, case of an eight-year-old girl, abnormal, four strong men to restrain her from... Turning a page, Chris stared and froze. 
Willie? Chris asked tonelessly. Yes, madam, Willie answered. Chris held up the book. Was it you put this book in the study, Willie? Willie glanced at the book and nodded. Willie, where did you find it? Up in bedroom, Willie answered. Which bedroom, Willie? Miss Reagan's. I find it under bed when I'm cleaning. When did you find it? After all, go to hospital, madam, when I vacuum in Reagan bedroom. Chris did not move, did not blink, did not breathe as the headlong image of an open window in Reagan's bedroom the night of Denning's accident rushed at her memory, talons extended like a bird of prey who knew her name. As she recognized, the sight was numbingly familiar. As she stared at the facing page of the book, a narrow strip had been surgically shaved from the length of its edge. Chris jerked her head up at the sounds of commotion in Reagan's bedroom. Rappings, rapid, with a nightmarish resonance, massive like a sledgehammer pounding in a tomb. Reagan screaming in anguish, in terror, imploring. Carl, Carl bellowing angrily at Reagan. Frenzied, Chris raced for the stairs toward the bedroom, heard a blow, someone reeling, someone crashing, like a boulder to the floor with her daughter crying, No, oh no, don't, oh no, please, and Carl bellowing, No, no, not Carl, someone else, a thundering bass that was threatening, raging. Chris burst into the bedroom, gasped, stood rooted in paralyzing shock, as the wrappings boomed massively, as Carl lay unconscious on the floor near the bureau, as Reagan, her legs propped up and spread wide on a bed that was violently bouncing and shaking, clutched the bone-white crucifix in raw-knuckled hands. The bone-white crucifix poised at her vagina, the bone-white crucifix she stared at with terror, eyes bulging in a face that was blooded from the nose, the nasogastic tubing ripped out. Oh, please! Oh, no! Please! She was shrieking as her hands brought the crucifix closer, as she seemed to be straining to push it away. You do as I tell you, filth! You do it! A threatening bellow, the words came from Reagan, her voice coarse and guttural, bristling with venom, while in an instantaneous flash her expression and features were hideously transmuted into those of the feral demonic personality that had appeared in the course of hypnosis. And now, faces and voices interchanged with rapidity. No! You will do, do it! it. Please! You, you will, you! you. Bitch, I'll, I'll kill, kill you, you, please! Yes, yes you're, you're going, going to let Jesus, Jesus fuck, fuck you. you, fuck you. Reagan now, eyes wide and staring, flinching from the rush of some hideous finality, mouth agape, shrieking at the dread of some ending. Then abruptly, the demonic face once more possessed her, now filled her, the room choking suddenly with a stench in the nostrils, with an icy cold that seeped from the walls as the wrappings ended, and Reagan's piercing cry of terror turned to a guttural, yelping laugh of malevolent spite and rage, triumphant, while she threw thrust down the crucifix into her vagina and began to masturbate ferociously, roaring in that deep, coarse, deafening voice, No, you're mine! No, you're mine! You stinking cow, you bitch! Let Jesus fuck you! Fuck you! Chris stood rooted to the ground in horror, frozen, her hands pressing tight against her cheeks, as again the demonic loud laugh crackled joyously as Reagan's vagina gushed blood onto sheets with her hymen. Abruptly, with a shriek clawing raw from her throat, Chris rushed to the bed, grasped blindly at the crucifix, was still screaming as Reagan flared up at her in fury, features contorted infernally, reached out a hand, clutching Chris's hair, and yanked her head down, pressing her face hard against her vagina, smearing it with blood while she frantically undulated her pelvis. Ah, little pig mother! Reagan crooned with a guttural, rasping, throaty eroticism. Lick me! Lick me! 
Then the hand that was holding Chrissy's head down jerked it upward while the other arm smashed her a blow across the chest that sent Chris reeling across the room and crashing to a wall with stunning force while Reagan laughed with bellowing spite. Chris crumpled to the floor in a daze of horror then looked towards the blurred bed, toward Reagan with her back to her, thrusting the crucifix gently and sensually into her vagina, then out, then in, with that deep bass voice crooning, Ah, oh, there's my soul, yes, my sweet honey piglet, my piglet, my... The words were cut off as Chris started crawling painfully toward the bed with her face smeared with blood, with her eyes still unfocused, limbs aching past Carl. Then she cringed, shrinking back in incredulous terror as she thought she saw hazily in a swimming fog her daughter's head turning slowly around on a motionless torso, rotation, monstrously, inexorably, until at last it seemed facing backward. <laughs> did, did, did you know what she did, your cunting daughter? Giggled an elfin, familiar voice. Chris blinked at the mad, staring, grinning face, at the cracked, parched lips and fox-like eyes. She screamed until she fainted. She was standing on the key bridge walkway, arms atop the parapet, fidgeting, waiting. She'd reached Mary Jo, told her lies. Reagan's fine. By the way, I've been thinking of another little dinner party. What was the name of that Jesuit psychiatrist again? I thought maybe I'd include him in a... Someone hurrying toward her, khaki pants and blue sweater. Miss McNeil, I'm Father Carruth. She started, reddened, jerked swiftly round, the chipped, rugged face. I should have told you that I wouldn't be in uniform. Sorry. I thought it would be much less conspicuous, he continued. You seemed so concerned about keeping this quiet. I guess I should have been concerned about not making such an ass of myself, she retorted. I just thought you were human, he interjected with a smile. Oh, I knew that when I saw you one day on the campus, she said. That's why I called. You seemed human. Got a cigarette, Father? He reached into the pocket of his shirt, tapped out a camel from the packet. Where are you from, Father Carus? Originally. New York. Me too. Would never go back, though, would you? No, I wouldn't, he forced a smile. But I don't have to make those decisions. God, I'm dumb. You're a priest. You have to go where they send you. That's right. How does Shrink ever get to be a priest, she asked. He was anxious to know what the urgent problem was that she mentioned when she telephoned. Your friend of Father Dyer's, that's right? Yes, I am. Did you talk about the party at your home? Yes. Did you talk about my daughter? No, I didn't know you had one. She's twelve. He didn't mention her. No. At the fringe of his awareness drifted a warning about women with neurotic attractions to priests who desired, unconsciously and under the guise of some other problem, to seduce the unattainable. Outside of confession, she asked him, what if a person like maybe a murderer or something came to you for help? Would you have to turn him in? If he came to me for spiritual help, I would say no, he said, but I tried to persuade him to turn himself in. And how do you go about getting an exorcism? Beg pardon? If a person's possessed by some kind of demon, how do you go about getting an exorcism? Well, first you'd have to put him in a time machine and get him back to the 16th century. She was puzzled. It just doesn't happen anymore, Miss McNeil. Since when? Since we learned about mental illness, about paranoia, split personality, all those things that they taught me at Harvard. Many educated Catholics, Miss McNeil, he told her, don't believe in the devil anymore. And as far as possession is concerned, since the day I joined the Jesuits, I've never met a priest who has ever in his life performed an exorcism. Not one. Are you really a priest? She demanded with disappointed sharpness. Or from central casting? It happens. Father Carus, that someone very close to me is probably possessed. She needs an exorcism. Will you do it? To Carus, it suddenly seemed unreal. Key Bridge. Across the river, the hot shop. Traffic. Chris McNeil, the movie star, the desperate pleading in those haggard eyes. The woman was serious, he realized. Father Callas, it's my daughter, she told him huskily. My daughter. Then all the more reason, he said at last, gently, to forget about exorcism. The ritual of exorcism is dangerously suggestive. 
It could plant the notion of possession, you see, where it didn't exist before, or if it did, it could tend to fortify it. And secondly, Miss McNeil, before the Church approves an exorcism, it conducts an investigation to see if it's warranted. That takes time. Couldn't you do the exorcism yourself? She pleaded. Look, every priest has the power to exorcise, but he has to have church approval, and frankly, it's rarely ever given, so can't you even look at her? Well, as a psychiatrist, yes, I could, but she needs a priest. Chris suddenly cried out, her features contorted with anger and fear. I've taken her to every goddamn fucking doctor psychiatrist in the world, and they sent me to you. Now you send me to them. Jesus Christ, won't somebody help me? The heart-stopping shriek bolted raw above the river. Oh, my God, someone help me! Chris moaned as she crumpled to Karis' chest with convulsive sobs. It's all right, Karis whispered. It's all right. I'll see her. He approached the house with her in silence, with a lingering sense of unreality. Chris slipped the key in the lock and started opening the door, and it was then that Karis felt it. A chill, tugging warning scraped through his bloodstream like particles of ice. For a hesitant moment he stood unmoving, then abruptly he went forward, stepping into the house with an odd sense of ending. Karras heard commotion upstairs. A deep, booming voice was thundering obscenities, threatening in anger, in hate, in frustration. Karras glanced at Chris, who moved on ahead. He followed her upstairs and along the hall to Reagan's bedroom, where Carl leaned against the wall his head sagging low over folded arms. Karras saw bafflement and fright in his eyes. The voice from the bedroom, this close, was so loud that it almost seemed amplified electronically. It wants no straps still, Carl told Chris. I'll be back in a second, Father, Chris told the priest dully. Karras looked quickly back to the door of Reagan's room. The raging voice had been displaced by the long, strident lowing of some animal that might have been a steer. Something prodding at his hand, he looked down. That's her, Chris was saying. That's Reagan. She was giving him a photograph. He took it, young girl, very pretty, a sweet smile. That was taken four months ago, Chris said numbly. Now you go and take a look at her now. She leaned against the wall beside Carl. I'll wait here. As he grasped the doorknob, the sounds from within ceased abruptly. In the ticking silence, Karras hesitated, then entered the room slowly, almost flinching backward at the pungent stench of mouldering excrement that hit him in the face like a palpable blast. Quickly reining back his revulsion, he closed the door. Then his eyes locked, stunned, on the thing that was Reagan on the creature that was lying on its back in the bed, head propped against a pillow, while eyes bulging wide in their hollow sockets, shone with mad cunning and burning intelligence, with interest and with spite as they fixed upon his, as they watched him intently, seething in a face shaped into a skeletal, hideous mask of mind-bending malevolence. Karras shifted his gaze to the tangled, thickly matted hair, to the wasted arms and legs, the distended stomach jutting up so grotesquely, then back to the eyes. They were watching him, pinning him, shifting now to follow as he moved to a desk and chair near the window. Hello, Reagan, said the priest in a warm, friendly tone. He picked up the chair and took it over by the bed. I'm a friend of your mother's. She tells me that you haven't been feeling too well. He sat down. Do you think you'd like to tell me what's wrong? I'd like to help you. The eyes gleamed fiercely, unblinking, and a yellowish saliva dribbled down from a corner of her mouth to her chin. Then her eyes stretched taut into a feral grin, into bow-mouthed mocker. Well, 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 gloated Reagan sardonically, and hairs prickled on the back of Karis's neck. So is you. They said it's you. Well, we've nothing to fear from you at all. Yes, that's right. I'm your friend. I'd like to help, said Karras. You might loosen these straps, then. Reagan croaked. She tugged up her wrists so that now Karras noticed that they were bound with a double set of restraining straps. Are they uncomfortable for you, he asked her. Extremely. They're a nuisance. An infernal nuisance. 
The eyes glinted slyly with secret amusement. Karras saw the scratch marks on her face, the cuts on her lips where apparently she'd bitten them. I'm afraid you might hurt yourself, Raylan. I are not Raylan, she rumbled, still with the hideous grin that now seemed to Karras to be her permanent expression. How incongruous the braces on her teeth looked, he reflected. Oh, I see. Well, then maybe we should introduce ourselves. I'm Damien Karras, said the priest. Who are you? I'm the devil. Ah, good, very good. Karras nodded approvingly. Now we can talk. A little chat, if you like. Very good for the soul. However, you find that I cannot talk freely while bound. Straps. I am accustomed to jesting. As you know, I've spent much of my time in Rome, dear Karas. Now kindly undo the straps. What precocity of language and thought mused Karas. He leaned forward in his chair with professional interest. You say you're the devil, he asked. I assure you. And why don't you just make the straps disappear? That's, That's much, much too vulgar a display of power, Karas. Too crude, after all. I'm prince. <laughs> I must prefer persuasion, Karas, to get in his community involvement. Moreover, if I loosen the straps myself, my friend, I deny you the opportunity of performing a charitable act. But a charitable act, said Karras, is a virtue, and that's what the devil would want to prevent. So, in fact, I'd be helping you now if I didn't undo the straps. Unless, of course, he shrugged, you're really not the devil. And in that case, perhaps, I would undo the straps. How very foxy of you, Karras. If only dear Herod were here to enjoy this. Which Herod? asked Karras with narrowed eyes. Was she punning on Christ's calling Herod, that fox? There were two. Are you talking about the king of Judea? The Tetrarch of Galilee! She blasted him with anger and scorching contempt. Then abruptly she was grinning again, cajoling in that sinister voice. Well, you see all these damnable straps have upset me. Undo them. Undo them, and I'll tell you the future. Very tempting, my forty. But then how do I know that you can read the future? I'm the, the devil. devil. Yes, you say so, but you won't give me proof. You have no faith. Karras stiffened. In what? In me, dear Karras. In me. Something mocking and malicious danced hidden in those eyes. All these proofs, all these signs in the sky. Well, now, something very simple might do, offered Karras. For example, the devil knows everything, correct? No, almost everything, Karras, almost. You see, they keep saying that I'm proud. I'm not. Now, then, what are you up to, Fox? The yellowed bloodshot eyes gleamed craftily. I thought we might test the extent of your knowledge. Ah, oh, yes, the, the largest lake in South America, chaked Reagan, eyes bulging with glee. Is like to see Carca in Peru. Will that do it? No. I'll have to ask something only the devil would know. For example, where is Reagan? Do you know? She is here. Where is here? In the pig. Let me see. Why? Why, to prove that you're telling me the truth. Do you want a fucker? Loose the straps and I will let you go at it. Let me see her. Very succulent cunt. <laughs> Leered Reagan, her furred and lolling tongue licking spittle across cracked lips. But the poor conversation rest, my friend. I strongly advise you to stay with me. Well, it's obvious you don't know where she is, Carter shrugged. So apparently you aren't the devil. I am! 
Reagan bellowed with a sudden jerk forward, her face contorting with rage. Karras shivered as the massive, terrifying voice boomed, crackling off the walls of the room. I am! Well, then, let me see, Reagan, said Karras. That would prove it. I will show you. I will read your mind. Think of a number between one and ten. No, that wouldn't prove a thing. I would have to see Reagan. Abruptly, it chuckled, leaning back against the headboard. <laughs> Nothing would prove anything at all to you, Karen. Oh, splendid. Oh, splendid indeed. In the meantime, we shall try to keep you properly guiled. After all, now, we will not lose you. Who is we? Karras probed with alert, quick interest. We are quite a little group in the big lips. Ah, oh, yes, quite a stunning little multitude. Later, I may see about discreet introductions. In the meantime, I am suffering from imagining it that I cannot reach. Would you loosen one strap for a moment, Karras? No. Just tell me where it itches, and I'll scratch it. Oh, sly, very sly. A little stick thing. <laughs> Show me, Reagan, and perhaps I'll undo one strap, offered Callus. The Reagan identity vanished in a blurringly rapid remoulding of features. Won't you take off these straps? asked a wheedling voice in a clipped British accent. In a flash, the demonic personality returned. Could you help an old, or an old altar boy, father? It croaked, and then threw back its head in laughter. Kara sat stunned felt the glacial hands at the back of his neck again, more palpable now, more firm. The Reagan thing broke off its laughter and fixed him with taunting eyes. Incidentally, your mother is here with us, Carus. Do you wish to leave a message? I will see that you get it. Then Carus was suddenly dodging a projectile stream of vomit leaping out of his chair. It caught a portion of his sweater and one of his hands. His face now colourless. The priest looked down. Reagan cackled with glee. His hand dripped a moment onto the rug. If that's true, the priest said numbly, then you must know my mother's first name. What is it? The Reagan thing hissed at him, made eyes gleaming, head gently undulating like a cobra's. What is it? Reagan lowed like a steer in an angry bellow that pierced the shutters and shivered through the glass of the large bay window. The eyes rolled upward into their sockets. For a time, Karras watched as the bellowing continued. Then he looked at his hand and walked out of the room. Chris pushed herself quickly away from the wall, glancing with distress at the Jesuit's sweater. What happened? Did she vomit? Got a towel? he asked her. There's a bathroom right there, she said, and followed the priest to the bathroom. He unbuttoned the right sleeve of his starched white shirt and rolled it up, exposing a matting of fine brown hairs on a bulging, thickly muscled forearm. Is she taking any nourishment at all? He held his hand beneath the hot water tap to rinse away the vomit. No, father, just sustagen when she's been sleeping. But she ripped out the tubing. Disturbed, Karras soaked and rinsed his hands. She ought to be in a hospital. I just can't, Chris said. I can't have anyone else involved. Do you think she's possessed? Do you? I don't know. I thought you were the expert. How much do you know about possessions? Just a little that I've read. Some things that the doctors told me. What doctors? At Barringer Clinic. Are you Catholic? No. Your daughter? No. What religion? None, but I... Why did you come to me, then? Who advised it? I came because I'm desperate, she blurted excitedly. No one advised me. Look, 
I couldn't care less about your motive, he answered. All I care about is doing what's best for your daughter. But I'll tell you right now that if you're looking for an exorcism as an auto-suggestive shock cure, you're much better off calling central casting, Miss McNeil, because the church won't buy it, and you'll have wasted precious time. Carus clutched at the towel rag to steady his trembling hands. Incidentally, it's Mrs. McNeil, he heard Chris telling him dryly. He gentled his tone. Look, whether it's a demon or a mental disorder, I'll do everything I possibly can to help, but I've got to have the truth. Now, why don't we both get out of this bathroom and go downstairs where we can talk? I could use a cup of coffee. I could use a drink. While Carl and Sharon looked after Reagan, they sat in the study, and Chris related the history of Reagan's illness. What do you think, Father? she asked. Compulsive behavior produced by guilt, perhaps, put together with split personality. Father, I've had all that garbage. Now, how can you say that after all you've just seen? If you've seen as many patients in psychiatric wards as I have, you can say it very easily, he assured her. Possession by demons. All right, let's assume it happens. But your daughter doesn't say she's a demon. She insists she's the devil himself. And that's the same thing as saying you're Napoleon Bonaparte. And explain all those rappings and things. Well, you've heard of poltergeist phenomena, haven't you? Ghosts, uh, throwing dishes and things? Karras nodded. It's not that uncommon and usually happens around an emotionally disturbed adolescent. Extreme inner tension of the mind can sometimes trigger some unknown energy that seems to move objects around at a distance. Call it mind over matter, if you will. Maybe I'm dumb, she retorted, but telling me an unknown gizmo in somebody's head throws dishes at a ceiling tells me nothing at all. I'm telling you, I know that thing upstairs is not my daughter. I know it. I know. Does Reagan have a low-pitched voice, he asked, normally. No. In fact, I'd say it's very light. Would you consider her precocious? Not at all. You know her IQ? About average. And her reading habit? Nancy Drew and comic books, mostly. And her style of speech right now, how much different would you say it is from normal? Completely. She's never used half of those words. No, I mean the style. Would you have a recording of her voice? Yes, there's a tape of her talking to her father. You want it? Yes, I do. And I'll also need her medical records, especially the file from Barringer. And just one other thing, he added. That book that you mentioned with a section on possession. Do you think you can remember now if Reagan ever read it prior to the onset of the illness? She concentrated. I seem to remember her reading something the day before the trouble really started. I'm pretty sure. I'd like to see it. May I have it? I'll get it. She was moving from the study. That tape's in the basement, I think. Be right back. Carus walked slowly to the entry hall and stood motionless in the darkness, staring into nothing as he listened to the grunting of a pig from upstairs, to the yelping of a jackal, to hiccups, to hissing. He turned to see Chris flicking on the light. Are you leaving? She came forward with the book and the tape. I'm afraid I've got a lecture to prepare for tomorrow. I'll try to get by here sometime tomorrow afternoon or evening. If anything urgent develops, you call me, no matter what time. She nodded. He could feel her anxiety pounding like waves on an unknown beach. Sooner or later, I'm going to have to tell one of my superiors what I'm up to, especially if I'm going to be coming here at various unusual hours of the night. Do you have to? She frowned at him. I'll tell him only what I have to. Don't worry, he assured her. It won't get around. Okay, she said weakly. He started outside, but then hung in the doorway for a moment. Did your daughter know a priest was coming over? No, 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 nobody knew but me. Did you know that my mother had died just recently? Yes, I'm very sorry. Is Reagan aware of it? No, not at all. He examined her features. Try to keep away from your daughter. The more you're exposed to her present behavior, the greater the chance of some permanent damage being done to your feelings about her. She looked at him with a trace of a smile. Good night, Father. Thanks. Thanks a lot. 
He studied her for a moment without expression, then quickly moved away. Chris watched from the doorway. She didn't see Kinderman sitting alone in the unmarked car. She closed the door. Damien Carus hurried back to his room with a number of books taken from the shelves of the Georgetown Library. Hysteria. He knew that it had to be hysteria. He went to a shelf for his copy of The Roman Ritual, a compendium of rites and prayers. He turned to the general rules for exorcists, looking for the signs of demonic possession. He started to read. He heard a knock. Damien! Come in. It was dire. What do you need, Joe? Carus asked him. I got a lecture to prepare for tomorrow. Okay. My plan is we go to Chris McNeil with this notion that I've got for a screenplay based on the life of St. Ignatius Loyola. The title is Brave Jesuits Marching, and... Would you get your ass out of here, Joe? prodded Carus. I've got work to do. Uh, is there a tape recorder in the hall? Yes, want me to get it for you, said Dyer. Could you do that? I'm really in a bind. No sweat, great Jesuit witch doctor. Come in. Dyer opened the door and walked out. Carus showered and then dressed in a T-shirt and trousers. The time was 10.58 p.m. He began to read. Freud, McCasland, Satan, Österreich's exhaustive study. And at a little after 4 a.m. he had finished. Reagan had the physical syndrome of possession. About that he had no doubt. The symptoms of possession were substantially constant. Some Reagan had not evidenced as yet. Stigmata, the desire for repugnant foods, the insensitivity to pain, the frequently loud and irrepressible hiccuping, but the others she had manifested clearly. The involuntary motor excitement, foul breath, third tongue, the wasting away of the frame, the distended stomach, the irritations of the skin and mucous membrane, and most significantly present were the basic symptoms of the hard core of cases which Österreich had characterized as genuine possession, a striking change in the voice and in the features, plus the manifestations of a new personality. Callus looked up and stared darkly down the street. Through the branches of trees he could see the house and the large bay window of Reagan's bedroom. When possession was voluntary, as with mediums, the new personality was often benign. But in Reagan, the invading personality was vicious, malevolent, typical of cases of demonic possession, where the new personality sought the destruction of the body of its host and frequently achieved it. Moodily, the Jesuit walked back to his desk. So, okay. She's got the syndrome of demonic possession. Now, how do you cure it? He mused. That depends on what caused it. If Reagan's disorder was hysterical, if the onset of possession was the product of suggestion, then the source of the suggestion could only be the chapter in the book on witchcraft, the chapter on possession. Maybe she read it. But Carus wasn't convinced. What's the answer, then? Genuine possession? A demon? No way. No way. Paranormal happenings? Sure. Why not? Too many competent observers had reported them. He turned to a passage he had underlined in pencil. The exorcist will simply be careful that none of the patient's manifestations are left unaccounted for. He nodded. Okay, then, let's see. Pacing, he ran through the manifestations of Reagan's disorder. The startling change in Reagan's features. The startling change in Reagan's voice. Reagan's suddenly extended vocabulary and knowledge. Reagan's recognition of him as a priest, Reagan's knowledge of the death of his mother, Reagan's precocity of intellect. Abruptly he stopped pacing and hovered by his desk, for it suddenly dawned upon him that Reagan's pun on Herod was even more complicated than at first it had appeared. When the Pharisees told Christ of Herod's threats, he remembered Christ had answered them, Go and tell that fox that I cast out devils. What book had this girl read that had enabled her unconscious mind to simulate the symptoms to such perfection? He glanced at the tape of Reagan's voice. He took the tape to the language lab, found a tape recorder, sat down. He threaded the tape to an empty reel, clamped on earphones, turned on the switch, then leaned forward and listened, exhausted, intense. For a time, only tape hiss. Then the sweet, clear voice of Reagan McNeil. 
Hello, Daddy. This is me. Um, giggling and a whispered aside. I can't tell what to say. <laughs> More giggling. The, um, Daddy, well, you see, I mean, I mean, I hope you can hear me, okay? And, um, um, well, now, let's see. See, first we're in Washington, Daddy, you know? I mean, that's where the president lives. And this house, you know, Daddy, it's... No. Wait now, I'd better start over. See, Daddy, there's... Carus heard the rest only dimly from afar through the roaring of blood in his ears, like the ocean as up through his chest and his face swelled an overwhelming intuition. The thing that I saw in that room wasn't Reagan. He returned to the Jesuit residence hall, found a cubicle, said mass before the rush. As he lifted the host in consecration, it trembled in his fingers with a hope he dared not hope that he fought with every particled fibre of his being. For this is my body, he whispered tremulously. No, bread, this is nothing but bread. He dared not love again and lose. That loss was too great, that pain too keen. After mass, he skipped breakfast, met his class at the Georgetown University Medical School. Daddy, this is me. This is me. But who was me? Carus dismissed the class early and returned to his room. Could it be? Could it possibly, conceivably be? Could the only hope for Reagan be the ritual of exorcism? Must he open up that locker of aches? He could not shake it. He could not leave it untested. He must know. Wait a minute. He paused, staring down. That chapter in the book on witchcraft. Had it mentioned? Y yes, it had. That demons invariably reacted with fury when confronted with the consecrated host, with relics, with holy water. Right, that's it. I'll go up there and sprinkle her with tap water, but tell her it's holy water. Sure, if she reacts the way demons are supposed to react, then I'll know she's not possessed, that the symptoms are suggested, that she got them from the book. But if she doesn't react, it would mean genuine possession, maybe. Feverish, he rummaged for a holy water vial. Willie admitted him to the house. In the entry, he glanced towards Reagan's bedroom. Shouts, obscenities, and yet not in the deep, coarse voice of a demon. Rasping, lighter, a broad British, yes, the manifestation that had fleetingly appeared when he'd last seen Reagan. He moved to the staircase, climbed. Chris was sitting in a chair near Reagan's bedroom, head lowered. I'd like to see her, he said gently. She looked tense, afraid. She glanced furtively at the door of Reagan's bedroom. From within shrieked the hoarse, mad voice, Damn Nazi Nazi can't! Chris looked away. Go ahead. Go ahead. Please get a tape recorder. I need to make comparisons of patterns of speech, he said firmly. Okay, she said weakly. I'll have it sent up. And abruptly she was walking down the hall. For a moment, Carus watched her, puzzled. What was wrong? Then he noticed the sudden silence in the bedroom. It was brief. Now the yelping of diabolic laughter. He moved forward, felt the water vial in his pocket. He opened the door and stepped into the bedroom. The stench was more powerful than the evening before. He closed the door, stared at that horror, that thing on the bed. As he approached, it was watching him with mocking eyes, full of cunning, full of hate, full of power. Hello, Carus. The priest heard the sound of diuretic voiding into plastic pants. He spoke calmly from the foot of the bed. Hello, devil. And how are you feeling? At the moment, very happy to see you. Glad. The tongue lolled out of the mouth while the eyes appraised Karras with insolence. Flying your colours, I see. Very good. Another rumbling. You don't mind a bit of a stink, do you, Karras? 
Not at all. You're a liar. Does that bother you? Mildly. But the devil likes liars. Only good ones, dear Callus. Only good ones. <laughs> it chuckled. Moreover, who said I'm the devil? Didn't you? Oh, I might have. I might. I'm not well. You believe me? Of course. My apologies. Are you saying that you aren't the devil? Just a poor struggling demon, a devil. A subtle distinction, but one not entirely lost upon our father who is in hell. Incidentally, you won't mention my slip of the tongue to him, Karras, now will you? Mm, when you see him? See him? Is he here? asked the priest. In the pig? Not at all. Just a poor little family of wandering souls, my friend. You don't blame us for being here, do you? After all, we have no place to go, no home. And how long are you planning to stay? The head jerked up from the pillow, contorted in rage as it roared, Until the piglet dies! And then, as suddenly, Reagan settled back into a thick-lipped, drooling grin. Incidentally, what an excellent day for an exorcism, Karras. The book. She must have read that in the book. The sardonic eyes were staring piercingly. Do begin it soon. Very soon. Inconsistent. Something off here. You would like that? Intensely. But wouldn't that drive you out of Reagan? The demon put its head back, cackling maniacally, then broke off. It, it will bring us together. You and Reagan? You and us, my good friend. You and us. And from deep in their throat, muffled laughter. Karras stared. At the back of his neck, he felt hands, icy cold, lightly touching, and then gone. Caused by fear, he concluded. Fear. Fear of what? Yes, you will join our little family, Karras. You see, the trouble with signs in the sky, my dear morsel, is that having seen them, one has no excuse. Have you noticed how few miracles one hears about lately? Not our fault, Karras. Don't blame us. We try. Karras jerked around his head at a loud, sudden banging. A bureau drawer had popped open, sliding out its entire length. He felt a quick rising thrill as he watched it abruptly bang shut. There it is. And then, as suddenly, the emotion dropped away like a rotted chunk of bark from a tree. Psychokinesis. Karras heard chuckling. He glanced back at Reagan. How pleasant to chat with you, Karras, said the demon, grinning. I feel free, like a wanton. I spread my great wings. In fact, even my telling you this will serve only to increase your damnation, my doctor, my dear and inglorious physician. You did that? You made the dresser drawer move just now? The demon wasn't listening. It had glanced toward the door, toward the sound of someone rapidly approaching down the hall, and now its features changed. Damned butchering bastards! It shrieked in the hoarse British accented voice. Punting Hun! Through the door came Carl, moving swiftly with the tape recorder, setting it down by the bed, eyes averted, and then quickly retreating from the room. Out, Himmler! Out of my sight! Go and visit your club-footed daughter. Bring her sauerkraut. Sauerkraut and heroin, Thorndike. She will love it. She will... Gone. Carl was gone. And now, abruptly, the thing within Reagan was cordial, watching Karras as the priest quickly set up the tape recorder, looking for an outlet, plugged it in, threaded tape, Oh, yes, hello, hello, hello. What's up? It said happily. Are we going to record something, Padre? Oh, how fun. I, I do love to play act, you know. Oh, immensely. I'm Damien Carus, said the priest as he worked. And who are you? Are you asking for credits now, ducks? Damn cheeky of you, wouldn't you say? <laughs> I was Puck in the junior class play. It glanced round. Where's a drink, incidentally? I'm parched. The priest placed the microphone gently on the nightstand. If you'll tell me your name, I'll try to find one. Yes, of course. <laughs> it responded with a cackle of amusement. And then drink it yourself, I suppose. As he pushed the record button, Karras answered. Tell me your name. Fucking plunderer! It rasped. And then promptly disappeared and was replaced by the demon. Well, what are we doing now, Karras? Recording our discussion? 
Harris straightened and stared. Then he pulled up a chair beside the bed and sat down. Do you mind? He responded. Not at all. I've always rather liked infernal energies. Abruptly, a strong new stench assailed Karras. It was an odor like... Zawart, Karras. Have you noticed? It does smell like sauerkraut, the Jesuit marveled. It seemed to be emanating from the bed, from Reagan's body. Then it was gone, replaced by the putrid stench as before. Karras frowned. Did I image it? Auto-suggestion? He thought of the holy water. Now. No. Save it. Get more of the speech pattern. To whom was I speaking before? He asked. Mary, one one of the family, Karras. A demon? You give too much credit. How so? The word demon means wise one. Ye stupid. The Jesuit grew taut. In what language does demon mean wise one? In Greek. You speak Greek? Very fluently. One of the signs, Carus thought with excitement. Speaking in an unknown tongue, it was more than he'd hoped for. Pos senior kasoti presbyteros eme. He quickly inquired in classical Greek. I am not in the mood, Karras. Oh, then you can... I am not in the mood. Disappointment. Karras brooded. You made the dresser drawer come sliding out, he inquired. Most sorry. Very impressive, Karras nodded. You're certainly a very, very powerful demon. I am. I was wondering if you'd do it again. Yes, in time. Do it now, please. I would really like to see it. In time. Why not now? We must give you some reason for doubt. Some. Just enough to assure the final outcome. It put back its head in a chuckle of malice. Oh, novel. To, to attack, attack through the truth. truth. <laughs> what joy. Icy hands lightly touching at his neck. Karras stared. Why the fear again? Fear. Was it fear? No. Not fear. What was me? Hands gone now. Karras frowned. Felt new wonder. Chipped it down. Telepathic. Or is she? Find out. Find out now. Can you tell me what I'm thinking right now? Your thoughts are too dull to entertain. Then you can't read my mind. You may have it, as you wish. As you wish. Try the holy water now. He heard the squeaking of the tape recorder mechanism. No, just keep digging. Get more of a sampling of the speech. You're a fascinating person. Said Carus. Reagan sneered. Oh no, really? Said Carus. I'd like to know more about your background. You've never told me who you are, for example. A devil, rumbled the demon. Yes, I know, but which devil? What's your name? Oh, now what is the name, Carus? Never mind my name. Call me Audi. You find it more comfortable. Oh yes, Captain Howdy. Harris nodded. Reagan's friend. A very close friend. Oh, really? Indeed. But then why do you torment her? Because I, I am her friend. friend. The, the piglet, piglet likes it. She likes it? She adores it. it. But why? Ask her. Would you allow her to answer? No. Well, then what would be the point in my asking? None. The demon's eyes glinted spite. Who's the person I was speaking to earlier? asked Karras. You asked that. I know, but you never gave an answer. Just, Just another good friend of sweet honey. Big lecture, Karras. May I speak to him? No. He's, He's busy with, with your, your mother. She's fucking his cock to the bristles, Karras, to the root. 
marvelous tongue, your mama, good mouth. It was gleaming at him, mocking, and Karras felt a rage sweeping through him, a tremor of hatred that the priest quickly realized with a start was directed not at Reagan, but at the demon. The demon? What the hell is the matter with you, Karras? The Jesuit gripped calm by its edges, breathed deep, and then stood up and slipped the vial of water from the pocket of his shirt. He uncorked it. The demon looked wary. What is that? Don't you know? asked Karras, his thumb half covering the mouth of the vial, as he started to sprinkle its contents on Reagan. It's holy water, devil. Immediately the demon was cringing, writhing, bellowing in terror and in pain. It burns! It burns! Ah, stop it! Cease, priest master! Cease! Expressionless, Karras stopped sprinkling. Hysteria. Suggestion. She did read the book. He glanced at the tape recorder. Why bother? He noticed the silence. Looked at Reagan. Knit his brows. What's this? What's going on? The demonic personality had vanished. And in its place were other features which were similar, yet different. And the eyes had rolled upward into their sockets, exposing the whites. Now, murmuring, slowly, a feverish gibberish. Karras came around to the side of the bed, leaned over to listen. What is it? Nothing. And yet, it's got cadence like a language. Could it be? He felt the fluttering of wings in his stomach, gripped them hard, held them still. Come on, don't be an idiot. And yet, he glanced to the volume monitor on the tape recorder, not flashing. He turned up the amplification knob and then listened, intent, ear low to Reagan's lips. The gibberish ceased and was replaced by breathing, raspy and... Karras straightened. Who are you? he asked. No one am I. The entity answered, groaning whisper in pain, whites of eyes, lids fluttering. No one am I. The cracked, breathy voice, like the soul of its owner, seemed cloistered in a dark, curtained space beyond time. Is that your name? Karras frowned. The lips moved, fevered syllables, slow, unintelligible, when shortly it ceased. Are you able to understand me? Silence, only breathing, deep, oddly muffled, the eerie sound of sleep in an oxygen tent. Jesuit waited, hoped for more. Nothing came. He rewound the tape, packed the tape recorder into its case, picked it up and took the reel of tape. He gave Reagan a last look. Loose ends. Irresolute, he left the room and went downstairs. He found Chris in the kitchen. She was sitting with Sharon. So what's doing? Chris asked him. There are two personalities. One, I guess I'd seen for just a moment. The one that sounds British. Is that anyone you know? Chris looked up. Burke, ten years. He leaned forward. Was Reagan acquainted with him? Yes. So what did Burke say? Chris asked. Just obscenities, Karras said. Then he lowered his voice. Incidentally, does Carl have a daughter? A daughter? No, not that I know of. Willie was at the sink. Chris turned to her. You don't have a daughter, do you, Willie? She died, madam, long, long before. Oh, I'm sorry. Chris turned back to Karras. It's the first I ever heard of her, she whispered. Why do you ask? How do you know? Reagan, she mentioned it, said Karras. Now, this other personality that I mentioned, that's the one that emerged in hypnosis once. Talks gibberish. Yes. Who is it? I don't know. It's not familiar at all? Not at all. Have you sent for the medical records? They'll be here this afternoon. They're being flown down. Now, what about an exorcism, Father? He looked down and sighed. Well, I, I'm not very hopeful I can sell it to the bishop. He extracted a vial, holding it out to show Chris. See this? I told her it was holy water, Karis explained, and when I started to sprinkle her with it, she reacted very violently. Sir? It's not holy water, Karis explained. It's ordinary tap water. 
So maybe some demons just don't know the difference. You really believe there's a demon inside her? I believe that there's something inside Reagan that's trying to kill her, Father Karras. And whether it knows piss from water doesn't seem to have very much to do with it all, don't you think? What's the difference between holy water and tap water anyway? Holy water is blessed, Karras said heatedly. The church has criteria that have to be met. Here are the signs that the church might accept. One is speaking in a language that the subject has never known before, never studied. I'm working on that one, with the tapes. Then there's clairvoyance, although nowadays telepathy or ESP might nullify that one. And the last one is powers beyond her ability and age. That's a catch-all. Anything occult. Well, now, what about those poundings in the wall? By itself, it means nothing. And the way she was flying up and down off the bed. Not enough. Well, then, what about those things on her skin? What things? It happened at the clinic, Chris explained. There were, well, um, well, she traced a finger on her chest. You know, like writing, just, just letters. They'd show up on her chest, then disappear. Karis frowned. You said, letters, not words. No, no, no words. Just an M, once or twice, then an L. And you saw this, he asked her. Well, no, but they told me. Who told you? The doctors at the clinic. Yes, I'm sure, but again, that's a natural phenomenon, he said. You're a real tough case, Father Karras, do you know that? Look, maybe this will help you to understand, he said. The Church, not me, the Church, once published a statement, a warning to exorcists. I read it last night. And what it said was that most of the people who are thought to be possessed or whom others believe to be possessed, and now I'm quoting, are far more in need of a doctor than of an exorcist. Let me wait and check the records in the clinic. Chris nodded. Could I borrow your car for a while? He asked. You could borrow my life for a while, she moaned. Just get it back by Thursday. When she'd given him the keys, he went across the street to Chris's parked car. Climbing in, he heard Carl calling out. You are going which way, Father Carras? Dupont Circle. Ah, good. You could drop me, please, Father. I go to see a film, a good film. They reached Dupont Circle, where they came to a traffic signal and stopped. I get off here, Father Carras, Carl said. I can catch here the bus. He climbed out. Father, thank you very much. I appreciate. He watched the car until it disappeared around the bend. Then he ran for a bus, boarded, took a transfer, changed buses, rode in silence until finally he debarked at a northeast tenement section of the city, where he walked to a crumbling apartment building and entered. Carl paused at the bottom of the gloomy staircase, smelling acrid aromas from efficiency kitchens. A roach scuttled quickly from a baseboard and across a stair. He clutched at the banister and seemed on the verge of turning back, but then began to climb. Each groaning footfall creaked like a rebuke. On the second floor, he walked to a door. He glanced at the wall. Nicky and Ellen in penciled scrawl, and below it, a date, and a heart whose core was cracking plaster. Carl pushed the buzzer and waited, head down. From within, a squeaking of bed springs, irritable muttering, then a sound that was irregular, the dragging clump of an orthopedic shoe. And as a woman in a slip scowled out through the aperture, a cigarette dangling from her mouth. Oh, it's you, she said huskily. She took off the chain. Carl met the eyes that were shifting hardness, that were haggard wells of pain and blame, glimpsed briefly the dissolute bending of the lips and the ravaged face of a youth and beauty buried alive in a thousand motel rooms, in a thousand awakenings from restless sleep with stifled cry at remembered grace. Come on, tell him to fuck off, a coarse male voice from within the apartment slurred. The girl turned to Carl. You junk pop, you better not come in. Carl nodded. The girl's hollow eyes shifted down to his hand as it reached to a back trouser pocket. How's Mama? she asked him, eyes on the hands that were tipping in the wallet, hands counting out tens. She is fine, he nodded tersely. Your mother is fine. As he handed her the money, she began to cough rackingly. She threw up a hand to her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking sick!
cigarettes. <coughs> she choked out. Carl stared at the puncture scabs on her arm. Thanks, Pop. He felt the money being slipped from his fingers. Jesus, hurry it up! growled the boyfriend from within. Listen, Pop, we better cut this kind of short. Okay? You know, he gets... Elvira, there is a clinic in New York now, he whispered at her pleadingly. She was grimacing, trying to break free from his grip. Oh, come on! I will send you. They help you. You don't go to jail. It is... Jesus, come on, Pop! She screeched, breaking free from his clutch. No, no, please, it is... She slammed the door in his face. From within the apartment came muffled conversation, then a cynical, ringing woman's laugh. It was followed by coughing. Carl turned away and felt a sudden stab of shock as he found the way blocked by Lieutenant Kinderman. Perhaps we could talk now, Mr. Engstrom. Hands in the pockets of his coat, eyes sad. Perhaps we could now have a talk. Kara's threaded tape to an empty reel in the office of the director of the Institute of Languages and Linguists. He started the tape recorder and they listened to the fevered voice croaking in gibberish. The director pulled off his glasses. It isn't any language that I've ever heard. However, it does have the cadence of speech. Karras felt a quickening of hope. Yes, that's what I thought, he agreed. But I certainly don't recognize it, Father. Is it ancient or modern? What do you know? No, I don't. Well, why not leave it with me, Father? I'll check it with some of the boys. Could you make a copy of it, Frank? I'd like to keep the original myself. Oh, yes, surely. Karras returned to the Jesuit residence hall with the originals. He found the records from the clinic had arrived and was soon convinced that his trip to the Institute had been wasted. He walked back to the McNeil house. Willie admitted him and led him to the study. Chris was standing with her back to him, brow in her hand, an elbow on the bar. Her hand was obscuring her face. The hand trembled. What's doing? she asked him. My honest opinion right now is that Reagan can best be helped by intensive psychiatric care. She shook her head very slowly back and forth. Where's her father? he asked her. In Europe, she whispered. Have you told him what's happening? No, she answered. Well, I think it would help if he were here. I've asked you to drive a demon out, God damn it! not ask another one in! She cried in sudden hysteria. What happened to the exorcism all of a sudden? She killed Burke Dennings, Chris shrieked at him. She killed him, and they'll put her away. They're going to put her away. Oh, my God, oh, my God. Harris caught her up as she crumpled, sobbing. It's all right. He eased her down and stretched her out on the sofa. Soon the crying subsided and he helped her sit up. Harris was in turmoil. Now the weight was on his back again, heavy and oppressive. He said, You don't know that she did it. She told me that she did it, Chris intoned. He had another thought. You think Dennings brought the book upstairs, or was it there? I think it was already there, Chris answered. Chris, where's this Dr. Klein? In Roslyn, in the medical building, yes. Please call him and tell him Dr. Karras would be by, and that I'd like to take a look at Reagan's EEG. I'll be back to you later. Sure. Ciao, Father. Ciao. In Chris's car, he drove toward Roslyn. As he waited on M Street for the light, he glanced right and saw Carl getting out of a black sedan on 35th Street in front of the Dixie Liquor Store. The driver of the car was Lieutenant Kinderman. The light changed. Karras shot forward. Had they seen him? He didn't think so. But what were they doing together? At the medical building, a nurse handed Karras the EEG. Klein hurried in. Dr. Karras? Yes. How do you do? They shook hands. Karras looked back to the graph, and Klein scanned it with him. You see, it's very regular. No fluctuations whatsoever. Yes, I see, Karras frowned. Very curious. Curious? Presuming that we're dealing with hysteria. Karras glanced at him. She was certainly disordered when you ran this graph, is that right? Yes, she was. Yes, I'd say so. Well, then, isn't it curious that she tested so perfectly? A nurse interrupted. Yes, I'm coming, sighed Klein. Sorry, got to run. 
Karras went back to his study of the graph, finished, then returned it to the nurse in reception. It was something he could use with the bishop as an argument that Reagan was not a hysteric and therefore conceivably was possessed. And yet the EEG had posed still another mystery. Why no fluctuations? Why none at all? He drove back toward Chris's house, found a space and parked. He stood motionless for a while on the sidewalk. Could Reagan have murdered Burke Denning so horribly? He looked up at Reagan's window. What in God's name is in that house? And how much longer before Kinderman demanded to see Reagan, had a chance to see the Dennings' personality, to hear it? How much longer before Reagan would be institutionalized or die? He had to build a case for the Chancery. He walked to Chris's house. He rang the doorbell. Willie let him in. Mrs. Taking Little Nap Now, she said. He walked by her and up to Reagan's bedroom. He entered and saw Carl in a chair by the window, his arms folded, watching Reagan. Karras walked up beside the bed and looked down. The whites of the eyes, like milky fog, the murmurings, spells from another world. Karras began to unfasten one of Reagan's restraining straps. Father, no! Carl vigorously yanked back the priest's arm. Very bad, Father. Strong. It is strong. Leave on straps. Now he knew that in strength was not theory, it was a fact. She could have done it, could have twisted Denning's neck around. If Mechter's yet was stronger than any struggle. With a stab of discovery and hot surging hope, Karras jerked around his head and looked down at the bed. The demon grinned mockingly at Carl. German. It had asked if Carl's daughter liked to dance. Carl, you better step outside, Karras advised him. No, I stay. You will go, please, the Jesuit said firmly. Carl gave way and hurried from the room. The laughter had stopped. Karras turned back. The demon was watching him. It looked pleased. Back. I'm surprised. I would think that the embarrassment over the holy water might have discouraged you from a great time. But when I forget, that a priest has no shame. Carus forced himself to think clearly. He knew that the language test in possession required intelligent conversation as proof that whatever was said was not traceable to buried linguistic recollection. Sprechen Sie Deutsch? asked Karras warily. War games? <laughs> Sprechen Sie Deutsch? Not Mirabili dictu. The Jesuit's heart leaped up, not only German, at him and in context. Quod nomen michi est? he asked. What is my name? Carus. And now the priest rushed on with excitement. Ubi sum. Where am I? In a room. Et ubi est cubiculum. And where is the room? In domo. In a house. Ubi est Burke Dennings. Where is Burke Dennings? Mortuous. He is dead. Commodo Mortuous Est, how did he die? Inventus Est Capite Reverso. He was found with his head turned around. Quis Occidit Eum. Who killed him? Raven. Quomodo ea occidit illum. Die mihi exacte. How did she kill him? Tell me in detail. Ah, oh, well, sufficient excitement for a moment. Sufficient altogether. Though, of course, it will occur to you, I suppose, that while you were asking your question Latin, you were mentally formulating answers. <laughs> All unconscious, of course. Yes, whatever would we 
go without unconscious. I cannot be glad in it all. I read your mind. I merely plucked the responses from your head. Karras felt an instant dismay as his certainty crumbled. Yes, I knew all that would occur to you, Karras. That's why I'm fond of you. That is why I cherish all reasonable men. The Jesuit's mind raced rapidly. Question that you don't know the answer to. He could check the answer later to see if it was correct. He waited for the laughter to ebb before he spoke. Quam profundus est imus oceanus indicus. What is the depth of the Indian Ocean at its deepest point? La plim de martons. Responde latine. Bonjour. Bon Quam! Carlos broke off as the eyes rolled upward into their sockets and the gibberish entity appeared. Carlos demanded, Let me speak to the demon again. No answer. Quis es tu? He snapped. A hiccup. Breathing. A hiccup. Breathing. Let me speak to Burke Dennings. The hiccuping, regular and wrenching, continued. Carlos shook his head. Then he walked to a chair and sat on its edge. Time passed. He looked over at Reagan. No hiccuping. Silent. Sleeping? He walked over to the bed and looked down. Eyes closed. Heavy breathing. He felt her pulse, then examined her lips. They were parched. At last, he left the room. He went down to the kitchen in search of Sharon. Karras found her. You're her tutor? Yes, that's right. Have you taught her any Latin? No, I haven't. Any German? Only French. What level? La plume de ma tante? Pretty much. But no German or Latin? Oh, no. But the Engstroms, don't they sometimes speak German? Oh, sure. Around Reagan? She shrugged. I'm pretty sure. Have you ever studied Latin? No, I haven't. But you recognize the general sound? Oh, I'm sure. Has she ever spoken Latin in your presence? No, never. Any language at all? Well... I might have imagined it. I, I could have sworn I heard her talking in Russian. Karras stared. Do you speak it, he asked, throat dry. She shrugged. Oh, well, so-so. I just studied it in college, that's all. Karras sagged. She did pick the Latin from my brain. He looked blearily at Sharon. I'm going over to the residence, he told her. As soon as Reagan's awake... I'd like a call. Here, sir, I'll call you. He crossed to the residence and saw a message slip on the floor. He picked it up from Frank, the tapes. Home number. Please call. He picked up a telephone. What's the story, Frank? What have you found? The two different voices on the tapes are probably separate personalities. Probably. Well, I wouldn't want to swear to it in court. In fact, I'd have to say the variance is really pretty minimal. Minimal. Karras repeated. And what about the gibberish? Is it a language or not? Oh, I'd say it was a language, all right. Karras stiffened. What's the language? he asked. English? For a moment, Karras was mute. Frank, we seem to have a very poor connection, or would you like to let me in on the joke? Put your tape on the machine and play it backward, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. Good night, Father. Night, Frank. He played the tape in reverse. He heard his voice speaking backward. Then Reagan, or someone, in English. Marin, Marin, Karas, be us, let us. English, senseless, but English. He listened to it all, then rewound and played the tape through again and again, and then realized that the order of speech was inverted. He made a transcription on a sheet of paper, reversing the order of the words. Then he leaned back and read it. Danger. 
not yet, will die. Little time. Let her die. No, no, sweet. It is sweet in the body. I feel. Better than the void. I fear the priest. Give us time. Fear the priest. He is. No, not this one. The one who indecipherable. He is ill. Ah, the blood. Feel the blood. How it sings? Here Karas asked, Who are you? With the answer, I am no one. I am no one. Then Karas, is that your name? And then, I have no name. I am no one. Many. Let us be, let us warm in the body. Do not, indecipherable, from the body into void, into indecipherable. Leave us, leave us, let us be, Karas. Marin, Marin. Again and again he read it over, haunted by its tone, by the feeling that more than one person was speaking, until finally repetition itself dulled the words into commonness. Not an unknown language. And writing backward with facility was hardly paranormal or even unusual, but speaking backward, adjusting, altering the phonetics so that playing them backward would make them intelligible, wasn't such performance beyond the reach of even a hyper-stimulated intellect? He drifted into motionless, dark granite sleep. The ringing of a telephone awakened him. He reached for the telephone, answered, Sharon. Would he come to the house right away? He splashed cold water on his face and went out into the street. Sharon met him at the door. Sorry, father, she whispered as he entered, but I thought you ought to see this. He followed her up the stairs to Reagan's bedroom. Entering, the Jesuit felt chilled to the bone. The room was icy. He frowned at Sharon and she nodded at him. Yes, the heat's on, she whispered. Reagan seemed to be in a coma, heavy breathing, motionless. The nasogastric tube was in place, the sustagen seeping slowly into her body. Beads of perspiration on Reagan's forehead, her hands gripped firmly in the restraining straps. Sharon was bending, gently pulling the top of Reagan's pajamas wide apart, and an overwhelming pity hit Karas at the sight of the wasted chest, the protruding ribs, where one might count the remaining weeks or days of her life. He felt Sharon's haunted eyes upon him. She whispered, Just keep looking at her chest. His brows knitted tightly as he saw something happening to the skin. A faint redness, but in sharp definition, like handwriting. He peered down closer. There, it's coming, whispered Sharon. Abruptly, the goose flesh on Karis's arm was not from the icy cold in the room, was from what he was seeing on Reagan's chest, was from bar-relief script rising up in clear letters of blood-red skin, two words, help me. That's her handwriting, whispered Sharon. At nine o'clock that morning, Damien Karras came to the president of Georgetown University and asked for permission to seek an exorcism. He received it, and immediately afterward went to the bishop of the diocese. You're convinced that it's genuine? the bishop asked. I've made a prudent judgment that it meets the conditions set forth in the ritual, answered Karras. You would want to do the exorcism yourself? asked the bishop. Yes, of course, answered Karras. Have you ever been involved with this sort of thing before? No, I haven't. Well, it might be best to have a man with experience. There aren't too many, of course, but let me see who's around. I'll call you as soon as we know. When Karras had left him, the bishop called the president of Georgetown University. And what about the exorcist? Any ideas? I'm blank. Well, now, Lancaster Merrin's around. He was working on a dig around Nineveh, but he came back around three months ago. He's at Woodstock, working on another book. Don't you think he's too old, though? 
How's his health? Well, it must be all right, or he wouldn't still be running around digging up tombs. Besides, he's had experience. When was that? Oh, maybe ten or twelve years ago, I think, in Africa. Supposedly, the exorcism lasted for months. I heard it damn near killed him. Well, in that case, I doubt that he'd want to do another one. We do what we're told here. All the rebels are over with you seculars. Well, what do you think? Look, I'll leave it up to you and the provincial. Early that silently waiting evening, a young scholastic, preparing for the priesthood, wandered the ground of Woodstock Seminary in Maryland. He found him on a pathway, strolling through a grove. He handed him a telegram. The old man thanked him, serene, eyes kindly, then turned and renewed his contemplation, continued his walk through a nature that he loved. Now and then he would pause to hear the song of a robin, to watch a bright butterfly hover on a branch. He did not open and read the telegram. He knew what it said. He had known. He had read it in the dust of the temples of Nineveh. He was ready. He continued his farewells. In the breathing dark of his quiet office, Kinderman brooded above his desk. Below him were records, transcripts, exhibits, police files, crime lab reports, scribbled notes. In a pensive mood, he had carefully fashioned them into a collage in the shape of a rose, as if to belie the ugly conclusion to which they had led him, that he could not accept. Angstrom was innocent. At the time of Denning's death, he had been visiting his daughter, supplying her with money for the purchase of drugs. He had lied about his whereabouts that night in order to protect her and to shield her mother, who believed Elvira to be dead and past all harm and degradation. It was only when Kinderman apprised the daughter of her father's involvement in the Dennings case that Elvira volunteered the truth. Angstrom was innocent. What remained? Item. The death of Director Burke Denning seemed somehow linked to the desecrations at Holy Trinity. Both involved witchcraft, and the unknown desecrator could easily be Denning's murderer. Item. The typewritten sheet of paper containing the text of the blasphemous altar card discovered at Holy Trinity had been checked for latent fingerprints. Impressions had been found on both sides. Some had been made by Damien Carus, but still another set had been found that, from their size, were adjudged to be those of a person with very small hands, quite possibly a child. Item. The typing on the altar card had been analysed and compared with the typed impressions on the unfinished letter that Sharon Spencer had pulled from her typewriter, crumpled up and tossed at a waste paper basket while Kinderman had been questioning Chris. He had picked it up and smuggled it out of the house. The typing on this letter and the typing on the altar card sheet had been done on the same machine. According to the report, however, the person who had typed the blasphemous text had a touch far heavier than Sharon Spencer's. Item. Burke Dennings, if his death was not an accident, had been killed by a person of extraordinary strength. Item. Engstrom was no longer a suspect. Item. A check of domestic airline reservations disclosed that Chris McNeil had taken her daughter to Dayton, Ohio. Kinderman had known that the daughter was ill and was being taken to a clinic, but the clinic in Dayton would have to be Barringer. Kinderman had checked, and the clinic confirmed that the daughter had been in for observation. Though the clinic refused to state the nature of the illness, it was obviously a serious mental disorder. Item. Serious mental disorders at times cause extraordinary strength. Kinderman went down to the garage, got into the unmarked black sedan, and drove to the Georgetown area where he parked and sat. Sat, staring at Reagan's window. Should he knock at the door and demand to see her? He rubbed at his brow. William, F. Kinderman, you are sick. You are ill. Go home. Take medicine. Sleep. A cab pulled up to the house. He started the engine and turned on the windshield wipers. From the cab stepped a tall old man. He paid the driver, turned, and stood motionless, staring at the house. The cab pulled away, and Kinderman quickly pulled out to follow. The detective blinked his lights at the taxi. Inside, at that moment... Carus and Carl pinned Reagan's arms while Sharon injected her with Librium, bringing the total amount injected in the last two hours to 400 milligrams. Carus would assist the exorcist Lancaster Merrin, the Chancery Office told him. The news had stunned him. Merrin, the philosopher, 
the soaring, staggering intellect. His books had stirred ferment in the church, for they interpreted his faith in the terms of science, in terms of a matter that was still evolving, destined to be spirit and joined to God. Karras had telephoned Chris at once to convey the news and told her not to expect too much. He knew that an exorcism often took weeks, even months, knew that frequently it failed altogether. He himself had been the natural choice for exorcist, yet the bishop had passed him over. Why? Because Merrin had done this before. He recalled that exorcists were selected on the basis of piety and high moral qualities that a passage in the Gospel of Matthew related that Christ, when asked by his disciples the cause of their failure in an effort at exorcism, had answered them, because of your little faith. The provincial had known about his problem. So had the president, Caris reflected. Had either told the bishop? He felt somehow unworthy, incompetent, rejected. It stung unreasonably. It stung. He held Reagan while Sharon administered the Librium injection that now brought the total dosage up to 500 milligrams. He went down to the kitchen where he found Chris sitting alone at the table. She was pouring brandy into her coffee. The shouts above finally ceased. I guess the Librium took hold, he said gratefully. Chiming of the doorbell. Chris got up abruptly and went to the living room. She parted a curtain and peered furtively through the window at her caller. Thank God, not Kinderman. She was looking instead at a tall old man in a threadbare raincoat, his head bowed patiently in the rain. He carried a worn, old-fashioned valise. Chris walked to the entry hall. She opened the door. The man's hat brim obscured his face. Mrs. McNeil came a voice from the shadows. It was gentle, refined, yet as full as a harvest. Suddenly she was looking into eyes that overwhelmed her, that shone with intelligence and kindly understanding, with serenity that poured from them into her being like the waters of a warm and healing river whose source was both in him yet somehow beyond him, whose flow was contained and yet headlong and endless. I'm Father Merrin. She saw him standing with his head angled sideways, glancing upward as if he were listening. No, more like feeling, she thought, for some presence out of sight, some distant vibration that was known and familiar. Is Father Karras here? he asked. Yes, he is. He's in the kitchen. Have you had any dinner, Father? He flicked his glance upward at the sound of a door being opened. Yes, I had some on the train. We've put a bed in the study for you, Father. Chris was fidgeting. I'll, I'll, I'll show you where it is. Or, or would you like to say hello to Father Karras? I should like to see your daughter first, said Merrin. She looked puzzled. Right now, you mean, Father? He glanced upward again with that distant attentiveness. Yes, now, I think, now. Gee, I'm sure she's asleep. I think not. Suddenly, Chris flinched at a sound from above, at the voice of the demon, booming and yet muffled, croaking like amplified premature burial. Merrin! Then the massive and shiveringly hollow jolt of a single blow against the bedroom wall. God almighty! Chris breathed as she clutched a pail against her chest. The priest hadn't moved. He was still staring upward, intense and yet serene, and in his eyes there was not even a hint of surprise. It was more, Chris thought, like recognition. Another blow shook the walls. <laughs> the Jesuit moved slowly forward, oblivious of Chris, of Carl, stepping from the study, of Carus, emerging bewildered from the kitchen while the nightmarish poundings and croakings continued. He went calmly up the staircase, slender hand like alabaster sliding upward on the banister. Merrin entered Reagan's bedroom and closed the door behind him. For a time, there was silence. Then abruptly the demon laughed hideously, and Merrin came out. He closed the door and started down the hall. The Jesuit descended the staircase rapidly and put out his hand to the waiting Karras. Father Karras. Father. 
Merrin had clasped the other priest's hand in both of his. He was squeezing it, searching Karis's face with a look of gravity and concern, while upstairs the laughter turned to vicious obscenities directed at Merrin. You look terribly tired, he said. Are you tired? Not at all. Why do you ask? I should like you to go to the residence, Damien, and gather up a cassock for myself, two surplices, a purple stole, some holy water, and two copies of the Roman ritual. I believe we should begin. Carus frowned. You mean now, right away? Yes, I think so. Karis stepped out into the rainy night. Merrin glanced back to Chris. You don't mind if we begin right away? He asked softly. She'd been watching him, glowing with relief at the feeling of decision and direction and command, rushing in like a shout in sunlit day. No, oh, I'm glad, she said gratefully. You must be tired, though, Father. Would you like a cup of coffee? Yes, I would, he said warmly. Thank you. Something heavy had been gently brushed aside, told to wait. If you're sure, it's no trouble. She led him to the kitchen, and soon he was leaning against the stove, a mug of black coffee in his hand. Want some brandy in it, Father? Well, the doctors say I shouldn't, he said, and then he held out the mug. But, thank God, my will is weak. For minutes, she and Merrin spoke of homely things, little things. Finally, Sharon appeared, and only then did Merrin move to leave. He put his hand on Chris's shoulder and squeezed it reassuringly. Chris felt a power and warmth flowing into her. Peace. She felt peace. And an odd sense of safety, she wondered. You're very kind. His eyes smiled. Thank you. He removed his hand and watched her walk away. As soon as she was gone... A tightening pain seemed to clutch at his face. He entered the study and closed the door. From a pocket of his trousers, he slipped out a tin, opened it, extracted a nitroglycerine pill, and placed it carefully under his tongue. Chris entered the kitchen. What happened, Sharon? she asked. When Father Marion walked in upstairs. Sharon shifted her far away gaze to a point in space between doubt and remembrance. Strange. They only... she paused. Well, they only just stared at each other for a while, and then Reagan, that thing, it said, This time you're going to lose. Sharon had angled her head up as if she were listening. Chris glanced upward and heard it too, the silence, the sudden cessation of the raging of the demon, yet something more, something and growing. You feel it too? asked Sharon. Chris nodded. The house, something in the house, a tension, a gradual thickening of the air, a pulsing like energy slowly building up. The lilting of the door chimes sounded unreal. Sharon opened the door. It was Karras carrying a cardboard laundry box. Father Merrin's in the study, she told him. Karras moved quickly to the study and entered with the box. Merrin, in trousers and T-shirt, kneeled in prayer beside the rented bed, his forehead bent low to his tight-clasped hands. Karras stood rooted for a moment, as if he had suddenly encountered his boyhood self with an altar boy's cassock draped over an arm. He moved to the sofa and soundlessly laid out the contents of the box. As he glanced toward Merrin, he saw the priest blessing himself, and he hastily looked away, reaching down for the larger of the white cotton surplices. He began to put it on over his cassock. He heard Merrin rising, and then... Thank you, Damien. Karis reached for a sweater. I thought you might wear this under your cassock, Father. The room gets cold at times. Merrin touched the sweater lightly with his hands. That was thoughtful of you, Damien. Karras picked up Merrin's cassock from the sofa and watched him pull the sweater down over his head, and only now, and very suddenly, while watching this homely prosaic action, did Karras feel the staggering impact of the man, of the moment of a stillness in the house, crushing down on him, choking off breath. 
You're familiar with the rules concerning exorcism, Damien? Yes, I am, answered Karras. Especially important is the warning to avoid conversations with the demon. The demon? He'd said it so matter-of-factly, thought Karras. We may ask what is relevant, said Merrin, but anything beyond that is dangerous, extremely, especially do not listen to anything he says. The demon is a liar. He will lie to confuse us, but he will also mix lies with the truth to attack us. The attack is psychological, Damien, and powerful. Do not listen. Remember that? Do not listen. The exorcist added, Is there anything at all you would like to ask now, Damien? Carus shook his head. No, but I think it might be helpful if I gave you some background on the different personalities that Reagan has manifested. So far, there seem to be three there is only one, said Merrin softly. A haunted expression came into his eyes. Then he reached for the copies of the Roman ritual and gave one to Carus. We will skip the litany of the saints. You have the holy water. Carus slipped the slender cork-tipped vial from his pocket. Merrin took it, then nodded serenely toward the door. If you will lead, please, Damien. Upstairs, Karras opened the door and almost reeled back from the blast of stench and icy cold. In a corner of the room, Carl sat huddled in a chair. The Jesuit quickly flicked his glance to the demon in the bed. Its gleaming eyes stared beyond him to the hall. They were fixed on Merrin. Karras moved forward to the foot of the bed, while Merrin walked slowly, tall and erect, to the side. There he stopped and looked down into hate. A mothering stillness hung over the room. Then Reagan licked a wolfish blackened tongue across her cracked and swollen lips. Well, proud scum, at last, at last you come. The old priest lifted his hand and traced the sign of the cross above the bed and then repeated the gesture toward all in the room. Turning back, he plucked the cap from the vial of holy water. Ah, oh, yes, the, the holy, holy urine, urine. no, <laughs> the, the semen of the saints. Merrin lifted up the vial and the face of the demon grew livid, contorted. Ah, oh, will you? Will you, you bastard? bastard? Will, Will you? you? Merrin started sprinkling. The demon jerked its head up, the mouth and the neck muscles trembling with rage. Yes, sprinkles, sprinkle, 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 Merrin, drench us. Drown us in your sweat, your sweat is sanctified, saint, Merrin. Bend and fart out. Oh, oh, of of bend, bend and show the holy rot that we may worship it and adore it. Kiss it, lick it, blast. be silent. The words flung forth like bolts. Karras flinched in wonder at Merin, who stared commandingly at Reagan, and the demon was silent was returning his stare, but the eyes were now hesitant, blinking, wary. Merrin kneeled down beside the bed and closed his eyes in murmured prayer. Our father, he began. Reagan spat and hit Merrin in the face with a yellowish glob of mucus. It oozed slowly down the exorcist's cheek. Thy kingdom come. Merrin continued the prayer without a pause, while his hand plucked a handkerchief out of his pocket and unhurriedly wiped away the spittle. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, responded Karras. He felt something in the room, congealing. He returned to his text to follow Merrin's prayer. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, I appeal to your holy name, humbly begging your kindness, that you may graciously grant me help against this unclean spirit, now tormenting this creature of yours, through Christ our Lord. Amen, responded Karras. 
Now Merrin stood up. God and defender of the human race, look down in pity on this, your servant, Reagan, Teresa, McNeil, now trapped in the coils of man's ancient enemy, sworn foe of our race, who... Karras glanced up as he heard Reagan hissing, saw her sitting erect with the whites of her eyes exposed, while her tongue flicked in and out rapidly, head weaving slowly back and forth like a cobra's. He looked back at his text. Save your servant, prayed Merrin, reading from the ritual. Who trusts in you, my God, answered Karras. Let her find in you, Lord, a fortified tower in the face of the enemy. As Menin continued with the next line, Karras heard a gasp from Sharon behind him. Puzzled, he looked back and was instantly electrified. The front of the bed was rising up off the floor. He stared at it incredulously, four inches, half a foot, a foot. Then the back legs began to come up level with the front. It's not happening, he thought, as he watched transfixed. The bed drifted upward another foot and then hovered there, bobbing and listing gently as if it were floating on a stagnant lake. Reagan, undulating, hissing. Father Karras. The exorcist motioned his head. The response, please, Damien. Karras looked blank and uncomprehending. Sharon ran from the room. Let the enemy have no power over her, Merrin repeated gently. Hastily, Karras glanced back at the text and with a pounding heart breathed out the response. And the son of iniquity be powerless to harm her. Lord, hear my prayer and let my cry come unto thee. The Lord be with you and with your spirit. Merrin embarked upon a lengthy prayer, and Karras again returned his gaze to the bed, to his hopes of his God, and the supernatural hovering low in the empty air. An elation thrilled up through his being. It's there. There it is, right in front of me. There. Almighty Father, everlasting God, the exorcist reached up his hand in a workday manner and traced the sign of the cross unhurriedly three times on Reagan's brow while continuing to read from the text of the ritual. Who sent your only begotten son into the world to crush that roaring lion? The hissing ceased, and from the taut stretched O of Reagan's mouth came the nerve-shredding lowing of a steer. Snatch from ruination and from the clutches of the noonday devil, this human being made in your image, and the lowing grew louder, tearing at flesh and shivering through bone. God and Lord of all creation! Merrin routinely reached up his hand and pressed a portion of the stole to Reagan's neck while continuing to pray. By whose might Satan was made to fall from heaven like lightning, strike Terror into the beast, now laying waste your vineyard. The bellowing ceased, a ringing silence. Then a thick and putrid greenish vomit began to pump from Reagan's mouth in slow and regular spurts that oozed like lava over her lip and flowed in waves onto Merrin's hand, but he did not move it. Let your mighty hand cast out this cruel demon from Reagan to Razor McNeil. The bed began to rock lazily, then to pitch, and then suddenly it was violently dipping and yawing, and with the vomit still pumping from Reagan's mouth, Merrin calmly made adjustments and kept the stole firmly to her neck. Fill your servants with courage to manfully oppose that reprobate dragon, lest he despise those who put their trust in you, and abruptly the movements subsided. And as Karras watched, mesmerized, the bed drifted feather-like slowly to the floor and settled on the rug with a cushioned thud. Lord, grant that this... Numb, Karras shifted his gaze. Merrin's hand. He could not see it. It was buried under mounded, steaming vomit. Lord, hear my prayer, said the exorcist gently. Slowly... Karras turned to the bed, and let my cry come unto thee. 
Merrin lifted off the stole, took a slight step backward, and then jolted the room with a lash of his voice as he commanded, I cast you out, unclean spirit, along with every satanic power of the enemy, every spectre from hell, every savage companion. Merrin's hand at his side dripped vomit to the rug. It is Christ who commands you, who once stilled the wind and the sea and the storm, who... Regan stopped vomiting, sat silent, unmoving. The whites of her eyes gleamed balefully at Merrin. He moved to the side of the bed, reached down to grasp Regan's wrist, and found what he'd feared. The pulse was racing at an unbelievable speed. It is he who commands you, he who flung you headlong from the heights of heaven. Merrin's powerful adjuration pounded off the rim of Karras's consciousness in resident inexorable blows as the pulse came faster now and faster. Karras looked at Reagan, still silent, unmoving. Into icy air, thin mists of vapor wafted from the vomit like a reeking offering. Karras felt uneasy. Then the hair on his arms began prickling up. With nightmare slowness, a fraction at a time, Reagan's head was turning, swiveling like a mannequin, creaking with the sound of some rusted mechanism until the dread and glaring whites of those ghastly eyes were fixed on his. And therefore, tremble in fear now, Satan! The head turned slowly back toward Merrin. You corrupter of justice! You begetter of death! You betrayer of the nations! You robber of life! You... The lights in the room began flickering, dimming, and then faded to an eerie, pulsing amber. He shivered. It was colder. The room was getting colder. You prince of murderers! You inventor of every obscenity! You enemy of the human race! You... A muffled pounding jolted the room, then another then steadily shuddering through walls, through the floor, through the ceiling, splintering, throbbing at a ponderous rate like the beating of a heart that was massive and diseased. Depart, you monster! Your place is in solitude! Your abode is in the nest of vipers! Get down and crawl with them! It is God himself who commands you! The blood of... The poundings grew louder, began to come ominously faster and faster. I adjure you, ancient serpent, and faster, by the judge of the living and the dead, by your creator, by the creator of all the universe, to... Reagan's pulse hammered at a speed too rapid to gauge. Merrin reached out calmly and with the end of his thumb traced the sign of the cross on Reagan's vomit-covered chest. As Merrin prayed... The nightmarish poundings abruptly ceased. O oh God of heaven and earth, God of the angels and archangels, Merrin praying as the pulse kept dropping, dropping. Prideful bastard, Merrin. Come, you will lose. She will die, the pig will die. The flickering haze grew gradually brighter. The demonic entity had returned, enraged at Merrin. Profligate peacock, ancient heretic, I adjure you, turn and look on me. Now look on me, you scum. The demon jerked forward and spat in Merrin's face and then croaked at him. Thus does your master cure the blind. God and Lord of all creation, prayed Merrin, reaching placidly for his handkerchief and wiping away the spittle. Now follow his teaching, Merrin. Do it! Put your sanctified cock in the piglet's mouth and cleanse it. Swab it with the wrinkled relic, and she will be cured. Saint Merrin, a miracle. Deliver this servant of hypocrite! You gurgle it all for the pig you, you can. Laughing, you will make a, a contest between us. I humbly fly, lying bastard. Tell us where is your humility.
Timberin, and the desert, in the ruins, in the tombs, where you fled to escape your fellow man, to escape from your inferiors, from the halt and the lame of mind. Do you speak to men, you pious vomit? Deliver your abode is in the quest of baby fox, Merrill. Your place is within yourself. Go back to the mountain top and speak to your only equal. Merrin continued with the prayers, unheeding as the torrent of abuse raged on. Do you hunger, Saint Merrin? Here, I give to you nectar and ambrosia. I give to you the food of your god, croaked the demon. It excreted diuretically, mocking, for this is my no, no, consecrate that saint, Merrin. Repelled, Carus focused his attention on the text as Merrin read a passage from St. Luke. My name is Legion, answered the man, for many demons had entered into him, and they begged Jesus not to demand them to depart into the abyss. Now a herd of swine was there, feeding on the mountainside, and the demons kept entreating Jesus to let them enter into them, and he gave them leave. And the demons came out from the man and entered into the swine, and the herd rushed down the cliff and into the lake and were drowned. And... Really? I prick you, you caught you, who's croaked the demon. Carus saw Willie near the door. I bring you tidings of redemption. A is alive. She lives. She is a drug addict. A hope Willie, do not listen, cried Carl. So I tell you where she lives. Do not listen, do not listen. Carl was rushing Willie out of the room. Go and visit her on Mother's Day, Willie. Surprise her. Go and... Abruptly, the demon broke off and fixed its eyes on Carus as he moved to Sharon to instruct her to prepare another injection. Do you want her? She is yours. Yes, the stable hall is yours. You may ride her as you wish. Why? She you fantasizes lightly concerning you, Carlos. She masturbates, dreaming of you all great priest. Sharon crimsoned and kept her eyes averted as Carlos gave instructions for the Librium. Sharon nodded. As she walked by the bed, Reagan croaked at her. What? Then jerked up and hit her face with a flung bolt of vomit. And while Sharon stood paralyzed and dripping, the Dennings personality appeared rasping. Stable whore! Cut! Sharon bolted from the room. The Dennings personality now grimaced with distaste. Would someone crack a window open, please? It bloody stinks in this room. It's simply... No, 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 don't. No, for heaven's sake, don't. Or someone else might be bloody well dead. And then it cackled, winked monstrously at Carus, and vanished. It is he who expels you. The demon? Does he? Now the demon returned, and Merrin continued the adjurations, the applications of the stole, and the constant tracings of the sign of the cross, while it lashed him again obscenely. Too long, worried Carus. The fit was continuing far too long. Now the sow comes, the mother of the plague mocked the demon. Carus turned and saw Chris coming toward him with a swab and disposable syringe. Oh, yes! Come see your handiwork, 
sound of a calm. Chris tried not to look while Karras pinned Reagan's unresisting arms. See the puke. See the murderous mess. I am pleased. It is you who have done it. Yes, you with your career for anything. Your career for your husband before Before your divorce. Go to priests, will you? Priests will not help. Chris's hand began to shake. She is mad. She is mad. The pig is mad. You have driven her to madness and to murder and... I can't. Chris was staring at the quivering syringe. I can't do it. Karis plucked it from her fingers. All right. Swab it. Swab the arm. Over here, he told her. In her coffin, you bitch! Don't listen, cautioned Karras. Now the demon jerked its head around, its eyes bulging fury. And you, Karras! Chris swabbed Reagan's arm. Now get out, Karras ordered her, flicking the needle into wasted flesh. She fled. Yes. We know all of your kindness, mother croaked the demon. The Jesuit blenched and for a moment didn't move. And slowly he drew the needle out and looked into eyes that had rolled upward into their sockets. Out of Reagan's mouth came a slow, lilting singing, almost chanting in a sweet, clear voice like a choir boy's. Tanto mago sacramento menere moas It was a hymn sung at Catholic benediction. Weird and chilling, the singing was a vacuum into which Karras felt the horror of the evening rushing with a horrible clarity. He looked up and saw Merrin with a towel in his hands. With weary, tender movements, he wiped away the vomit from Reagan's face and neck. At the singing, whose voice, wondered Karras, and then fragments. Dennings, the window. Haunted, he saw Sharon come back in and take the towel from Merrin. I'll finish that, father, she told him. I'd like to change her and get her cleaned up. Could you both wait outside for a while? The two priests stepped into the warmth and the dimness of the hall and leaned wearily against the wall. Karras spoke softly to Merrin. You said, you said earlier there was only one entity. Yes, all the others are but forms of attack, continued Merrin. There is one, only one. It is a demon. There was a silence. Then Merrin stated simply, I know you doubt this, but you see, this demon I have met once before, and he is powerful, powerful. A silence. Karras spoke again. We say the demon cannot touch the victim's will. Yes, that is so, that is so. There is no sin. And what would be the purpose of possession? Karras said. Who can know? Answered Merrin. I think the demon's target is not the possessed. It is us, the observers, every person in this house. I think the point is to make us despair, to reject our own humanity, Damien, to see ourselves as ultimately bestial, as ultimately vile and putrescent, without dignity, ugly, unworthy. I think belief in God is not a matter of reason at all. I think it finally is a matter of love, of accepting the possibility that God could love us. The lilting singing could still be heard in the bedroom. Merrin looked up at the door. And yet, even from this, from evil, will come good. In some way that we may never understand or ever see. Perhaps evil is the crucible of goodness, he brooded. And perhaps even Satan. Satan, in spite of himself, somehow serves to work out the will of God. Karras reflected. Once the demon's driven out, 
What's to keep it from coming back in? I don't know, Merrin answered. And yet it never seems to happen. Never. Karras heard exhaustion in the voice and something else, something like repression of pain. Abruptly, Merrin excused himself and hurried down the hall to the bathroom. What was wrong, wondered Karras. Sharon came out of the bedroom with a foul-smelling bundle of bedding and clothing. She's sleeping now, she said, and moved off down the hall. Karras took a deep breath and returned to the bedroom, felt the cold, smelled the stench. He walked slowly to the bedside. Reagan, asleep at last. He reached down and gripped Reagan's thin wrist, looking at his watch. Why you do this to me, Demi? His heart froze. Why you do this? The priest could not move, did not breathe, did not dare to glance over to that sorrowful voice, did not dare see those eyes really there, eyes accusing, eyes lonely. His mother. His mother. You leave me to be priest, Demi. Send me institution. Now you chase me away. Why you do this? His head throbbing, heart in his throat. Karras shut his eyes tightly as the voice grew imploring, frightened, tearful. You are always good boy, Timmy. Please, I am afraid. No chase me outside, Timmy. Please, outside, nothing. Only dark. You're not my mother, Karras whispered. Timmy, please. You're not my... Oh, for heaven's sake, Karras. Demi. Look, it simply isn't fair to drive us out of here, really. I mean, speaking for myself, it's only justice. I should be here, little bitch. She took my body, and I think it only right that I ought to be allowed to stay in hers, don't you think? Oh, for Christ's sake, Carus, look at me now. Would you come along? It isn't very often I get out to speak my piece. Just turn around now. Carus opened up his eyes and saw the Denning's personality. There, that's better. Look, she killed me. I heard her moaning upstairs, so up I went, and don't you know, she bloody took me by the throat, the little cunt. Christ, I've never in my life seen such strength. Began to scream that I was diddling her mother or something, or that I caused the divorce, some such thing. It wasn't clear, but I tell you, love, she pushed me out the bloody fucking window. She killed me. Fucking kill me. Now, you think it's bloody fair to throw me out? Come along now, Carus, answer me. You think it really fair? I mean, do you? How was the head turned around, asked Carus. Denning shifted his gaze. Oh, well, that mother's voice again. If instead of be priest you was doctor, I live in nice house, Timmy, not with the cockroach, not all by myself in the apartment. Timmy, please. You're not my mother. Won't you, you face, face the, the truth, Dickens? Dumb. You believe what man tells you? You believe, believe him to be only a good one, and he's not. He's proud and unworthy. I will prove it to you, Karras. I will prove it by killing the piglet. She will die, and Merrin's gone will not save her, Karras. You! Pride and in your incompetence, Bangala, you should not have given her the liberum. Karras turned now and looked at the eyes. They were shining with triumph and piercing spite. Karras fetched his medical bag and took out his stethoscope. The demon rasped. Listen, Karras! Listen well! Harris listened. The heart tone sounded distant and inefficient. I will not let her sleep. Karras flicked up his glance to the demon, felt chilled. Yes, Karras. She will not sleep, do you hear? I will Karras did not hear Merrin come back into the room. 
The exorcist stood by him at the side of the bed. What is it? he asked. Her heart's begun to work inefficiently. If she doesn't get rest soon, she'll die of cardiac exhaustion. I'm going to call in a cardiac specialist, Father. Marion nodded. Karras went downstairs and telephoned a friend, a noted specialist at the Georgetown University Medical School. He was at the house in less than half an hour. In the bedroom, he reacted with bewilderment to the cold and the stench and with horror and compassion to Reagan's condition. She was now croaking gibberish. While the specialist examined her, she alternately sang and made animal noises. Then Dennings appeared and looked to Karras and complained, What the hell are you doing? Can't you see the little bitch should be in hospital? She belongs in a madhouse, Karras. Now let's stop all this cunting mumbo-jumbo. If she dies, you know, it's your fault, all yours. I mean, just because he's stubborn doesn't mean you should behave like a snot. You're a doctor. You should know better, Karras. There's just a terrible shortage of housing these days. Back came the demon now, howling like a wolf. The specialist, expressionless, nodded at Karras. He was finished. They went into the hall where the specialist looked back at the bedroom door. What the hell's going on in there, Father? The Jesuit averted his face. I can't say, he said softly. What's the story? The specialist's manner was somber. She's got to stop that activity. Sleep. Go to sleep before the blood pressure drops. Is there anything I can do, Bill? The specialist looked directly at Karras and said, Pray. He said good night and walked away. Karras watched him, every artery and nerve, begging rest, begging hope, begging miracles, though he knew none could be. You should not have given her the librium. He turned back to the room. Merrin stood by the bedside. Karras shook his head. Merrin nodded. There was sadness in his face, then acceptance. And as he turned back to Reagan, there was grim resolve. Merrin knelt by the bed. Our father he began. Reagan splattered him with dark and stinking bile. You will lose. She will die. She will die. Karras picked up his copy of the ritual, opened it, looked up and stared at Reagan. Save your servant, prayed Merrin, in the face of the enemy. In Karras's heart there was a desperate torment. Go to sleep. Go to sleep roared his will in a frenzy. But Reagan did not sleep, not by dawn, not by noon, not by nightfall, not by Sunday, when the pulse rate was 140, while the fits continued unremittingly, while Karras and Merrin kept repeating the ritual, never sleeping, and Reagan's shouting was as draining as her movements. Yet the blood pressure held, but how much longer? Karras agonized, oh, God, don't let her die. Don't let her die. Let her sleep. Never was he conscious that his thoughts were prayers, only that the prayers were never answered. At seven o'clock that Sunday evening, Karras sat mutely next to Merrin in the bedroom, exhausted and racked by the demonic attacks, his lack of faith, his incompetence, his flight from his mother in search of status, and Reagan, his fault. You should not have given her the librium. Staring feverishly at Reagan with red-veined eyes, Karras thought he heard a sound. Something creaked, and he realized it was coming from his own crusted eyelids. He turned toward Merrin. Karras worried about him, the lack of sleep, the demon's attacks. Karras glanced round at Reagan. He checked her pulse and then began to take a blood pressure reading. Today, mother day, dim. For a moment he couldn't move, felt his heart wrenched from his chest. Then he looked into those eyes that seemed not Reagan's anymore, but his mother's. I not good to you? Why you leave me to die all alone, Dimmy? Why? Why you? Sharon came in to change the bedding. Go rest for a little, Damien, urged Merrin. With a lump rising dry to his throat, Karras turned and left the bedding. Yes. Hello, he answered hoarsely. Someone waiting here to see you, Father Karras, a Mr. Kinderman. In reception, he saw Kinderman at the telephone switchboard counter. He gripped Karras by the elbow and propelled him toward the street. I need advice, nothing more, just advice. What about? Well, let's say I'm working on a case, Father Karras, a homicide. 
Dennings? No, no, no. Purely hypothetical. Like a ritual witchcraft murder, this looks. Now, let's say in this hypothetical house there are living five people and that one must be the killer. Now, I know this for a fact. But then the problem, all the evidence, well, it points to a child, Father Karras. Well, just a baby. She could maybe be my daughter. He kept his eyes fixed on the embankment beyond them. Now there comes to this house, Father, a priest, very famous. And this case being purely hypothetical, Father, I learn through my also hypothetical genius that this priest has once cured a very special type of illness, an illness which is mental, by the way. Karras felt himself turning grayer by the moment. Now also there is Satanism involved in this illness, plus strength, yes, incredible strength. And this hypothetical girl then could twist a man's head around, you see. Now, the question, you see, the girl is not responsible, Father. She's demented, he shrugged. And just a child, he shook his head. And yet the illness that she has, it could be dangerous. She could kill someone else. Who's to know? It's a terrible decision, just awful. And I hate to be the one who has to make it, Father. Hypothetically, what do you believe would be the right thing to do? The Jesuit met Kinderman's eyes and answered softly, I would put it in the hands of a higher authority. I believe it is there at this moment, breathed Kinderman. Yes, and I would leave it there. The gaze is locked. Thank you, Father. I feel better, much better. Oh, incidentally, you could maybe do a favor, give a message. If you meet a man named Engstrom, tell him Elvira is in a clinic. She's all right. He'll understand. Would you do that? Sure, he said. Sure. Look, uh, we couldn't make a film some night, Father. The Jesuit looked down and murmured, soon. The detective looked concerned. As he started away, he reached up a hand to the Jesuit's shoulder, squeezed. Ilya Kazan sends regards. For a time, Karras watched him as he listed down the street, watched with wonder, with fondness, and surprise at the heart's labyrinthine turnings. He waited, dared not risk another glance at the sunset. He looked up at Reagan's window, then went back to the house. He heard the demon croaking viciously at Merrin. He stared towards the staircase, then remembered the message. Carl, where was he? He went to the kitchen. No, Carl. He left the kitchen and walked up the stairs, heard the demon roaring frenziedly at Merrin. You have lost Carl, and you knew it. You scum, Merrin. Bastard, come back. Come and... He realized as he entered the bedroom that he had forgotten to wear a sweater. He looked at Reagan. The head was turned away from him sideways as the demon continued to rage. He went slowly to his chair and picked up a blanket, and only then, in his exhaustion, did he notice Merrin's absence. On the way back to Reagan to take a blood pressure reading, he nearly stumbled over him. Limp and disjointed, he lay sprawled face down on the floor beside the bed. Shocked, Karras knelt, turned him over, saw the bluish coloration of his face. And in a wrenching, stabbing instant of anguish, Karras realized that Merrin was dead. Saintly flatulons! Die, will you? Die! <laughs> Carlos, heal him. Bring him back and let us finish. Let us. Karras saw the tiny pills scattered loose on the floor. He picked one up and with aching recognition saw that Merrin had known. Nitroglycerin. He'd known. Even worms will not eat your corruption. Karras heard the words of the demon and began to tremble with a murderous fury. Don't listen. Don't listen. Don't listen. He picked up Merrin's hands and started tenderly to place them in the form of a cross. No! Put his cock in his hands. 
and a glob of putrid spittle hit the dead man's eye. The lost rights. It put back its head and laughed wildly. You son of a bitch! Kara seethed in a whisper that hissed into the air like molten steel. You bastard! Though he didn't move, he seemed to be uncoiling, the sinews of his neck pulling taut like cables. The demon stopped laughing and eyed him with malevolence. You're well losing. You're a loser. You've always been a loser. Reagan splattered him with vomit. Yes, you're very good with children, little girls. Well, come on, let's see you try something bigger. Come on! He had his hands out like great fleshy hooks, beckoning slowly. Come on, loser, come on, try me! Leave the girl and take me. Take me. Come into. Chris and Sharon heard the sound from above. Stumblings, sharp bumps against furniture, walls. Then the voice of the demon. The demon. Obscenities. But another voice. Alternating. Karis? Yes. Harris, yet stronger, deeper. No, I won't let you hurt them. You're not going to hurt them. You're coming with... In an instant, they were racing upstairs to the door of Reagan's bedroom. Bursting in, they saw the shutters of the window on the floor ripped off their hinges, and the window, the glass, had been totally shattered. They rushed forward toward the window, and as they did, Chris saw Merrin on the floor by the bed. She stood rooted in shock. Sharon screamed from the window, Father Karras! Father Karras! Chris ran trembling to the window. She looked below and felt her heart dropping out of her body. At the bottom of the steps, Karras lay, crumpled amid a gathering crowd. She stared, horrified, paralyzed, tried to move. Mother! A small, wan voice calling tearfully behind her. Chris gulped, did not dare to believe. Or, what's happening, Mother? Oh, please, please come here, Mother, please. I'm afraid. Chris turned quickly and saw the tears of confusion, the pleadings, and suddenly she was racing to the bed, weeping. Rex, oh, my baby, my baby, oh, oh, Rex. Sharon raced from the house and ran to the Jesuit residence hall. She asked for Dyer. He raced from the hall, crossed the street, down the steps. Karras lay crumpled and twisted on his back with his head in the center of a growing pool of blood. His eyes shifted numbly to Dyer, leaped alive, seemed to glow with an elation, some plea, something urgent. Damien, Dyer paused, and in the eyes saw that faint, eager shine, the warm plea. He leaned closer. Can you talk? Slowly, Karras reached his hand to Dyer's wrist. He clutched it, briefly squeezed. Dyer fought back tears. Do you want to make your confession now, Damien? A squeeze. Are you sorry for all of the sins of your life and for having offended Almighty God? A squeeze. Dyer slowly traced the sign of the cross over Karras. He recited the words of absolution. Ego te absolvo. An enormous tear rolled down from a corner of Karras's eye, and now Dyer felt his wrist being squeezed even harder continuously as he finished the absolution. In nomine Patris et Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen. The pressure on his wrist abruptly slackened. He pulled back his head and saw the eyes filled with peace and with something mysteriously like joy at the end of heart's longing. The eyes were still staring, but at nothing in this world, nothing here. He lowered his head and wept. The wail of the ambulance siren lifted shrill into night above the river until the driver remembered that time no longer mattered. He cut it off. 
river flowed quiet again, reaching toward a gentler shore. Late June, sunlight streamed through the window of Chris's bedroom. She folded a blouse on top of the contents of the suitcase and closed the lid. It was now six weeks since the deaths of the priests, since the shock, since the closed investigation by Kinderman, and still there were no answers, only haunting speculation and frequent awakenings from sleep in tears. The death of Merrin had been caused by coronary artery disease, but as for Karras, baffling, Kinderman had wheezed. Not the girl, he decided. She'd been firmly secured by restraining straps and sheet. Obviously, Karras had ripped away the shutters, leaping through the window to deliberate death. But why? Fear? An attempt to escape something horrible? No. Kinderman had quickly ruled it out. Had he wished to escape, he could have gone out the door. Nor was Karras in any case a man who would run. But then, why the fatal leap? For Kinderman, the answer began to take shape in a statement by Dyer, making mention of Karras's emotional conflicts, his guilt about his mother, her death, his problem of faith, and when Kinderman added to these the continuous lack of sleep for several days, the concern and the guilt over Reagan's imminent death, the demonic attacks in the form of his mother, and finally the shock of Merrin's death, he sadly concluded that Karras's mind had snapped, had been shattered by the burden of guilt he could no longer endure. Moreover, in investigating Denning's death, the detective had learned from his readings on possession that exorcists frequently became possessed, and through just such causes as might here have been present, strong feelings of guilt and the need to be punished added to the power of autosuggestion. Karras had been ripe, and the sounds of struggle, the priest's altered voice heard by both Chris and Sharon, these seemed to lend weight to the detective's hypothesis. But Dyer had refused to accept it. Again and again he returned to the house during Reagan's convalescence to talk to Chris. He asked over and over again if Reagan was now able to recall what had happened in the bedroom that night. But the answer was always a head shake or a no. And finally, the case was closed. Now Chris poked her head into Reagan's bedroom, saw her daughter with two stuffed animals in her clutch, staring down with a child's discontent at the packed open suitcase on her bed. How are you coming with your packing, honey? Chris asked her. Reagan looked up, a little dark beneath the eyes. There's not enough room in this thing. She frowned. Well, you can't take it all, sweetheart. Leave it, and Willie will bring the rest. Come on, baby, or we'll miss our plane. They were catching an afternoon flight to Los Angeles. The door chimes rang. Chris opened the door. Hi, Chris. It was Father Dyer. Just came by to say so long. She took his hand and drew him in. They went to the kitchen where they sat at the table, drank coffee. They were silent together while Dyer stared down into his cup into sadness. Chris read his thought. She still can't remember, she said gently. I'm sorry. You said Father Karras had a problem with his faith. Dyer nodded. I can't believe that, she said. I've never seen such faith in my life. Taxi here, madam. Oh, thanks, Carl. Okay. She and Dyer stood up. No, you stay, Father. I'll be right down. I'm just going upstairs to get rags. He nodded absently and watched her leave. He was thinking of Karras's puzzling last words the shouts overheard from below before his death. There was something there. What was it? He didn't know. Both Chris's and Sharon's recollections had been vague, but now he thought once again of that mysterious look of joy in Karis's eyes, and something else he suddenly remembered, a deep and fiercely shining glint of triumph. He wasn't sure, yet oddly he felt lighter. Why lighter, he wondered. He walked to the entry hall, then turned at the sounds of footsteps coming down the staircase, Chris and Reagan, hand in hand. Chris kissed his cheek, then she held out her hand to it, probing his eyes tenderly. 
It's all right, he said. Then he shrugged. I've got a feeling it's all right. She nodded. I'll call you from L.A. Take care. Daya glanced down at Reagan. She was frowning at him as at a sudden remembrance of forgotten concern. Impulsively, she reached up her arms to him. He leaned over and she kissed him. Then she stood for a moment, still staring at him oddly. No, not at him, at his round Roman collar. Chris looked away. Come on, she said, taking Reagan's hand. We've been late. Chris waved through the window. The taxi pulled away. Soon the cab turned a corner and was gone. From across the street, Dyer heard a squeal of brakes. He looked, a police car, Kinderman emerging. He waved. I came to say goodbye. You just missed them. Kinderman looked down the street and shook his head. How's the girl? She seemed fine. Ah, that's good. Very good. Well, that's all that's important. Well, back to business, he wheezed. Back to work. Bye now, father. He turned and took a step toward the squad car, then stopped and turned back. You go to films, Father Dyer? Do you like them? Oh, sure. I get passes. In fact, I've got a pass for the crest tomorrow night. You'd like to go? Dyer had his hands in his pockets. What's playing? Wuthering Heights. I've seen it, said Dyer without expression. Kinderman stared limply for a moment, looked away. Another one, he murmured. Then he stepped to the sidewalk, hooked an arm through Dyer's and slowly started walking him down the street. I'm reminded of a line in the film Casablanca, he said fondly. At the end, Humphrey Bogart says to Claude Rains, Louis, I think this is the beginning of a beautiful friendship. You know, you look a little bit like Bogart. You noticed. In forgetting, they were trying to remember. Remember.